So welcome everybody for coming to this joint workshop uh, with the uh, RIC and AIP and uh, EPFL CIS. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, several very important researchers from Japan um, here with us uh, talking about machine learning and AI topics. Uh, I'll first actually thank some of the, uh, the local organizers as well, uh, Jan, Jocelyn, Nicola, uh, Christelle. Uh, they did a fantastic job and we have a very good program today. Um, this evening, we will have a poster session, so make sure that uh, you come for this one. And uh, tomorrow, there's also a jam-packed session all day. Now, before uh, I give the first talk, uh, I would like to invite Masashi to, to give a brief uh, set of remarks. Okay, good morning. So, first of all, welcome to the workshop, joint workshop today. So, I'm quite excited to be here, because originally, so we plan to come here in 2020 May to sign the MOU here actually. But it was unfortunately canceled due to COVID. And after that, we just postponed the workshop several times and we ended up in having online events so far. But finally, so we could come. So I would really like to thank everybody to, to host the workshop. So this is a great opportunity for us to communicate. Then the purpose of my first introduction is to explain who we are and what this weekend. So maybe this is the only slide I, I need to really explain. So what is Riken? So in Japanese, so our center is, our institute is called Rikagaku Kenkyu Job. So these six characters, and this is pronounced as Rikagaku and Kenkyu Job. The meaning is Physics and Chemistry Research Institute. And previously, I think Riken was in English called Research Institute for Physics and Chemistry or something like that. But okay, six characters in Japanese is too long for us to remember. And nobody call, call us Rikaga Ken Kyuzo, but people just take the first character Ri and the first character here Ken. So combine Riken, like taking an acronym. So everybody calls us Riken, and nobody knows Rikaga Ken Kyuzo actually. So then at, at some point, Riken decided to use this Riken as the official name. So that means in English, Riken is not an acronym, but this is our official name. So this is where we are from. So then we are AIP. So Riken founded Center for Advanced Intelligence Project in 2016 under the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology in Japan. So we are actually 10 year project. So we are on the seventh year now. So it's great that we could finally come here. Then now we have about 130 employed researchers and 40% are international and 25% are female researchers. So I think we have quite diverse center researchers. Then we have about 250 visiting researchers from universities and other like industries. And also we have 130 domestic students as part-time researchers. Then plus, so we invited 140 international interns before the COVID days, but we stopped the internship program for the last couple of years. But this year we resumed the program. So hopefully through this workshop, we can have nice communication and hope that we can have some interns from EPFL also in the near future. Then also we are very much interested in collaborating internationally, uh, also co collaboration with industry. And our office is located in the center of Tokyo. Actually, it, it's a walking distance from the central Tokyo station. So we are located in this building on the 15th floor somewhere here. And yesterday, Falcon brought me to, to the Rolex center here. So that's fantastic you know, building and nice you know, decoration. And maybe ours is mini, mini Rolex Center in, in this building, but we have a room like this and we can like accommodate visitors here and researchers are also like discussing and relaxing. And also we have like talk here when we have guests. So whenever you have a chance to come to Tokyo, okay, you need to always come to, I think Tokyo station from the airport. Then, so our center is a walking distance from the station. So please visit our center. And also in addition, we have many teams across Japan, so from Sendai to like Nagoya, Kyoto, Fukuoka. So depending on the team, so not, not only in Tokyo, but they are located in other cities. And I have some details, but maybe I just skip them. So thank you very much. And let's enjoy the workshop for two days. All right. So <laughs> the next speaker is me. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I changed the talk title a little bit. It's still about the same subject, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to entertain you 
uh, this morning. Maybe some of you know about this particular title that is like a Italian spaghetti cowboy movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So we're going to try to to fit uh, this particular theme. Um, I also, before I begin, would like to thank Masai, Masashi and his team, um, uh, Ikuko Sumora. Uh, they, they helped quite a bit over the, the years. Uh, we had these seminar series, um, these young star series, and so far it's been quite uh, successful and popular. And um, I'm going to talk about um, some research, which is maybe a long culmination of several collaborations across the years, and it's, it's good to, to acknowledge uh, quite a few people. Now, let's begin with, I mean, so here I'm preaching to the choir when I talk about things like deep learning, but... Uh, hopefully what I will tell you will, will make sense. So what I'll do is I'm going to talk about deep learning as an instance of supervised learning problems. So I'm going to use Vapnik's uh, famous block diagram where you have a generator generating AI data features, a supervisor that is giving you some labels, BI. And as the learning machine, which is a pun on machine learning, your job is to learn a, a functional mapping between the data to the labels or the regression coefficients. Uh, with some function h, and um, as opposed to looking at functions in all generality, we're going to parameterize it with some parameters x, and uh, this will be a learning problem. Learn the parameters x so that you can try to predict what the supervisor has been trying to do. One way of doing this is to set up the quote-unquote deep learning problem, where you first restrict the function that you're interested in h into a, let's say, a neural network. Um, why? Because there are universal approximants, and a neural network is formed by just taking an F1 transformation of its input, uh, followed by a nonlinear um, transformation that is followed by then another F1 transformation. And if you want to make this quote unquote deep, you just rinse and repeat and apply the same uh, procedures over and over again. So given that we have, so you can take the layer matrices, biases and whatnot, put them into a, a vector little x, concatenate them. This will be the parameter that you're interested in learning. So how do you learn this parameter? Well, at least for the training data that we have observed, we want to match the, our predictions with the parameters that we have fixed to the data the labels that are given to us, right? So the way we do this is by minimizing a loss function in between and given, let's say, and data samples, you use, let's say, the empirical risk minimization as a way of setting up your cost. And then once you can solve this problem, maybe you have some constraints on the parameters, you learn your, let's say, neural network that you will apply on test time. There are many loss functions. And of course, you know, one can argue that whether or not this is the right thing to do, this is another question. But, you know, like things like logistics laws, uh, hinge laws, and so on and so forth has been popular. All right, now deep learning has shown quite a bit of impressive demonstrations, but within this, there emerged interesting grand challenges. And one of the grand challenges is their robustness. It turns out that given a, a trained, let's say neural network, you can add imperceptible perturbations to human eye to radically uh, perturb or change the decisions of uh, the neural, uh, I mean, these, these um, um, functions. And I think maybe many of you have seen these examples where you can take, let's say, this turtle uh, image, and you can take a neural network that has, I don't know, uh, superhuman performance on the, the data set, uh, add, let's say, a little bit of perturbation that is not imperceptible to any human eye. Maybe a human would con confuse this tortoise or turtle, but not necessarily a rifle. Right? And that's what the neural network says that is, it's a rifle. And Tesla engineers also managed to show that you can take these stickers, put it on stop signs to make it look like a 45 miles per hour speed zone. So that's like catastrophic for any uh, self-driving uh, vehicle because as opposed to uh, stopping, you may be speeding up, which could cause issues, right? So what are these perturbations? It turns out that, you know, these perturbations are actually deliberately designed. now. One way to do this, and we're going to talk, I mean, call this an adversarial example, is to, to, to think about the following. Let's say it's like a game, right? So you train your neural network minimizing loss. 
now your neural network is out there and somebody who has access to your neural network tries to figure out how it can perturb the input in a way that maximizes your loss. Again, we can discuss whether or not this is the right thing to do, but uh, this is one way of basically designing these quote-unquote adversarial examples. You assume that the adversarial is somewhat limited in the sense that if the adversary has all budget, all power, then you're already screwed. But the, the subtlety here is to do this with very little budget, like this, this um, 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 it is it is surprising that you can do this with very little budget. So one way to do this is to put, let's say, an infinity norm constraint on the perturbations with very tiny values of epsilon. You maximize this loss for a given input uh, for your fixed neural network, and then you can achieve these feats. Of course, I mean, so here it turns out that these adversarial perturbations are um, unavoidable in the following sense that we are used to uh, leveraging this blessing of dimensionality in problems where we know that there's concentration around the mean. It turns out that, you know, you can think about these high dimensional classification problems that data basically somehow concentrates around the classification boundary that with little perturbations, you can actually take a large portion of the data and change these decisions. And that's what underlines the difficulty in, in let's say, adversarial robustness. But this has never been a barrier for machine learning researchers to do something about these hard issues, right? Like, uh, to be honest with you, MP hardness has never been a barrier for machine learning researchers, for instance, right? So one way you can try to mitigate the issues that can come from adversarial attacks to explicitly train for it and say that, hey, as opposed to minimizing my loss, let me assume that somebody may be explicitly perturbing my inputs in order to make my loss worse. Now, again, we can discuss whether or not this is the right problem to solve. That's another issue, but this is the classical way of training for robustness, adversarial robustness. So here, this, the optimization problem will be something like this, that we have this, again, this finite sum minimization problem where the individual losses are implicitly defined through a maximization procedure, and that maximization procedure explicitly incorporates this adversary perturbing your input. So I hope this is clear. Now, given this, then the computational um, 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 issues arise. So, okay, this form that we have on the left-hand side is something that the optimizers are very used to. It's this finite sum problem. This is like the bread and butter in stochastic optimization. But what is key in stochastic optimization is that at least you have a stochastic gradient. So one question here is that how do you get the gradient, right? So, I mean, let me ask the audience, do you know how to get the gradient here? That we have a function, let's say fi, how do you compute its gradient? Okay, there are, there are some comments. Well, so some of my students from Math of Data uh, are raising their hands. Um, so I mean, if you don't know, you can take math of data, right? Uh, um, but this is, this is something that we're gonna discuss now is that there is a way to, to get the gradient and it somehow involves differentiating with respect to the maximization procedure here. Now it is at this point, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce what is known as Danskin's theorem. And this is one of the, the most important uh, theorems that, that actually underlines many of the optimization procedures that we use that involve minimization of minimax problems, let's say. And the particular variant here is from Bursikos's thesis here. So let's say we have a function, a coupled function phi xy that has a maximization over the decision variable y, which is in some set uh, s. Now let's assume that with respect to the maximizer, there is a set of maximizers. So this may or may not be unique, right? So for a given X, right? So X is given. That's why this S star, which is the set of maximizers, the argument of maximizers has a dependence on X. X is given. You are doing maximization with respect to this decision variable Y. Now, the, the, the directional derivative of this function that is defined through this maximization procedure, an implicit function, along the direction of gamma, so you can pick gamma, is given by this maximizer, which is an inner product with the direction that you pick with the gradient of this function phi with respect to y, 
but the the set that which in which you optimize is the set of maximizers. All right, so this is a bit of a mouthful, and it's there's a lot to unwrap here. Um, but the point that I want to make here is that if the set of maximizers is a singleton, right? So the problem is smooth, concave, and you have like one single optimizer. In the end, all you need to do is find the optimum of this function with respect to given x, find the optimum y star, take the derivative and evaluate that y star, right? But when, it, when you don't have a unique derivative, then you actually need to solve this particular problem. Uh, let's not discuss how you get to this, but let's take this as a, a fact. Trust me, I'm a doctor here, right? So maybe I. Do you have any assumption the So given that we're doing continuous optimization, maybe if it is concave, maybe we have a, a, a compact set. But if you're doing non convex optimization, which we will talk about, this is the issue, right? Mathematically, it's fine. Mathematically, it is fine, but um, we will see further issues, right? So the immediate cons consequence here is that if you had a unique um, maximum, then you can simply apply this theorem and you have the gradient. But if you actually take these uh, adversarial robustness, in fact, um, and you can just initialize and run your whatever training procedure you have, you will see that. So what you do is, let's say you run it, you fix one perturbation, and then you initialize it with different initialization and just solve it a bunch of times. And you can look at the distance of each one of them to the, the very first thing that you found, right? Then you will realize that there's uh, not a unique, it looks like there's not a unique maximum, that there's like a host of maximizers and it is not unique. So this is interesting, no? OK. So I think this was 2019. Uh, Alexander Madry et al. had this particular paper towards deep learning models resistant to adversarial attacks. And there, what they did is that, well, if you have it unique, you use um, what Danskin said. But if it is not unique, they argued with the corollary to Danskin's uh, theorem that the uh, you won't get a, a, a descent, uh, you won't get the gradient, but you will get what is known as a descent direction. So what I mean by that is, is very simple. So suppose you're at this particular point, the gradient will look at the contour, will take normal with respect to the contour, and will try to move in, in the, the negative direction of the gradient, right? Whereas a descent direction at the same time means that you look at, let's say, the descent cone at the given point, and you pick any direction within the descent cone. So you have directions by which you can descend by appropriately choosing the step size. And in fact, sometimes descent directions may be better than the gradient direction, negative gradient direction. If you think about it, right? If you're thinking about the Newton uh, direction, which is not the negative gradient for quadratics, this is like the best direction to descend. Does that make sense? Right, the Newton direction looks at directly to the minimum of the quadratic. Okay. But then is this really true? It turns out that it is not. Um, so the corollary in, in this particular paper is wrong. Uh, in fact, this paper has been so influential that it is now in like textbooks. Um, what we showed uh, is that you can actually come up with counterexamples to show that you, you can get even ascent direction. So the corollary is just plain wrong. The, the, the wrongness to be fair to the authors is actually quite subtle because Danskin's theorem is used with signed direction. So there is the, the directions, um, the sign of the directions also matter. So this is the, the particular subtlety that they missed in their particular theorem. And what we show is that you can actually have ascent directions with the counterexample. So here, if you were to, with the counter example, which I'm not going to get into the full details, is that you can have the, the adversarial uh, training descend without descent in the sense that some directions can be just plain old ascent directions, right? This is actually quite surprising. And what we've done is that um, we proposed another alternative way. In fact, something that Masashi kind of hinted at. Um, 
what we did is that, you know, given that you can run a bunch of uh, these uh, maximization procedures and get a, a bunch of points, right, not the full set, we said, well, okay, as opposed to using these points and doing discrete optimization, we just take the convex hull of those points and do the maximization procedure on the, the, the points, the set of points, set of maximizers that you already discovered. And that seems to mitigate the problem quite a bit. For the same counterexample, for example, this particular approach seems to do quite well. You get like this nice monotonic descent, and you can apply this to adversarial training problems in the in in let's say what you have in the literature. And this kind of a training in terms of iterations can help actually in terms of your performance adversarial robustness. Um, but at this point, I just would like to highlight the fact that the adversarial training is performant not just because you get the, this quote-unquote ascent or descent direction using this maximization procedure, but it also does what is known as a graduate student descent because these procedures have these step size schedules tuned in such a way that these step size drops and schedules, the warm-ups and so on and so forth that um, I think that if you want to kind of compare fairly, you should also do this with what we've done, yes? Okay, now, so far, what I've talked about is mitigating computationally ways of um, helping out this robustness, right? But it is also important that, you know, this optimization setting up costs is not the only thing. And there's an additional aspect that we tend to somehow assume in the kind of research that at least we do or we used to do in, in our group. It turns out that the architecture itself has a lot to say in terms of the robustness of the overall procedure or your functions, right? So just to highlight some of these things, I just want to set up some notation that I mentioned to set up this uh, neural network. So here, I'm just going to ignore the biases just to, to make the notation a little bit cleaner, right? So when we talk about a deep neural network, we're going to talk about an L-layer neural network. And now the L becomes not the loss, but the number of layers. I apologize for the notational mishap, but uh, it is what it is. Um, so what we're going to have is that, you know, so you, you, you start with your input and you apply your affine transformation one at a time. And there are some scalings here and there that is involved. So our parameters will be the neural network weights. So capital X1 to capital XL that are initialized by some beta, you know, IID, let's say Gaussians, beta one squared to beta L squared. And um, so for the input, you will have beta one squared. For the output layer, you will have beta L squared. Just to make the notation a little bit simpler and the analysis easier, you're going to have the same initialization rates for the remaining layers. We're going to use ReLU. There are many other LU, whatever uh, activation functions, but we're going to stick to what works best, ReLU. And again, we will avoid bias variables in the SQL. So what we're going to look into is a characterization of what we call as a perturbation stability. What, what this is, is, is just quite simple. You can think about the neural network, the input, and basically the first order Taylor ex uh, expansion of the neural network predictions around its input, right? So if you think about it, if you if you take a little bit of a perturbation, a serial perturbation, the output changes quite a bit, right? Your prediction, let's say, goes from minus one to plus one, right? And this particular first order term, and in its in in particular its norm, kind of gives you an idea about how robust you are to these perturbations. But as opposed to looking at this in an adversarial setting, we're going to look at it in an average sense that you know, given an input. We're going to somehow take a, a, a ball around the input and look at perturbations that are randomly distributed. And we're going to take a look at how this particular expansion coefficient varies around the input. Does this make sense? This tells you how robust you are or how stable you are to perturbations. All right. And if you think about it, not everything is adversarial, and you should, in general, be robust in a little bit to noise. No, so this kind of captures the essence of this particular idea. All right. Now, just to set up another thing, we're going to talk about what is known as a lazy training regime. Um, what that means is that suppose you initialize your neural network, and you look at you apply an algorithm, you look at the evolution of your neural network weights relative to where you started. Right? And as your tra training time goes, continues towards infinity, if the relative change is imperceptible, 
This is what is known as lazy training, all right? And this is a well-studied behavior, and one of the, the, the people, Linaik, will be uh, giving a talk, uh, also maybe the topics, um, but at least, you know, we have a chance to talk uh, during the social event and so on and so forth today about these things. Anyway, so this is what I mean by lazy training. All right, for the interest of time, what we've done is to look at the impact of the architectures. Um, what that means is that we're going we're gonna to try to understand how perturbation stability changes as a function of the number of layers, the width of the neural network, right? And it turns out that there is an ugly um, twist that is caused by the initialization as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about some of these initializations that give you different kind of uh, initialization uh, procedures, things like Lacan initialization, here, NTK, Xavier, mean field, and uh, initialization. Now, for the, the case of lazy training, it turns out that uh, there, are, there are interesting things. Um, so first, what we, what we can prove is that the width actually helps you in terms of your robustness. So this is very nice. Now, the depth can help you or hurt you depending on the initialization. So what we found is that with Lacan initialization, in fact, the depth can help you with when you're in the underparameterized regime can hurt you, but when you go for the overparameterized regime, starts helping you. The strand with the width remains with respect to other initialization like he and uh, NTK, but depth swaps. That's what we mean by the good, the bad, and the ugly. The width is the good, the, the bad is the depth, and the ugly is the initialization, right? <laughs> All right. So we looked into non-lazy training as well, um, but then you can only look at it, the two-layer neural network, the depth becomes a bit of a uh, problem um, in terms of characterization. But let's not dwell into this given the particular time that we have. And what we've done is that we've actually uh, did um, numerical uh, experiments to verify that the theory kind of matches the, the practice. All right, so let's not get into the details of this given time. Um, all right, so let's conclude. Um, to be honest with you, even this particular simplified view that I presented to you today, it just makes it clear that robust and adversarial uh, machine learning uh, is quite challenging, right? So I've, I've taken very dry, stylistic, um, theoretical approach to this particular problem that has really a grave importance to, um, to machine learning industry and alike. Uh, but I didn't even talk about things like this, right? So when you do robust training, minimax training with non-convex, non-concave objectives, even the first order algorithms are susceptible to things that, that are known as limit cycles. Um, here, the, the robust training, for example, you can, it seems to be related to the Lipschitz constant of the neural network, and there's hardness results for estimating the Lipschitz constants. And what I wanted to highlight is that some of the, the current paradigm of robust training it works surprisingly. It descends without descent directions, um, but maybe it could be built on wrong foundations in the sense that maybe it's not the mathematical approach, but it's the graduate student descent that makes it work. And um, as we've seen in the second half of the talk that the architecture, the initialization, the algorithm all jointly play a role. It's like raising a child, you know, like there are so many factors that play a role in how good the child is going to be. Same thing kind of applies to neural networks. And um, what we've seen is that the, the overparameterization helps robustness in line with this, um, the, a law of robustness, this test of time award paper. Um, and uh, in while looking at this, we managed to improve some of Zhang Zhang Gu's uh, characterizations. And with that, I will end perfectly on time. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Shin. If you go back to page 12, the definition of the stability tree. So A hat is, no, A, A hat is over the uniform distribution on some ball. And is, is it a parameter for all layers? Or, like, A, A is the input. So A is the input, yes. 
we're looking at the input perturbation and not necessarily the weight perturbation. What about X? So what's the distribution of X? So X is trained, right? Oh, so it's fixed. So X is trained through, let's say, stochastic gradient descent with the input. So, so what's the expectation over X? Oh, yes, actually, maybe there's a typo here, yeah? Um, you don't take the expectation. X is fixed. I believe X is fixed, yes. Okay. Okay. Then for the first part, so, so you have the result, so this one. So the right-hand side, surprisingly, the, the PGP, PGD works quite well in the end. PGD is this black one? Yeah, so this is the standard training, and it, yeah. it typically works quite well, yes. Yeah. Can you explain the reason for that? Uh, so it is, again, uh, these tunings that you do, these, let's say, step size drops seem to make the major difference, actually, right? But the, the, the thing about this is that, surprisingly, even in our counterexample, even though you get ascent directions, somehow it seems to even touch upon the minimum, right? I mean, this, this, this reminds me of this... Um, um, what was this? Ali Rahimi, who was arguing that sometimes to get to the the, the minimum fastest is to, to take a stupid step size, just go away, then you converge better, right? So like he had some presentation at one of these nerves that he was talking about. So here, maybe these ascent directions with non-convex optimization makes you ping pong around and then you can maybe converge into the, the minimum better, right? So who knows, literally. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that the we need to be careful because if you're trying to apply this to a, a problem which is well understood, you should know that you're not getting the descent directions that you think you are. Right? That's the important part. Other question? Yes, so. Uh, thank you for a great talk. So in the first part, I think you mentioned that um, in high dimensional space, many data uh, close to boundaries. But at the same time, I think uh, many data sets are uh, nominated by easier examples. And that means many uh, examples are apart from the decision boundaries. So how uh, can we understand these two things? So the thing that I mentioned to you, uh, this particular work by Tom Goldstein's group that argues that, so suppose you have a high dimensional sphere and your data is uniformly distributed over that sphere and you can take the equator, cut it, and then you can take an epsilon slice around the equator. Then you know that because the data is uniformly distributed, it'll concentrate around the, the, the equator, right? So that's what I mean that you will have this concentration around the decision boundary. And then with an epsilon perturbation, you should be able to swap the decision for any given data point. That is, so what you're mentioning is that the data is not uniformly distributed. Sometimes they are a little bit better distributed. That is precisely the reason things like this do work, right? Um, so that's the, the contrast that I actually wanted to make. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for your great talk. Uh, I have a question on kind of the things there has many empirical observations on how to make the curve looks like the DDD as you plot it. For example, uh, gradually increase the epsilon uh, over the training or in induce some randomness in inside the training, for example, random flipping the labels. So I'm just wondering how your uh, alternative way of computing the gradient uh, connect is other empirical observations of so this is the thing we didn't do the graduate student descent here right so we yeah. literally just take the methods and apply them as yeah. surmise that's that's also what i i tried to explain that you need to if you want to get curves that are really nice there's all kinds of tuning that you people tend to do which we didn't do here Right. Oh, yeah, that's, that's right. excellent. So the, the, also the, the, the cheating thing here is that this is with respect to epochs. If you, if you notice for the, the alternative way of doing this, you actually need to, to compute a bunch of gradients, right? So for the given maximization problem, maybe you solve it five times with different initializations, you get five solution points, then you solve uh, a problem over the convex whole of those solution points to get the descent direction, yes. right? That seemed to help, but this is like five times time consuming, except unless you can paralyze this, 
and have five machines doing these computations at once, then mm -hmm. you can get the actual performance improvement in time. I see. Yeah. Okay. okay. Got it. But again, there's all kinds of tunings that get into this. That uh, mm. uh, other questions? If not, maybe for okay, Taiji. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for a great talk. So, um, in the in the second half, so that you you showed some tables over there. Uh, oh, you mean uh, yeah. yeah, this one. So, is there any lower ones? Is this just a upper bound? In these are upper bounds, yes. Um, I think looking into to lower bounds would be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for me, to be honest with you, the surprising thing was that with, with respect to Lacan versus Hay, the depth has a surprisingly different effect. Mm -hmm. But what I liked was that in practice, the, the, the practical performance somehow follow these bounds. Mm -hmm. I see. Right? Uh, okay, so then... I'm wondering kind of an intuitive explanation why the, the width helps for the robustness. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't get So it. to be honest with you, intuitively, I cannot explain, okay. right? <laughs> like uh, um, we didn't even know that that could help robustness until we've done the analysis and noticed that it could. Uh, so this, this is not a result where we first observed that it was helping and then we somehow took this quest of proving it. No, we were looking at this. We were more or less interested in this dichotomy between Zhang Zhang Gu's results and uh, Sebastian Bubek's results. Mm -hmm. And while trying to do so, we kind of agreed with the Bubek camp, but also noticed that the initialization has this effect with respect to the depth that can swap, yeah? So this is not necessarily an intuition guided uh, result, but uh, once we noticed that, um, once we had the theory, we noticed that actually it is matched in practice. Yeah. Sorry that I I, I don't have the intuition for you. Thank you. That's no problem. All right. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Our next speaker is now Nori Ueda, uh, son. Please take it yeah. away. So good morning. Uh, I'm now Nori Ueda. On the disaster resilience science team leader. So today's talk is a physics informed deep learning approach for modern cluster deformation. Okay, uh, we Japan have suffered from severe natural disasters such as a massive earthquake, tsunami, and a heavy rainfall. Okay, so uh, disaster resilience is one of the important social issues in Japan. So when hurricane uh, uh, was established. I launched uh, this team. Okay, our team mission is to uh, develop a uh, machine learning technique to uh, that contribute to the uh, disaster resilience uh, mitigation or prevention. Okay. So, uh, I think uh, you are more interested in the machine learning technique than in the seismic data analysis itself. So, uh, let me introduce first a uh, recent result, a recent trend in AI research related to our. Uh, research. After that, uh, uh, let me introduce uh, our recent paper, uh, Modern Cluster Deformation Based on the Physics Informed Deep Learning. So, uh, accepted the annual uh, nature com uh, communication last year. Okay. So, this slide shows the uh, advance in the recent scientific machine learning. Scientific machine learning means uh, I deal with uh, ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation. Okay. There are three major studies. And first one, as you know, uh, neural ODE, uh, you know, it can learn and predict uh, dynamics uh, by uh, learning, by training a uh, ordinary differential equation using a bunch of data. And I think uh, this neural ODE is the origin of the recent scientific machine learning. Uh, but uh, as you know, uh, <coughs> uh, there is no guarantee that uh, neural ODE uh, it satisfies the physics of law, such as a, a conservation of energy, okay? To solve this problem, Hamiltonian neural network was presented, okay? Uh, in HNN, a Hamiltonian equation uh, should be satisfied during the training, okay? Now also, uh, we have published uh, uh, related papers on uh, Europe last year. 
but uh, today I don't explain what that. Uh, the, the third one is uh, I'm very interested in this approach, physics informed neural network. Uh, it's quite different from the others in the sense that uh, it does require a bunch of data, only partial differential equation and uh, initial condition and bound condition, okay? So uh, our recent paper is based on the discipline. So let me uh, briefly introduce, uh, explain uh, original pin. Uh, this is the paper, Journal of Computational Physics, okay? Very recently. And uh, I found that uh, there are three or four papers accepted in NIPS related to physics inform, inform neural network. But I think it's very uh, blue ocean, okay? So this is a problem setting. So that is a, sorry, no pointer, okay. Uh, general uh, nonlinear partial differential equation is given as follows, okay? And U is a solution, it is a solution, of course unknown. And it is some nonlinear operator parameterized by lambda. Uh, so usually lambda is constant, okay? And for example, uh, one dimensional Burger's equation and uh, it becomes is like this one. And lambda one, lambda two is some physical coefficient, okay? And uh, in the paper, there are four uh, combinations, two by two. One is a lambda known and try to solve the U. And uh, given T, X, U, and then try to estimate the uh, unknown parameter lambda. This is a, this corresponds to the inverse problem, okay? So in this case, uh, UI, uh, some observation should be uh, required, okay? And also, uh, um, so continuously or discretely solved, uh, so the whole, some, a partial differential equation, okay? There are four formulations, okay? But usually one and one is very popular, okay? So it, for example, this is a, a one-dimensional Burger's equation and the vertical axis corresponds to the X, and one dimensional, and the horizontal axis corresponds to the time, okay? So there are three uh, intersections. As you can see, the uh, estimated uh, solution is very very close to the true one. In this case, uh, uh, we, we have an analytical solution. We can compare with that, okay? So what's the objective function uh, of pen? It's very simple. There are two, time, two terms. First one is, uh, I know, uh, this is the uh, initial condition and the boundary condition. So uh, you should be matched with with them, okay? And also uh, you uh, should satisfy the given partial equation, partial differential equation. So F uh, corresponds to the partial uh, differential equation should be zero, okay? So uh, input is T and X and the output is U, but we don't know the supervised uh, uh, true U, but uh, we know uh, the partial differential equation and using uh, automatic differential, we can compute a bunch of uh, ut, ux, and uxx, the partial derivative. Then uh, we can we can compute the f and should be zero, right? Okay. And uh, so the total MSC uh, loss function is MSC u plus MSC f. Okay. And please note that the collocation point is just an uh, indicator coordinate. I mean the the true of u at the collocation point unknown, okay? But of course, we can uh, arbitrarily select the collocation point. Of course, uh, a large number of collocation points are lead to the true value, true uh, solution, but uh, it takes much time. So uh, we can select uh, more uh, conveniently uh, select the collocation point, okay? So uh, let's move on. The, Main topic, our, our recent result, cluster deformation analysis by six neural network, a physically informed new, uh, neural network. And uh, so first three uh, authors, uh, seismology researchers, and me are uh, machine learning researchers. So this is exactly the uh, co collaboration with uh, 
uh, physics uh, scientists and uh, machine learning researchers. Okay. So uh, let me first introduce the cluster deformation modeling. There are two analyses: forward problem, a forward analysis, and inverse analysis. Okay. So this just corresponds to the forward problem. Okay. Uh, the forward analysis is a problem of uh, simulation uh, using uh, you know true physical model. Okay. On the other hand, inverse analysis is a problem of estimating a true physical model from the observations. Okay. And uh, so um, understanding classical dynamics is useful for earthquake fault failure, plate motion, and underground elastic viscous structures more intuitively by comparing the observation with a physical true model, we can understand the evolution of destruction uh, caused by the massive earthquake and the potential for future massive earthquake, okay? So in this sense, uh, this research has a long history, more than 50 years. But uh, so our research uh, enables change and the arbitrary deformation and the underground structures to be represented so continuously. So the uh, nature communication reviewers highly uh, evaluated this result. Okay. So in this study, we focus on the uh, strike slip hold, Yokozura Danso in Japanese. Actually, uh, Kumamoto earthquake uh, seven years ago in Japan also uh, strike slip fault. Okay. Uh, in the strike slip fault, uh, U X Y is invariant in Z direction. Z in the so this direction, and this uh, graph shows that you know U minus and the you know U minus U plus in the opposite direction displacement. Okay. Okay, and the uh, red curve corresponds to the you know hole. Okay, so dance in Japanese. Okay, and the blue curve corresponds to the earth's first surface. Okay, and we know that some differential partial differential equation because it's a long history. The scientists discovered that kind of uh, so partial differential equation. Okay. And also, uh, since cluster deformation analysis is performed under the study <coughs> steady state condition, so only spatial differential equation are used. I mean, the all derivative with respect to only only space. Okay. So uh, this graph show this video show the representation of the uh, famous uh, finite element method and the proposed one. As you can see, the in the in the film. Uh, we uh, obtained a bunch of uh, mesh uh, compared to the fan. Uh, we can uh, continuously analyze the uh, old domain. Okay, I'll explain in more, de more detail. Okay, it's me uh, worth mentioning uh, comparison of the pin with the conventional method. The very famous analytical method, the green function approach, and it can. Uh, uh, deal with the continuous analysis, but it's limited to the linear equation, okay? And then uh, for other numerical methods, uh, finite element method can deal with the nonlinear uh, equation. And uh, also uh, it can deal with, uh, you know, more complex uh, topography, but it requires, uh, bunch of mesh to uh, correctly analyze uh, you know, more complex topography. On the other hand, our approach based on the pin, it can deal with the nonlinear differential equation and the uh, analysis continuously uh, done. And uh, also uh, uh, it can, it's available for the uh, uh, curved, curved fault. Okay, and also it's easy to extend the inverse analysis. Where we are going now. Are we going on so recently? Okay. Um, so uh, you may think that, uh, okay, uh, so PIN is directly available to this task, but uh, the answer is no, because 
uh, since the fourth phase due to the earthquake, U is discontinuous on both sides of the fault, you know, sigma minus is a direction, opposite direction. So the uh, neural network is not applicable in this sense. But uh, uh, first, first of, the, of the paper, Okazaki-san found that, uh, so a polar coordinate system can solve this, okay? Uh, you can see, so this uh, figure shows the right figure shows the, you know, uh, so transform the, the uh, entire domain. So, I mean, the U is a continuous function across the entire domain by using a, a polar coordinate system. It's a very key point, okay? So, uh, once uh, we uh, transform the original differential, partial differential equation to the, you know, uh, based on the uh, polar coordinate, so input with R and C there, output to U, and we can uh, compute a bunch of uh, some derivative uh, related to uh, this partial differential equation. Then uh, we can solve the solution, okay? So this is a, a specific <coughs> algorithm uh, for a chart of the learning algorithm, okay? As a first, initialize a, a neural net parameter W, and uh, we sample the collocation point uh, with some distribution, such as a uniform distribution, and the train the neural network. And then, so loss function, uh, when the loss function is smaller than some threshold, uh, then uh, also we uh, evaluate the uh, neural network by using uh, uh, another collocation point independent on the training. Because a small number of uh, collocation point lead to the overheating. Of course, if we use a, a bunch of collocation point, it works well, but it, it takes much time. So uh, this is a more elegant way, okay. And uh, uh, I'll show there's some experiment results. This is the toy problem. Uh, I mean, the uh, the vertical fold and the straight earth surface and uniform medium. In this case, uh, we can uh, solve analytically. We can compare the uh, estimated result with uh, so two one. Okay, I'll skip the details. But anyway, uh, so you can see the uh, dotted line is very close to the uh, third line. I mean the. PNN result agree with the honest solution, whatever the case. Also, uh, uh, this is a more uh, real case, general case. The uh, curved fault and the curved earth surface and non uniform medium. So, in this case, also, uh, we uh, our approach uh, uh, so very close to the uh, finite element method, because uh, in this case, we don't know the true analytical solution, okay? So we compare the, our method with the finite element method, okay? But please note that, uh, uh, so creating mesh is, uh, takes much time to, you know, to get a more reasonable result. On the other hand, pin is very simple to use. Okay, also uh, it's worth mentioning to so, uh, the pin uh, uh, reproduce uh, some theoretical result. I mean, the, for fixed S, it means the displacement of the U minus and U plus. And then, uh, so uniform strip should be reproduced according to the theory. But uh, as you can see, the pin can, could uh, reproduce the, uh, you know, existing theory any home sleep. This is important. Okay, uh, let me summarize the talk. Okay, so uh, it's time. So I, I don't uh, give them out. You please leave them out. Thank you very much. Any questions? So yeah. Any questions?
it is very surprising to me that this randomly sampled data point, you can basically pick a neural network that will also get these discontinuities uh, uh, correctly way, way faster than what the finite, uh, uh, these, these mesh. Mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Uh, were you surprised, or this is some sort of a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were also surprised. Right? Yeah, yeah, also. Yeah, maybe I was also surprised. <laughs> yeah, because it uh, seems like sampling the, the space and training a neural network. Yes. Uh, but you have to also make sure that the boundary conditions yes. hold and so on and so forth. Yes. So setting up the costs is a bit of an effort. But uh, yeah, surprising to me. Yeah, quite, yeah. Quite interesting. Of course, uh, uh, so how to uh, select the correlation point is very important in practice. So I recently uh, proposed uh, some uh, active learning to effectively okay. select, uh, you know, depending on the uncertainty of a neural network output using a dropout distribution something. Okay. Because here a kernel fit would not work, no? Kind of it. I mean, you can also try, I mean, you sample some points and maybe some sort of a kernel function on top of uh -huh. that. But then you wouldn't get this continuity, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are network. Yeah, mm. I agree, I agree, I agree. Yeah, it doesn't require a bunch of samples. The reason why the pin is not popular in machine learning. <laughs> I have a question regarding the inverse problem plot. Okay. So basically, so the, the belief is that the given Ordinary uh, OED is break. Hmm. And, and you are solving this. But in reality, I mean, the model is just a model. Yes. It might yes. Be different today. Yeah. So can you somehow fill this gap by adding some data or some observation? Yeah, yeah. So the reason why the inverse analysis is important mm -hmm. because uh, the recent uh, so model is not so accurate. Mm -hmm. So but also, but also we don't have a bunch of data because the massive aspect is not so many, yeah. And somehow can you add some like some parametric component to the, the parametric part or mm -hmm. the part? Mm -hmm. how, how do you handle you know, the gap between the reality and the model? Uh -huh. But uh, so some partial differential, uh, any partial differential equation has some parameters. So some physical coefficient, something like that. Then they, uh, in the inverse problem, we can estimate the true parameters, mm -hmm. so more more accurate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, but still, maybe the true observation might be different because the model may not be completely correct. Yeah, 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 so yeah. This is often the case in like reinforcement learning. So we have a uh, nice model, but still mm -hmm. there's a big gap between the mm -hmm. model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The reality is a kind of big yeah, yeah, yeah. So some combination is more important. Yeah, I think I agree. Thank you. So far in this field, the model seems to be quite accurate. Yeah, yeah, because uh, more than five, 50 years history. <laughs> <laughs> many, many yeah, scientists. Lots of real data also. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, you know, a scientific uh, researchers, the machine learning researchers, we communicate with each other too. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks very much for your great talk. So I have a question about your pain. Yeah. So is the pain uh, in this paper is only used for uh, fits one boundary condition or it can be like uh, a predict based on uh, uh, different boundary conditions? Sorry, can you? I mean, uh, uh, is the pain or the experiment uh, your report is in this paper. Uh -huh. It's only based on one boundary condition. Uh, one boundary condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of uh, course, it depends on the another boundary condition. Pain can deal with that. Yeah. Okay, I yeah. see. So you can simply add more terms. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, so the conclusion in this paper is that the pain, uh, training the pain, is much faster than doing a simulation, right? Uh, not much faster because. Okay. Uh, uh, FEM is also fast. Okay. The okay. main point is uh, pin is more, you know, robust or real, uh, you know, formulation. Okay. Because uh, 
fm uh, fm uh, should you know, create uh, you know bunch of some mesh but the pin is mesh free yeah. okay yeah. and uh, mesh organization is very uh, complex yes of course. yeah thank you so much yeah thank you can you easily parallelize computation of pins Parallelize. Uh, but if I, FEM is repeated. Yeah, 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 because the piece by linear, right? I don't think uh, the neural network is not parallelized, mm -hmm. right? So, so this is about the same issue as standard. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, this is, this is very simple case, the one dimensional or two dimensional case, but uh, for high dimensional case, so pin suffers from some, you know, local optimum or something. Some HPC guys are splitting a big network into a few pins. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. I don't know how, how it goes. Local, local network can seem to yeah. uh, split some of the work into the local network. Oh, thank you. So we are, we are also doing the nuclear fusion uh, mm -hmm. sim simulation exactly using the pin. Yeah. So, but for us, like the when we're calculating the sampling point is really yeah, yeah. time is uh, consuming. And you just mentioned that it's important, like the, the sampling has some tricks. Yeah. Can you share yeah. some tricks? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like the, not included in the paper. Can you just <laughs> give some yeah. not scientific yeah. tricks? Yeah. Yes, yeah. secret yeah. sauce. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, active learning is very important. Yeah. Uh, sorry, active, uh, active using active, active learning. Oh, okay. Yeah. Using yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. By evaluating ascent over U, mm -hmm. depending on the X and T. Okay. Uh, using, uh, in my case, using uh, some dropout Monte Carlo. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, because it is not so easy to evaluate the uncertainty of uh, output of neural network. Yes. But uh, some some researchers, have uh, uh, proposed, uh, you know, dropout Monte Carlo. Oh, okay. Yeah, to evaluate the uncertainty of uh, output of a neural network. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's that's my, very very easy. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we got the result of one point five faster than the uniform distribution. Uh, that's yeah. very important. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's time. Okay. Right. Yeah, this is perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, welcome back, everybody. Our next speaker is Mariam Kamgar Kur. She's a professor at EPFL, uh, leading the Sycamore Lab. Her research interests include multi agent learning, reinforcement learning, and control. Looking forward to your talk, Mariam. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to share my work uh, with you. Uh, so, my motivation for this as we increasingly automate our society, um, we have increasing amount of uncertainties that we have to manage and control. For example, in a smart grid, this uncertainty could be from the output of weather-based renewables, solar or uh, wind, or it could be from, in a smart intelligent transportation network, it could be from trajectory of the nearby traffic. Um, these uncertainties could also be from interaction of number of different decision makers, such as in intelligent transportation system or in multi-robots. So my work is on developing algorithms that guarantee safety and also coordinate interactions. And the focus of this talk is coordinating interactions uh, through multi-agent games. So let's just get started. A multi-agent game. Uh, we have n players, let's say one to n. Player I has her action AI in the set capital AI, and the joint action is always denoted by boldface A. So AI is action of player I, A minus I is the action of everybody else. And she has a cost function J superscript I. Okay, such problems arise, for example, in auctions. Here, the action of each player is the bid that they place and the cost or reward is what, whether they get the item and for how much. Um, so similarly, in a traffic scenario, the action or at the cost of each player depends on the action of the other player. So it's a multi-agent setting. So do, do we assume everybody knows all cost functions? I'm gonna exactly, right, right here, perfect. <laughs> so what's the problem of learning in games? So we're gonna 
consider the case where player i does not know ji, not even her own cost function, but can query it, okay? So she can, it's like a black box setting. Player i can play ai and receive ji evaluated at ai and a negative i. Uh, so this situation arises because sometimes the cost functions depend in non-trivial way on the action of others. For example, travel times in a transportation network depend on road congestion, uh, and this may not be a priori known. Uh, similarly, ele electricity price in a uh, smart grid is not known. The functional form of this price is not known in advance, but players can make certain consumption or production and then measure their costs afterwards. So the question here this talk addresses is how do players learn to optimize their decision? And I'm going to talk about learning in convex games and then learning in non-convex games and conclusions. So let's start with convex games. So what's a convex game? Uh, so we have the cost function ji is a convex function of player i's decision variable and we assume it's continuously differentiable in all variables. Um, and the, Capital AI, the set of actions, is convex and compact. Some examples of convex game, a mixed strategy extension of finite action game is always com convex because the action set of each player is the simplex and the cost function of each player in her own decision variable is simply a linear function. Okay. But there is also more complicated examples. For example, travel times could be approximately modeled by uh, a convex function in a transportation network, or a price of electricity could be approximately, often approximately modeled as a convex function. So the, this is a convex game. <coughs> so here we look at a Nash equilibrium, A star, where, which is a joint action set which no player has incentive to unilaterally deviate from her action. So given actions of other players, A star minus I, player I is optimizing her, her decision, okay? So in a two player zero sum setting, you can think of this as the point on the saddle. So no player has incentive to deviate. In convex games, we know that Nash equilibrium are guaranteed to exist. Also, and in general, this even existence of Nash equilibria are, are difficult, but yeah, results are difficult. But in this case, at least we know that they exist. And furthermore, we know that they are characterized by the so-called pseudo gradient of the game. Uh, so if you stack the gradient vector of each player's cost function with respect to her own decision variable, you get a map from, so, D is the dimension of action set of each player and N is the number of players. So you get the following map M of A and it's called a pseudo gradient. And we know that a star is a Nash equilibrium if and only if the following uh, inner product is greater than or equal to zero for every joint action of players, okay? So if you think of this condition, it looks very much like a first order optimality condition in an optimization problem. But the difference here is that this pseudo gradient in general is not gradient of a single cost function, okay? And this is one of the main differences between games and optimization problems. If indeed this was a gradient of a single cost function, the game would be potential and it would be easier to address, but we, we consider the more general case. Okay, so we know Nash equilibrium exists and they have been characterized. So now come back, we come back to the problem of learning in convex games and we want to address how do players learn Nash equilibria. Um, as I mentioned, this looks very similar like the setting of black box optimization, right? Player just uh, plays a policy and then she receives the cost function. So she could possibly think of finite differencing to estimate the gradients using this zero order information, right? So she could query her cost at AI and AI plus some uh, W and to estimate the gradient. But in general, in games, actually, you can, in this setting, you cannot do that. Why? Because the feedback she will get at AI um, um, is JI of A negative I, but when she changes her action, other players might have also ch changed their actions, okay? Um, so from the perspective of player I, this cost function is not stationary, and we also call it a banded feedback because she can query the, it, um, her cost function only um, at a single point. The next time the cost of other agents, uh, uh, the action of other agents would change. Uh, intuitively, think of 
if, for example, she observes that her cost went down after playing this, it might not be because of her action, but it might be because of action of others. So what we have to think is how do we estimate the gradients using zero order information, one point function evaluation. Okay. And this idea has actually also been in the banded single player setting. The idea is that we need to introduce randomization. Okay. So player I chooses, a, so she wants to estimate Ji gradient with respect to her own decision variable at a point mu I. Uh, she samples from a distribution, in this case, we consider Gaussian with a mean zero and sigma, and she plays a perturbed action, mu i plus uh, omega, and then she receives the feedback. And it turns out that a scaled version of this cost function where the scaling is by omega divided by sigma, on average, is an approximation of her gradient, okay? Um, and Gaussian is not the only distribution you can uh, use. You can also use uniform, but for our analysis, we focused on this. And this um, idea is the main idea that we're going to explore because with one point evaluation, we can approximately grade, uh, estimate the gradient. And furthermore, we can characterize the bias and variance of this gradient estimate as a function of sigma. And this becomes useful in our algorithmic analysis. So the algorithm for learning national career, I just write it in the unconstrained setting because it's sim simplest to explain, but if you had the constraint setting, you would do a projection, but it very much looks like a gradient descent, except that we don't have the gradient. So player I, each player samples a random uh, uh, vector from the, this should be mean zero sigma t i, uh, because her action is in uh, RD. And then she plays that action, she receives the cost, and then she updates the state of the algorithm. So mu i, player i's um, decision <laughs> variable at t plus one is a function of previous one times eta t, which is the step size or learning rate, uh, times this scaled version of the cost function. This is, this is, this is the uh, single point approximation. Exactly, exactly. So it's similar to stochastic gradient descent, single point approximation of the gradient descent. And we know that actually it's known that it converges in convex optimization setting. Uh, but the question is, does it also converge to a Nash equilibrium in convex scale? And the answer is in general, no. Uh, we need further conditions. And one condition that's sufficient is that this game pseudo gradient be, is monotone strictly monotone, but let me define monotonicity. So monotonicity says that um, uh, the pseudo gradient evaluated at A minus the pseudo gradient evaluated at A prime <laughs> in a product with A minus A prime should be greater than or equal to zero for every A and A prime. The strict monotonicity would require that this inequality be strict and then a strong monotonicity requires that this inequality be on the right hand side be the norm of A minus A prime, okay? So it's very similar to a conve uh, convexity, strong convexity, uh, strict convexity. And in general, we know that is if the Jacobian of this pseudo gradient map is positive semi-definite, M is monotone. If it's positive definite, it's strictly monotone. So under this condition, uh, given M is strictly monotone and Lipschitz, uh, we can show that there exist suitable choices for the step size and the variance such that mu t converges to the Nash equilibrium almost surely. So the iterate, the, this is the stacked iterate of all players' actions. Furthermore, um, we can quantify the convergence rate under a strong monotonicity and differentiability of this M. And the convergence rate in expectation to the Nash equilibrium is O1 over root t, which um, matches the stochastic optimization with banded feedback rates, okay? And this problem, I've been working on it for the past um, six, six years, and we have been sort of refining the results and extending them. Um, but the very first one was the convergence to Nash, and at the same time, actually, that we have our results. A, a sem same similar paper was also published using the more idea of mirror descent to have a zero-point evaluation of the functions. Um, rather than gradient descent, so it's a generalization. Um, I, I will, the uh, 
proof idea, I briefly talk about it. So it's uh, just to look at the expected value of mu t plus one minus a star in two norm and show that it has a sufficient decrease. So if we write that, we can equivalently write the algorithm iterates that mu t plus one is mu t minus eta t times the true pseudo gradient plus a bias and noise. Remember, we don't have true pseudo gradient because we don't know j's and we only use a sim single point evaluation. And then we can show that these extra terms have of, are of certain order dependence on the step size and the variances. So by controlling the step size and variances, we can show convergence of this norm of mu t minus a star. And from after that, and using a strict monotonicity of m, and the fact that this uh, uh, step size is not summable, we can show that the convergence of mu t minus a star is actually to zero. Okay, we, so one of the generalizations we addressed was also learning Nash equilibria in games with coupling constraints. So here, so far, I assume that player I's action AI is um, decoupled from other players' feasible action set, but we can also consider generalization when there is a coupling constraint. And here we look at generalized Nash equilibrium problems. We also address non-strictly monotone games. I just say a few words about that because I think uh, there are several people also looked at that uh, and have contributed to this. So I'm happy to discuss that. So <laughs> here, the simplest example of non-strongly monotone game is a zero-sum game where one player is uh, maximizing A1 and, um, over A1, the product of A1, A2, and the other one is minimizing. And it is a non-strictly mono, uh, the pseudo gradient is non-strictly monotone. You can just look at the, um, the Jacobian of it and you see that it's not symmetric. And it's known that a large class of convex learning algorithms diverge. Um, uh, there's been a lot of remedies uh, such as extra gradient proximal methods. Um, uh, Vol Volker and Professor Chepper also had con uh, new algorithms with improved convergence rate. Uh, most of these algorithms, to my best knowledge, they assume availability of stochastic either gradient or stochastic gradient or use the extra gradient approach. And we wanted to have a single point, again, function evaluation and a zero order approach. So what we proposed was just a regularization. So this algorithm looks exactly like before, but we have a Tikhonov type regularization where epsilon t is the regularization parameter. And then the, the only challenge in analyzing this was what should be the rate at which epsilon t goes to zero so that we can have, uh, how we can coordinate that with these other two terms, uh, eta t and sigma t that are uh, so that we uh, converge to a, a Nash equilibrium. And in this case, the Nash equilibrium is not unique, so we go to a minimum norm Nash equilibrium of the game. This is just a simple uh, illustration of without regularization, com algorithm iterates for the simple uh, zero-sum game and with regularization. Um, okay, so I think with this, I will mo move on to learning in non-convex games. Are there any questions so far? What about the scheduling of um, it depends on sigma t and eta t in a non-trivial way. Um, I can no maybe show you on the, no, no, no. It depends on both of them, yeah. And this, this is a bit challenging to tune and also we could not derive any convergence, right? So I would be happy to discuss, not in the zero order case, but I know that there are convergence rates for the uh, um, first order case under certain assumptions. But yeah. What Okay, that's a good question. I think the most limitation when I think of real world problems, a lot of times you're not completely black box, you know, perhaps something, and how to incorporate that information into the learning uh, so that you can speed up convergence, have a more general convergence results. Uh, so that, that I think is interesting. Other question. And uh, I mean, the, the convergence is also slow because it's zero order and the variance of the estimator is very high. But, but more practically speaking, I think this is a, a big assumption that it, get, it gives us a understanding of this problem class, but maybe for reality, we should try to incorporate some knowledge about the problem. Okay, 
non-convex games. So obviously there are more general problem class, such as auctions, autonomous cars, adversarial training. And we know that Nash equilibria may not exist and uh, in general, and they are also known to be hard to compute. So what should the players learn and how? So we can think of the game as adversarial bandit problem. As I mentioned the, in a learning problem, the uh, feedback information is bandit, right? So let's look at the connection with that adversarial bandit. So the decision maker submits, uh, um, queries the function at a given point AT, which is a black box, and then she receives the cost JT of AT. Um, and in a game, of course, the JT, there's no time varying cost function, but because her, the cost of player depends on action of others, and those are changing possibly based on the um, action of others, this becomes like an adversarial bandit problem. Okay, so adversarial means that this cost function at each time could be chosen in an adversarial way dependent on action of others. This is a more general. Um, uh, so games are a subset of adversarial bandit uh, problems. And in these problems, um, a benchmark for an algorithm is no regret. So the regret is the total cost incurred up to time t minus the best cost in hindsight. Did it had the players knew the cost functions in advance? This is a good benchmark because um, there are algorithms that achieve no regret. Um, and furthermore, there is a connection between uh, games and um, no regret algorithms. In particular, um, we know that if players are playing a no regret algorithm, the um, game action, the empirical distribution converges to a coarse correlated equilibrium, which is a loose notion of equilibrium. Uh, but let's now talk about algorithms. So if we let n to be number of actions for a player and t number of iterations under banded feedback, <laughs> which means that player only receives the cost function evaluated at her action, we know that the grid grows as square root of t n log n, the best known, um, the best rate and the lower bound. And on the other hand, under full feedback, so if the player observes the entire function for JT for every action, the grid grows as root t log n. So you see that the dependence on n, um, is dropped, and that's because in one iteration, player is getting n times more information. And what we uh, what we try to address is: can we consider still some uh, some feedback model that's not quite banded, uh, not quite full feedback, and improve this regret rate? So bridge the gap between these two rates. So, oops. So let me give you the idea of the algorithm we uh, uh, proposed. For, to, that, to do that, first I will tell you about the no regret algorithms that achieve after optimal rates. So one class of algorithms is exponential weight algorithms. So you initialize WT as a set of weights on the actions. You initialize them, for example, with uniform distribution at, at each time iteration, you update these weights. Okay, you update the weight of action K. And the way you update it is you uh, uh, is in a multiplicative way. So there's a multiplication with the exp exponential of the cost in K. So the banded feedback, you will use JT of K. So the cost received at time K. And in a full feedback, you will use J, you will update the weight of every action using the full cost function. Okay. So then um, the idea of our approach was how about the estimate, given that this is a game and the cost functions are actually not time varying, what if we can estimate these cost functions, let's say with J hat IT, and we mimic the full feedback. Okay. So this is one of the ideas. And the second idea is once we actually estimate, because this is an estimation, uh, and we might have error in our estimation, we introduce some uncertainty around this estimate and we try to use an optimistic version of this cost function. Okay, so if we use exploration to minimize the uncertainty in the cost estimate. So for example, this is um, this picture is from the analogy of bandits with, um, with a playing in a casino and you play, you pull an arm and you get the cost or reward for that 
um, arm and it's saying that by observing, for example, the cost of this arm in any, many real world problems, you can also infer something about the cost of near, nearby arms because nearby actions give you similar cost. It obviously probably doesn't hold in a casino, but in a real world problems it might hold. So by receiving one point feedback, we want to estimate the function so that we can mimic full feedback. Um, and for that, uh, so we introduce an estimation. Um, I think, um, so an estimation um, using Gaussian processes, which for this, uh, for the sake of time, I don't go in through into the detail, but basically we use an optimistic estimate of these cost functions, uh, which has a mean function minus some standard deviation. It's with high probability, a lower bound on the true cost function. And using this estimate, um, assuming that the player's costs come from a GP prior, we can show that the regret grows at root t log n. So the dependence on n is dropped plus gamma t root t, uh, where gamma t is how much we can remove uncertainty about these cost functions by using um, this uh, uh, banded query. Yes, exactly, yes. Uh, Okay, so I presented at a very high level uh, because of time limitation. It was more about the idea. Um, and this is a work with my collab, uh, my PhD student, Pierre Giuseppe, and then collaborators. Um, and we have extended it in several uh, ways, generalizing to contextual games, robust optimization, mechanism design, and multi-agent RL. And we also applied it to several real world problems. I believe I will briefly talk about the multi-agent or L setup. Um, so here we have play eyes state, SH plus one. Uh, it's a dynamical system. SH plus one is a function of the state at time H and action of every player plus some uncertainty and this F is unknown. And AIH is play eyes action at time step H. SH is the state of the environment, a policy is a map for player eyes, a map from S to AI. And the players want to optimize each player I wants to optimize her objective, uh, which is a sum of a rewards that depend on the state of the game and the, her uh, policy and policy of other agents. And uh, the, the idea of algorithm again was based on this GP regression. We estimate these um, Fs using a GP based on playing a policy and getting observing the state. And based on that, we have an upper, uh, we estimate the value functions vi with an uncertainty bound and using that, um, uh, we can, uh, using that, we use that to update the uh, player's policy. And then we can characterize the regret rate of this and show that it, uh, it is sample efficient uh, with respect to the number of actions and um, number of states, which is one of the bottlenecks in multi-hidden RL problem, the um, exponential dependence on the number of um, action of players. And I just show one simulation. It was a case study from autonomous driving ba based on a smart autonomous car simulation environment. Here, one instance was the cars, there's two red cars um, that are being controlled and they wanted the, the white car, which is in a box is a human driven car and they could, they want to basically, the, 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 the red one above wants to merge to the human driven cars lane um, and they can basically coordinate and do this as quickly po as possible if they, or if they don't coordinate, they might kind of be slow and stay be behind the human driven car. And the transition, unknown transition function is the unknown human driven cars behavior, a reward is progress towards the goal and satisfaction of constraints. And SH is the position and velocity of the cars. And AIH, uh, the action of each player is the heading and the speed. And the pi i, um, uh, there was a, it, it was parameterized by a neural network based on what the smart uh, environment provided um, as a baseline. And just I just want to highlight that here we see that if we look at the single agent optima and look at the average agent reward, and versus multi-agent equilibrium, it seems that coordination has led to better rewards, slightly higher rewards. This is a comparison with other methods to do multi-agent RL, but maybe I'll just focus on this one, which is a comparison with a model-free method, for example, independent deep, uh, deep Q network. 
And the, in the green, you see that the model-based approach converges much faster than the model-free approach, as uh, we would uh, predict. Okay, so in summary, um, I discussed the problem of learning in games and talked about learning in convex monotone games using the idea of one-point gradient estimators and regularization for non-strongly monotone games. And then um, lear uh, learning and no regret in non-convex games based on the idea of estimating the cost functions with some uncertainty bound and exploring um, optimistically to minimize the regret. Um, so I would like to acknowledge my collaborators uh, for this work, the convex game is with my collaborator Tatiana Tatarenko, who's at U Darmstadt. The non-convex game is with uh, Pierre Giuseppe Sessa, my student who graduated in September, Ilya Bogomovich, who's a graduate of here, of uh, Volkins Group, who's a professor now at Imperial, and then um, Andreas Krause. So, uh, I thank you for your attention and happy to answer questions. So thanks for the great talk. Yeah. I have two questions. The first question is, so you talked about robustness in, in some slide. Yeah. And what happens if an adversary exists in, in the game? Um, How, robustness, uh, sorry, very, very, um, let me just. Uh, for example, in the case of multi-agent reinforcement learning. Ah, uh -huh, OK. Uh, if an adversary exists, I mean, we can also have another player that could be the adversary. So we can make it a play n plus one mm -hmm. and think of an adversary that tries to minimize the reward, total reward. Or mm -hmm. uh, So I guess it could be extended um, to include if we model the adversary using game theory, mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. consider that. Um, but still, that direction was not that much explored? No. no. Uh, well, not to uh, my knowledge. Mm -mm -mm. Not in the MARS, uh, I don't know. I see. So then another question is about communication cost. So, so I didn't hear anything about communication between players, but what yeah. happens if there's some constraint? It's uh, a really good question. At the moment, these algorithms, there is no communication between the players, neither in the convex game nor in the mm -hmm. MARL approach. Um, actually, um, the MARL approach that I introduced um, the convex game is completely independent because this player is just querying the cost and updating their mean. So mm -hmm. there's no communication. In the MARL, though, we assume there is a, it's what's called centralized training, mm -hmm. decentralized expectation. So there's a centralized agent who is computing these upper confidence bounds on the value mm -hmm. function um, and then co communicates the optimal quality. I think that's for many problems, maybe it's unrelated. So we uh, have. We have to explain it to them. Um, mm. The case where it's decentralized um, uh, training and decentralized mm. expectation. But, but the point you raise is very important. What if we could allow communication between agents? What message they should pass and mm -hmm. when and with whom? Uh, that's something I'm really interested uh, mm. to look at also. I know that in the DeepRL, there is some results that show that communication emerges at the after you train. Uh, agents, um, I don't know exactly why they are. Uh, yeah, when professors are giving a lecture, students are always communicating behind <laughs> with SNS. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, not adversaries. So, thank you for the great talk. Uh, the question I had maybe related when you talk about the non convex, you had uh, Gaussian processes <laughs> on it. Yeah. How do you get the priors on these Gaussian processes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we haven't looked at how to do the priors. Uh, so yeah. I mean, once you have the correct prior, these things work really well. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, you're right. Exactly. So the big assumption here is that your function comes from this, this GP yeah. kernel, and that's a good question. Um, I'm curious which places actually this is based. This assumption is is based. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that's. A, I mean, it, it's it's a flexible assumption. Works really well. But then would it fail? Yeah. Instance, for example, I would think this if, continuous. Yeah, this continuous fail, exactly. And yeah. So what would you do then? And that's interesting. Thank you. So do you care the fate of the final function? In, um, in the case of Gaussian process? Um, we didn't make any assumption about the definition. I mean, it depends on the instead of the link mm -hmm. that appears. 
I have a question um, about querying JI. Yeah. So when querying JI, um, you need to information of A minus I, right? Yeah. Can you relax that A, A minus I is everything but I to like only some? Yes, I love it. Okay. I think that would be interesting. Um, um, in general, we don't need everything. We just need the part that influences the I's Thank you very much. I have two slides. There is another uh, for yeah, another tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. I, I, I have a question day. about it. Uh, the there was author up in my decision part where oh, you yeah. show it's some pr uh, pr nice. proofs about the convergency. Uh, but I, 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 I'm, the, I'm not, not the expert, but I know in, on this point, there are some sort of theoretical analysis uh, for the sampling effi efficiency. Yeah. That, that is how, how many samples you require. Very good question. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> is not like the analysis with that tool is not like, and actually okay. to get the whole one, we have to change the tool. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Our next speaker basically needs no introduction. Uh, must actually uh, take it away. Thank you. Jumapo <laughs> Sugiyama. <laughs> So, okay, my talk is about noise robust classification. So let's consider a very standard supervised learning problem with noisy output. So in the case of regression on the left-hand side, so this is just, just a standard case. We have input X and output Y and output value is noisy. So it's Y bar here. Then usually we just perform these squares. So we fit our model G of X to Y bar. And this works well in, in regression. But in the case of classification, actually, the story is not that simple, unfortunately. So in the case of classification, noise is basically label flipping. But in the case of regression, it's just additive noise. So this is the difference. Then in the classification case, again, we usually naively fit our model G of X to Y bar noisy labels and minimize some cross entropy loss or whatever. So does it really work? Unfortunately, so in the case of regression, yes. But in the case of classification, it's not really true. Even if we have infinitely many noisy labels, still our solution can, cannot be optimal. So that means we need some explicit mechanism to reduce the label noise, to, to copy the label noise. So that's the starting point of this result. So this is a very classic and kind of naive problem, but it was not solved yet. So then to copy this problem already, so this is quite well known and many people have tried many different approaches. So maybe one of the most standard approaches to use unsupervised outlier removal. So given some, some clean, more clean points and noisy points, we try to you know, get rid of noisy points by some outlier removal techniques. So this is fine if it works, but in practice, maybe outlier detection is harder than the classification problem itself. Then maybe it's not that easy to really do outlier removal in a, in a reliable way. Then so people may want to use robust loss functions in ro robust statistics. And again, this works quite well for regression. So instead of the least squared, squared loss, we may use the Huber loss so that so the effect of uh, outlier is kind of uh, reduced, suppressed. And we can extend that idea also to classification. So instead of the like, squared hinge loss, we, we may use the Huber classification loss or even ramp loss, so it's a uh, upper bounded risk uh, loss. And in practice, okay, we can somehow obtain a little bit robust solution from these robust loss functions, even in a classification case, but maybe it's not that, that robust as, as regression case. Then finally, so people may want to use regularization. So smoothing the solution to avoid overfitting. So this is always available for any problems. And again, in regression, so this is quite nice, but in the case of classification, so like in this case, 
So if we regularize the solution, we have a nice smooth solution like this. Oh. But once we have uh, some outliers here and there, label noise here and there, then you know, smoothing is actually not that useful anymore. So we need to over smooth our solution to you know, get rid of the effect of noise. Then the solution is not good. So we need new approaches to really cope with label noise. Then let me give you some brief technical background. So let's say so X and Y are clean training data and noisy versions are X and Y bar. So let's consider C class classification problem. So then we consider probabilistic classifier in simplex. So it's H of X. So it's a C minus one vector. So all elements are non-negative and sum to one. And each element of the classifier is expected to approximate the class posterior probability, the P of Y given X. And we consider some lo loss function. Oh. Then, so in this scenario, so it's actually quite useful to consider the so-called noise transition matrix, T. So let's say in the three class case, it's a three by three matrix. And like here, one zero zero means class one is always correct and it, it doesn't flip to two or three. But point one, point eight, point one. So this means class two is true only with 80%. And it can become class one or class three with, with 10%. Or 0 0.5, 0 0.50. So this is really a bad case. So class three label is never true. And it, it always becomes class one or two with 50%. So noise transition matrix T encodes this kind of information. So probability of flipping Y to Y bar. And this is actually quite useful. And for example, we have some cognitive bias. Like we don't make a mistake between dog and cat. But within the dog class, we have some specific species and it's quite hard to recognize. We often make problem, you know, mistakes in, in those classes. So we should be able to encode that kind of information in this noise transition matrix. And also this can be visualized as a simplex. So like one zero zero is uh, one zero zero corresponds to the top node, node and one, zero one zero corresponds to this one and zero zero one corresponds to this one. If, if noise is simplex, then it, it, it's something like this. Uh, if it's noise is pairwise like this and general, so we have something like this. So I, I will use this visualization data. Then here's a key paper, so proposed by Patrini et al in CVPR 2017. So they propose a systematic loss correction methods to handle noisy labels. So this is a, a really an excellent paper. So they propose two methods. So one is called forward correction. So basically the matrix T is a kind of playing the role of adding noise. So they actually apply T transpose to the classifier H. Then somehow it can emulate the noisy output of the classifier. Then this can be matched with noisy labels in a, in a consistent way. So by that they can achieve so-called classifier consistency. The minimizer of the clean loss is equivalent to the minimizer of the noisy uh, forward corrected loss like this. Ah, so this pattern is actually quite not easy to use. Then the second method is called backward correction. So T is adding noise. Then T inverse is basically removing noise. So they apply T inverse to the vectorized loss function. So each element is the Y you know, loss like this. Well, so then, so by using this backward loss function, so they can show that, so classifier consistency and risk consistency are both achieved. So again, the classifier consistency agrees the, the minimum and then risk consistency say that the, the true risk can be estimated in an unbiased way like this. So this means, so if T is given, so consistency can be guaranteed. So this is a really you know, good, good theory. But in practice, we don't know T. So how to estimate T from noisy data. So that's the starting point of our research. So we wanted to write you know, this paper by ourselves, but it was done previously by these guys. So we joined the, from the second stage. So, but the problem is actually T is non-identifiable in general. Like uh, T can be actually decomposed into the product of two transition matrices, so U and V. So then, so we can basically manipulate the solution in an arbitrary way. So then to avoid this problem, we may assume some strong condition like anchor points. So anchor points are the training point that has 100% certain samples, basically noisy, noiseless label. 
So then given anchor points, so we can estimate t naively in, in this way. So h bar is a probabilistic classifier learned from noisy training data. So given noisy data, we just train a classifier in a standard way and use this output as t if, if there's an anchor point. Even if anchor points are unknown, but we can guarantee that anchor point exists in our training data, then we may find anchor points by choosing the one that has the probability closest to one. So this is a just approximate implementation, but it could be useful. However, so it is known that, so if we use deep learning to obtain a classifier, then it is often overconfident. So meaning that even if the you know, probability, the output is quite uncertain, but deep learning gives it like almost perfect or something like that. It's quite overconfident. And this is problematic in, in this kind of foundation. Then to overcome this problem, we made some effort to improve it. And okay, the solution was slightly improved, but still the problem was not really solved yet. So that was our like basic result so far. Then, so recently we had two nice solutions to overcome some, some existing problems. And one is called a single step approach. So the previous approaches are basically in two steps. In the first step, so given noisy data, we try to estimate the noise transition matrix T and obtain T hat. Then use this T hat to train a classifier. So that was the you know, pre previous approach. But clearly, so step one is done without regard to the step two. So this means that, so step one contains some error. Then this small error can be magnified in step two because we didn't care the step two at all in the step one. So ideally, we want to solve step one and two at the same time. So estimating T and HX at the same time. So this is what we want to do. So the problem is simple, but actually solving this is not that straightforward because we can just formulate a problem in this way. So let's minimize the loss with respect to both the noise transition matrix and classifier at the same time and minimize them. So formulation is easy, but again, the solution is not unique because so U can be changed, U and H can be changed with some transition matrix Q, invertible one as this Q inverse T and Q transpose PX. So for any Q, this is a solution. So we want to have some constraint to make Q identity. Then we can recover the true solution. Then how can we do that? So we found that noise transition so noise transition is a transformation of a vector. And we found that this transformation is actually a contraction in total variation distance. So meaning that if you have two vectors, Px and Px prime, then it's transformed version U transpose Px and U transpose Px prime. So this has smaller L1 norm than the original one. So once we apply U transpose noise transition, then so vectors become closer basically in, in this simplex. If this is intuitively under, understandable because cleaner class posteriors have larger total variations, they are more separated. But once they become noisier, noisier, they are getting closer. Maybe it's quite natural. So let's use this knowledge as a regularizer. So we had the first term. So this is just the expected loss and we want to minimize. So with respect to U and H, this one. And now we have an addi additional regularizer so that so two vectors have larger L1 distance in this way. And we just sample some X and X prime. Then under the un anchor point assumption, so we can show that the, the empirical solution has statistical consistency. So we can really solve the problem in one step. So that's the first result we obtain. So this is, I think, quite, quite strong uh, theoretically. Then the second method. So to overcome the non-identifiability of T, initially, so we assumed anchor points were explicitly used. So we are given, so this is a class one anchor point, class two anchor point, and like that. So this was extremely strong. Then, so this condition has been relaxed to only the existence of anchor points. We are given a training set, and we don't know which one are anchor points, but at least there exist some anchor points in the training set. That was the second approach. Then, so can we further relax this assumption? So that's the question here. So uh, as I showed, 
T can be visualized as a simplex in this way. And actually each training point can be also plotted in, in, in this simplex. And actually uh, generally the simplex contains all training points. But unfortunately, given a finite number of you know, training points and such a simplex that contains all training data is not unique. So we can consider many different you know, triangles and all can be solutions. Then, so anchor points are actually vertices of the true simplex. So then from this visualization, it's clear, it's clear that given explicit anchor points, we can recover the true triangle. And so this is the, the previous solution actually. So then the second one, so only the existence of anchor points still guarantees the identifiability of T. So now uh, triangles are, it, it, uh, the vertices of the triangles are not really specified, but we know that there exist anchor points. So that was the, the second condition. Then our new work actually extended this idea to a more general setting, what we call sufficiently scattered training data. So today I didn't prepare any equation for, for this method, but once training data are kind of sufficiently scattered in, in this triangle, then we can still obtain the solution uniquely in a consistent way. So intuitively, so previously we assumed that the so point exists here and here and here. So from that, we can recover the triangle. So that's the intuition. But now in our new condition, so we are saying that, so like so suppose like two points exist on each edge like this, then we can recover this triangle. So the extension was something like this. Then, so this is actually, so as a special case, the previous solution was included. So this is a more general condition than the previous one. So as long as training points are sufficiently scattered, then we can guarantee the consistency with the algorithm shown here. It's called volume minimization. So the first term is the same. So it's the expected loss function. And we minimize this with respect to U and H. But now we have some volume constraint here, volume regularization here. Then, so we consider a big triangle in the beginning and we shrink it. And, and then, so we try to contain all training points with the minimum volume. Then we can show that. So this is actually a consistent algorithm. So we can recover the, the true triangle if data points are sufficiently scattered. So that's the latest result. And as far as we know, this is the most general approach so far in this framework. Okay, that was a good good conclusion so far, but still the the you know, problem did not really solved yet in real world, because so far our focus was so called class conditional noise, so we, we consider the noise transition matrix T, so that was basically a flipping probability from Y to Y Y bar, independent of X, so on the two D space basically noise is uniformly distributed in this way, but in reality maybe we have more noise near decision boundaries, for example. Maybe this is more natural. So this scenario is called instance dependent noise. And now the matrix T is a function of X. So this is really a big headache. So extremely challenging problem. So, so far we basically gave up solving this theoretically and we just resort to heuristics. Like, like for example, T can be decomposed into some parts and we use like no negative matrix factorization type algorithm to you know, recover each part. Or we assume some additional confidence scores. So class posterior probability to help estimate the noise transition function. Or we may assume some smoothness over the manifold in a semi-supervised learning way. Then T is now a smooth function of X and we can somehow estimate it easily. So we added like more condition, more heuristic conditions and try to solve the problem. And these methods are sometimes useful if the you know, assumption behind are you know, relatively realizable, but still there's no guarantee that you know, we can really solve a target problem by these methods. So still this is a kind of open direction to explore. Then one more thing, so this is completing the independence slide. So apart from theoretical approaches of, of noise, you know, noise robust learning, we also have a very heuristic approach from the beginning. So it's called co-teaching. So in this co-teaching method, we basically use the memorization properties of neural networks. So given training points, so we perform stochastic gradient descent 
then so we can naively obtain this kind of solution you know, within a few epochs, for example. But if we want to really fit all training data, we need to do stochastic gradient many times to you know, change the decision boundary in this way. So it takes more time to fit noisy labels. So this naively means that, so early stopping is actually quite useful. So maybe this is a heuristic developed already in 1980s. And, but implementing early stopping in the right way is actually quite difficult in practice. So we decided to use two networks actually. So th that's why it's called co-teaching. So we basically prepare two, exactly two neural, neural networks and let's call them A and B. Then A performs the mini batch training and performs stochastic gradient descent and select some training data that has small loss values. Those small loss data are regarded as clean samples and select those clean samples and teach them to another network B. And B does the same thing. So B also performs stochastic gradient completely independently and select some small loss data and select them and teach them to A. And this is repeated several times until convergence. Then, so the final solution is trained as if they only learn from clean data. So that was the basic idea of co-teaching. Then later on, we found that teaching only disagreed data is even more effective. So in this co-teaching approach, we want A and B to be as different as possible for, for many times. But once they converge, then so we can't improve the solution anymore. So we want to make them as different as possible for many iterations. And once we only teach this disagreed data, we can somehow slow down the convergence and the, perform, the performance robustness is further improved. Then finally, so noisy data, so large loss data, so far we just decided to throw them away because they are just noisy data and harmful. But we found that those noisy data are also informative because we know, we are almost sure that they are noisy data. So the in intuition is something like this. So suppose we have some noisy data and we just perform gradient descent. Then, so we end up in some poor local optimum in the near future. So then this is a kind of nice precaution that, okay, this direction is actually dangerous. Then our idea is to, you know, if, if we identify noisy data, then we don't do gradient descent, but we do gradient step, gradient ascent, actually, gradient step back in such a way that we can get away from poor local optimum. Then we go back and then select another mini batch randomly here. Then the next direction may be somewhere there. Then we can somehow effectively avoid poor local optimum. So naively noisy data is useless, but we can actually use this noisy data as a kind of precaution to avoid lo poor local optimum. So this is a complete heuristic explanation and I'm not quite sure whether this really happens in reality, but in practice, it, it actually works quite well. Like for some, in some experiments, we found that even if like 50% of levels are randomly flipped, so it's completely a mess, but still like our method can work well. So performance is improved over uh, training epochs. So maybe this co-teaching approach is still like we need more theoretical study to analyze why it works, but this seems to be a quite practical approach. Okay, so this is the final slide. So we are interested in, in our team. So we are interested in robust machine learning, reliable machine learning. And so far the approach I introduced, they were more like reliability for expectable situation. So this basically means we model the corruption process explicitly like noise transition matrix. And then we estimated it and corrected the solution explicitly. So this is nice if the model is correct, but in reality, maybe our like, noise assumption or corruption process assumption is not really true. Maybe we can have a good approximation, but never true. So then how to handle the modeling error is still a big issue here. Then another completely different approach would be, so reliability for unexpected situation. So the typical situation is the minimax gain. So we consider the worst case robustness. So in the case of noise, we don't really assume anything, but something you know, extreme can happen and we consider the worst case scenario and still minimize the loss. So it's a minimax solution basically. So this is sometimes you know, solvable mathematically and it's quite attractive theoretically, but in practice, so the solution is often too conservative. Like if, if we apply this kind of you know, solution to reinforcement learning and robot control, then the robot does not move at all. 
because once we try to move the robot, there is a you know, risk of broken broken down with some probability. Then not, do, doing nothing is the best solution in the minimax solution. So we need to avoid somehow this you know, too conservative solution. So that's a challenge here. Then another possibility is to include human support. Uh, in the case of classification, it's called classification with rejection. Like in medical diagnosis example, so we are given some medical images and we want to detect whether cancer exists or not. And if the, the prediction confidence is like more than 90%, maybe we can you know, believe the output of the AI system. But if the output is like 60% or 55%, maybe we can't really believe it. Then, so we may ask the medical doctor to you know, handle such a situation manually. So that's a realistic approach in, in, in practice. But this cannot be applied for like autonomous driving cars because you know human drivers are no longer driving. Maybe he or she is just chatting or reading a book. So then we can't really ask them to intervene the control you know, problem. So how to handle the real-time application is still an open issue here. So in practice, I think somewhere in between these two situations would be quite important. So, so far, I, I didn't make any progress along this line, but I'm just saying this. But like, like we need to accept some modeling error. So this is always true. Maybe we have some nice knowledge. So we have a approximate you know, knowledge of the model. So we have a reasonable model, but there's always a gap between the reality and, and you know, the model. So we want to take this small gap between the reality and the assumed model is an important key. Maybe you don't really have to be completely non-parametric because we, we have certain knowledge in practice. We should definitely use it, but we, we should be sure that our knowledge is not really correct in practice. So I hope we can make some progress along this line. Thank you very much. Exactly 25 minutes. <laughs> Yes. Um, with respect to the first uh, presentation, the, uh, I really like this uh, uh, volume minimization. Oh, yeah. Volume minimization. Mm -hmm. um, so, there, the even the dimensional view is not big enough that you could just use some sort of optimal. Uh, oh, so, but this is a plus, not minus. Mm -hmm. um, so, what is the dimension of V? The number of classes times number of classes. Okay, so you could actually, because this actually has no big complexity or problem. This is, mm -hmm. this is super nice then. Because if you have 10 classes or 100 classes, uh, the derivative of this is just the inverse of the matrix. So you can easily mm -hmm. do this. And the, the performance that you get out of this is significantly better, right? In, in principle, yes. But I, I must admit that if the number of classes if you have more than 10 or you know, 100, maybe this method does not work so well. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, okay, okay, of course. Now, with respect to the, the second part, is, mm -hmm. it, is it also possible to think of this core teaching method as a, as a some, some sort of a learning fast and slow? Because I, I feel that one of your neural nets is learning slow, whereas the other neural net is learning fast, and you somehow balance between the two. Is, that, is, it, is it an okay way to think about it that way? Yeah, that, that's a very nice idea. So, so I have no idea, to be honest. So like, we can also consider a lot of different variations of core teaching, and like, we may even prepare the third network to do something. Mm -hmm. So, but right, so maybe maintaining diversity is somewhat important. Maybe some could learn fast and some could learn slow. Because here, the learning slow part would be getting these, let's say, the, most of the data points when they have uh, consistency. That's when these linear or simpler approximations work. Mm -hmm. So this is where the slow learner would get quickly. Mm -hmm. Whereas the fast learner would bypass this part and mm -hmm. start just overfitting everything. Right? And I, I felt that this is some something that you're exploiting here. That's why I I, uh, I, I asked. Yeah. Is it okay to think about it? Yeah. The, 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 slow learner and yeah. fast learner somehow an interplay in between. That, that, that sounds very nice, and I think from the optimization viewpoint, that could be analyzable. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
But of course, the question is whether we choose the you know, final solution as one of the models, or we may take the ensemble of some yeah. different solutions. So there must be a lot of variations here. Yes. Thank you. Pack results for, uh, let's say your sam distribution is perturbed, um, mm -hmm. and you want to have fine, like finite sample gains. That's based on some distance between the distributions, mm -hmm. p bar and p. Are there such results? Um, so in this framework, so it's just a standard you know, empirical risk minimization yes. type analysis. Right. So we didn't really consider perturbation. No, in, sorry, I mean the pack uh, probability approximately correct like number of samples you need let's mm. say you have uh, your data for your, is a from a perturbed distribution but you mm. want to generalize to other another yeah, yeah. So, so okay right for, for the first part basically like, like this method has such a you know guarantee in, in the paper I, I didn't show the convergence result here uh, it's a finite sample bound okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. but one of us scared of in convergence okay. Okay. always okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I have a question on how to choose hyperparameters in practice. So I think for research, graduate students can find mm. good hyperparameters. Right? Uh, so like, like, <laughs> under under, yeah. <laughs> under labor noise, I think. Uh, like, like lambda here, and also yeah. like if you use stochastic gradients, so we need to do a lot of things, yeah, yeah, and yeah, 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 neural yeah. network architecture, and, but this is always the problem, I agree. So there's so, no, how to say, good way right now. So the, of course, there are some heuristics. Yeah, and maybe yeah, yeah. Th those are written in the paper mm -hmm. or stored in the, the student's <laughs> brain. But yeah, so anyway, we, we need some knowledge to mm -hmm. do that. That's yeah. true. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The statements are true. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, perfect. So our next speaker is Martin Ergi, who's um, leading the machine learning uh, uh, for optimization laboratory at EPFL. Take it away, Martin. Uh, okay, thanks a lot for the invitation and for organizing this nice workshop. Uh, this should be a, a good follow up on the, on the co-teaching we had before. So it's also about collaborative learning and, and teaching. Uh, I would keep it high level by trying to give a, a few building blocks that we need for or that we can use to have different agents learn together. And uh, yes, so the, the very basic setting is, is coming from standard distributed learning. When we have uh, different users or agents which each have their own data set, but the goal here is to train a model which is good on, on the union of all agents, right? The union of the whole data set, which you see on the top right. Uh, but we we want to keep the data on on each client so this is how you train large models uh on large data sets now in data centers but our focus here is a bit different we we would rather think of this as maybe in the federated setting when we do this for a different reason for the reason of privacy that the data remains where it is uh, of course we use uh, gradient based methods for now so we haven't gone yet much to a uh, distillation message which would be a bit more general which would relate to the previous talk when we when we also ask about where the training signal comes from but for us it's simple simple gradients here uh yeah federated learning i already mentioned and uh the motivations are are many of them uh, for example you have different hospitals which are not legally allowed to send the data away so they're kind of legally uh, obliged to, to use a scheme like that. So, so you could then still enable them to train a joint model or on devices, for example, the next word prediction when you write on your phone. So, uh, but this is kind of only a, an intermediate step which gives uh, a bit better uh, privacy. But what I'm kind of much more motivated for is to go one step further, which is to go to, to the real uh, collaborative learning and the difference on the right side, what we call decentralized is that for one, one difference is that there's no server anymore so that the clients kind of self-organize who they want to learn with and, and when they want to do this and, and how they select their collaborators. And, and most importantly, also like what they want to learn. That's a major difference between federated learning where the goal is the sum of each agent's tasks 
to the decentralized setting on the right where everyone can have a different task. So this is why I think it's a bit more pure that, uh, yeah, maybe people have different goals, different tasks, but they still can ask, uh, can I get help from, from other agents to, to learn my model, to do better on, on my task. So, so this is a bit the setting where we want to go, but we always do the easier setting for federated as a, as a first intermediate step. So. And maybe today I just want to briefly touch on two aspects. And one of them is when, when some of the agents are malicious. So they're giving us like bad gradients and so on. They're trying to break the system. So what can we do then? They're trying to poison the, the data. And, and then in a second part, I, I wanna talk just briefly about the, the collaborative setting when everyone has a different task, uh, what we can then still hope to achieve if you can how much help can we get and how do we benefit from the from the collaborators so that's the plan for the next few minutes so the setting with adversaries is quite simple so as before we have five workers and some of them are are the regular ones the the white uh, the yellow ones and the some of them are are malicious intentionally or not right they also just might be faulty this is, uh, it's very related to fault tolerance as well. I mean, some might just fail, but some might fail for uh, even a, a bit of more malicious reason. They are actively trying to, to break the system. So they're gonna send you gradients. They send gradients to the server, which are totally wrong. They can send arbitrary messages. So for example, they can just send you the, the negative gradient of, of the, the true gradient that they should normally send and, and then hope that this is gonna uh, derail the system. This is also related to data poisoning, but data poisoning is kind of a weaker notion because there you would say, okay, I send you a gradient, but it's, it's from a, a poison data example, which I handcrafted. But here, what you send can be anything. It doesn't need to be a gradient. So the malicious workers can send whatever message they want. And what we hope is that we could still uh, train if the, the overall fraction of malicious workers is kind of manageable, let's say, Half of them are malicious, like usually this we cannot do, but maybe 20% are malicious, uh, something, something like that. This is called a Byzantine robust uh, training setting. And yeah, just to, to give you the basic uh, solution approach, which is, uh, has been known for, for many years, uh, not by us, but by many groups have, have worked on this. So traditionally you just average all gradients and now you need something else because Obviously the average is not robust. So one uh, bad entry can spoil the entire average completely. So what you do, well, you replace the, the average, the mean, you replace it by the median, for example. And we know median is a more robust quantity than the mean, uh, but we have to be a bit precise. What do we mean by more robust? But uh, let's think of one concrete example is for example, yeah, uh, let's let's just do the coordinate wise median of these five uh, entries that we get, right? So every gradient is a huge uh, vector and we do this entry wise, we just use the median for, for every coordinate. Uh, but there are other methods too, and I will show you a simpler one uh, later on, but this is, seems a reasonable algorithm. The question now is, could we analyze it? Could we still say that the new algorithm converges uh, converges anyway with good workers and then also does it converge when we have presence of bad workers. So, so there is one uh, result which we were thinking about, which is uh, asking that like if, yeah, if you, if you just ask this, this question here in uh, every time step separately, just like now today I will decide these are, these are my good workers and, and uh, I will average with them. If you don't remember who sent you the bad vector, if you don't try to, to build knowledge and learn who are the, the good workers and the bad ones, then you cannot uh, learn. And this is the, uh, the result here, that if you don't remember who sent you what, if you just ask in one iteration, can I, uh, can I solve this problem? Then the answer is no, because uh, you can be fooled by uh, people changing their position. You don't know who, who was sending the bad entry. So you need to kind of keep track uh, and learn because there's so much noise, right? Every gradient is already noisy. 
And then on top of that, there is even more noise from, from being malicious. So these two things you want to try to keep it apart. How can you reduce the noise to see more signal on who is malicious and who is nice? So one super simple uh, method would be to just use momentum uh, on, on the past uh, steps you have done, right? Momentum is very standard anyway in deep learning training. So let's just use it. And we use uh, worker momentum, which means like uh, locally on the client, we, we keep moving in the directions we used to. I mean, often people use this from an optimization point of view. They try to speed up training. That's, that's not the purpose why we use it here. Here we use it for a different reason. We use it to have a more stable reference point on, to have a reference point on what is good and, and what is malicious, right? To have this reference point to, uh, to then uh, use this reference to aggregate the, the stuff around which, which we think are good gradients. So yeah, exponential moving average, very simple. Uh, it removes a lot of the noise, so then hopefully there will be more signal. And if we have that, then we can use the standard aggregation rules, which could be the mean or the median or whatever you want, but not on these noisy original gradients, but on the mo momentum stabilized ones. That's the algorithm. Uh, what aggregation rule? Uh, one that is, is simplest here is even simpler than the median thing I told you. Uh, the simplest one here, I think it's just to use clipping. So you, you look at the norm, you look at the Euclidean norm, how far away are you from the reference point? The reference point is MI, the, the momentum stabilized update that you as a worker were always doing and you can always trust yourself. That's why the, the MI is something you trust. And these Vs are the, the vectors you receive from the other workers, you don't trust them. So now the the question is, yeah, if you just clip them to the reference point, then you hopefully uh, stabilize them around something that you trust as being good. And this this works well. And another small remark I can make is that, I mean, clipping is not a bad idea anyway. So there's other reasons that people do clipping anyway in deep learning here, which is say, let's also use clipping uh, to achieve the, the Byzantine robustness. Uh, and then if we think about this, so then we can sometimes also analyze this. So there's some, some assumptions are here. So for example, this is only true if the, the data on each worker is still IRD. So this is a bit of limitation. Uh, but here what we analyze is if there's a, a fraction delta of, of potentially malicious workers and the, the regular workers have a sigma amount of noise, then we get something which resembles the traditional SGD convergence rate, which is basically what we have here. If we forget about the delta, then you have what we all know. And the nice thing is you get the speed up with the number of collaborators you have. So if you have there's n people present, there's n times as much gradients computed. So you you hope this is good for something, right? You hope that these n additional GPUs you have, they also give you something good that you should be n times as fast. So that's that's what we usually get. But can we also get this when we have malicious workers? The answer is, it depends, right? If the delta is zero, then yes. But if the fraction of malicious workers gets larger, then you see that will be less uh, speed up, right? Eventually, there will be no speed up for n in n anymore if, if the delta is significantly uh, large, if, if the delta becomes as big as, I don't know, large, if it becomes dominating part in some of these two terms, then, then you don't, uh, benefit from n anymore. Okay, so this is convergence and it's only to a local uh, stationary point. It's not a global convergence, of course, but at least it's applicable in non-convex if uh, you have the standard settings. Uh, yeah, that would be the first part. And in the next few minutes, I, or if there's no question, I would like to discuss a bit if we go to then heterogeneous data and if we can also do a similar thing like that in in the decentralized setting on a, on a graph. So is there any question at this point? Yeah. I have a question. From the balance distribution, what kind of update we will do? We will do update during chicken jumping. Chicken jumping. Waiting a certain amount of time. 
Yeah, that's a nice question. Like, what what, what are the the bad things that these workers can do? And uh, the nice uh, property about this analysis is that there's anything is allowed. We we have no some. That's why it's called the Byzantine setting, right? They're, they're truly allowed to send any message. Uh, they're also kind of all knowing, right? The adversaries they could uh, collude between each other, but the only assumption here is that there's only, let's say, twenty percent of of all the workers are malicious. Yeah. Then if if you're a bad agent, what would you do? Uh, this is hard for me to answer, but uh, well, you standard attacks is like that. You flip your label, which would then sometimes result in flipping the gradient. Uh, yes, things like that. That yeah. <laughs> In, in this result, the aggregator is fixed, is that correct? Uh, yeah, you need an aggregator which has the, the nice property of robustness. The, the one I showed you on the previous slide does have this property. There might be other aggregators and who also we, have this property. We, we basically um, help yourself here is to make sure that the client has this momentum which has this consistent effect that uh, when the client is at the serial, somehow this kind of shows up with the mm -hmm. signal of momentum. Uh, you could potentially also try to somehow randomize the aggregator as well, right? So if the, if the nice clients don't care, they're not attacking the network, they should, they should still do whatever they are doing, including their merry gradients. But if, the, if, the, if you're just constantly changing the aggregator, maybe the adversary needs to somehow Adapt, and you could also use that as a scheme. Yeah, that's right. That's cool. Yeah, if if you could think of a scheme that would you would kind of make the adversary weaker, that the adversary wouldn't know some secret randomness that is used in aggregation. Actually, this I think is related to some thing people do when when you have heterogeneous data. Then there is this kind of bucketing techniques where you do this kind of randomization, which maybe relies on that, that you, you assume the adversary does not know the randomness, but in aggregation, you could use it. But here, the aggregator is fully deterministic, but uh, yeah, it's a nice, nice uh, avenue. Yes. Can I ask Please, sure. In this kind of robustness analysis, I think statistical efficiency and robustness are always trade-offs to this. So can you somehow observe that kind of trade-off in this bound or some other result? The statistical robustness. Like well, twenty percent of the, the clients are malicious. It's less than twenty percent. If the ratio is different. Yeah, I mean you're right. There is something hidden in the O constant, which which would depend on on what you say the statistical robustness. That's basically this uh, this kind of C quantity we we are hiding a bit here. <laughs> that is true. Yes. But in uh, the solution can be extremely conservative. But most of them are the good guys, but the solution is really conservative, and even more of the guys. Uh, that's, that's right, but, uh, but these constants they do not depend on n, so uh, and at least n the fraction of malicious one is explicit here, so, but yeah, you're right, uh, the constants matter sometimes, yeah. <laughs> okay. or, or that doesn't change. Uh, yes, yes, thanks. Yes? Yeah, I I will get to that. Uh, I think yeah, the the intuition you should have that this is, is handled by the clipping, right? If if an agent is not clipped, then it means that you you trust them; they're good. You have selected them. Uh, but this, I think, this will be more clear in the following when we think from from the each agent's task. So who should you select to collaborate with? 
and uh, you basically use clipping uh, and then I will get to this when when we move here a bit because here that's actually really the next step because I want to to now ask the same question what if what if these users actually have different tasks they want to solve right because before federated is a bit strange right because we, we pretend that there is a global task which is the sum of everybody's tasks so I I don't like this assumption in in federated uh, on in the in the decentralized this is nicer right you could say everyone has their own task they select who they want to work with and they try to solve the task but now again uh, that's related to what you ask uh, like so now yeah how should one user who should they trust and uh, i will get to this basically the answer will be yeah you again use your local reference point and you you clip uh, what you receive and yeah the ones who are uh, are cut these are the bad ones and the other ones are the ones you should collaborate with so that's that's the idea and yeah Yeah, you, you're right. If the if the tasks are very different, this becomes uh, difficult. So, but this is a uh, this is something that is also on this slide. I'll, I will get to this, and that is still a bit a bit challenging. So to uh, because uh, yeah, because it's actually kind of impossible to distinguish if if someone you're trying to collaborate with has a, has a different task, right, or if they're actually malicious. It, that's impossible to say, right? Because if, if it's a malicious one, it could just be that they have a very, very strange task. Uh, but how? there's no way I can distinguish being malicious from having a very strange task. So when we, when we talk about this here, then we will assume a kind of a task similarity, which, uh, so now if you want to look at the middle of the slide here, then, then we see we have a Z uh, here. And that is, the, that is exactly this kind of quantity how the tasks are related. So, so we use a very simple gradient as a variance between the, the clients, between the nodes, right? So your gradient in expectation is how far away from, from my gradient. So this pairwise uh, variance is the set uh, here, which, which then affects the rate. So this is a, this is a very uh, useful quantity. And I'll, I'll also get back to this in the end, when we, we talk about the speed up we could get, uh, uh, where we also need to task similarity. What, what is nice here is that you can kind of choose, right? You can choose what's a similarity level for the people you want to collaborate with. So it's kind of up to you. It's just, if you want people very similar to you, you will define uh, this clipping radius like that. You will find people who are, I mean, if you're lucky, there's a lot of people in this radius and you will get benefit from them. You get a speed up for how many collaborators you find. Uh, if, but if you're unlucky and you for, you're, you're asking for very similar people, then you might not find enough, right? Then you might not find enough collaborators. So, so that's a bit of trade-off, which I will come back uh, at the end again briefly. But here, there is actually a bit another thing I also wanted to mention, and that's the dependence on the topology and the, uh, the graph topology, who talks to whom. And that's another kind of interesting aspect. It's also a bit non-trivial because the thing is that in, if everyone talks to everyone, that's like federated, then things are simple. But if you're on a graph, the, the problem is that you can quickly get isolated and you can get surrounded by bad guys. So that's kind of the problem that can happen. So you see if the, if the top worker here is malicious, it's not a big problem because everyone else can still exchange messages. But if the one in the middle, this one, is malicious, if we suddenly split the whole network into two, so then it becomes impossible for the green workers on the right and the, on the left to exchange and to learn together. So, so this is, the question is like, how many bad workers are there in your neighborhood and can they take the dominance of your neighborhood? And if that happens, uh, it's a big problem, right? So that's, that's why on the graph, it's a bit different. But uh, there is a way you can still get a result here. Yeah, and this, the assumptions are that the, the graph of the good workers is connected and has a, a nice spectral gap, which means it mixes quickly. 
And the other assumption is what I said about the similarity to theta. So if, if the tasks are similar enough and the graph of the good works is still connected, then, then you can see get results. And, but this relates to the question I think you had when they're very dissimilar, you will not get to a perfect optimum. You will not perfectly learn uh, your task anymore because the others are different, right? So then there will be a, a, a threshold or error level that you cannot get beyond and that it will depend on the, on the heterogeneity of the task, the, the zeta. Yeah, this is a, <clears throat> a bit of summary for the Byzantine. <clears throat> I'll, I'll go quickly over, <clears throat> over this one. I mean, it's very related to what we discussed, right? Uh, uh, it's just, again, basically asking the same question now. I mean, forget about Byzantine, but now let's, talk, let's just talk about the heterogeneity that uh, you are worker F0, you want to minimize F0. Uh, can you get help from other workers 1 to N? Uh, what do you mean by help? I mean, they give you gradients. Uh, so are these gradients good for you? Are they going to speed up your, your learning? Of course, you can just train alone, right? Solve the purple problem on the left alone. But these, these helpers here, they're, they're willing to help you for free. So you give them actually a model X. They give you a gradient back for free. They are very nice, right? Uh, it's just that they are a bit different, right? So the, the gradient they give you, even if they're very willing to help, it, it might be a bit too unrelated for you. So you need to decide uh, which gradients are helpful for you or not. If everyone would be IID, then, then I get these N gradients from others and hopefully I'll be N times as fast. But here the point is really to, to think about if it's not IID, if everyone has a bit of different task. This is also very related to, to mean estimation, which is a special case of that. If you just ask, I have a small data set, I wanna see my mean. Other people have another, well, they can get samples from another distribution, just their distribution. So you also, if they give me these additional samples from a different distribution, does it make me faster to estimate my mean? That's a, another special case of this question. And, and again, you need to make some assumption that the, the true means are not too far away and so on. Uh, but if they are, then yes, you can accept the help, accept these free additional samples and yeah, hope to be n times faster when you have n collaborators. Uh, so now we want to do optimization, we want to do learning, right? So of course, I what the simplest thing I can do is to think on, on top. So I just use my, I, in every round, I get my own gradient. I get these helper gradients. I, I mean, I will always give a big weight to my own gradient, I trust it, but it's expensive. So I wanna use the helper gradients as well. And I, I give some, some weights to them and have to decide on good weights. Uh, this is a bit tricky, right? Because they are biased towards my task compared relative to my task. They're, they're not unbiased estimators. A slight variant you can do is you can try to correct. So, you know, they have a wrong expectation, but maybe you can learn a shift. This is also related to like a drift reduction in federated learning when everyone drifts too much on their own task. Or maybe there's a way to correct it, to subtract something such that it becomes a better estimator for the gradient you want, right? And you want a, a gradient for F0. Uh, so can you correct for it or could you learn a you could also learn a more complex function which takes these helper gradients and hopefully maps them to something which is more useful for you as a agent F0 to become, to make progress on F0. That's the idea. We only have some very preliminary result on the strong, very strong assumptions. So here we need the task to have Hessian similarities. So basically the, the landscapes of each agent must be very similar to each other. Uh, if they are, then the gradients help to some degree. And one downside is also we, we need the similarity to become very, very high uh, when the number of steps grows at the moment. But this is, I guess, a nice research topic. And I guess that's it. I have a advertising slide on software. We're actually trying to make a JavaScript software, which is a bit strange in machine learning, but it's nice because it, it runs in browser and so on, and you can play with it. And, and hopefully people can bring their new ML models, run it on the phone or whatever on the browser. And we tried 
to have some of the schemes here, like federated decentralized. And also you can have uh, this robustness that I mentioned. So we have clipping supported, so you can have a bit of BSD in robustness. You could also have secure aggregation if to slightly, yeah, give a bit more privacy to the gradients. So uh, yeah, if, if anyone has expertise here, we would really like to get your help and uh, this is open source. Anyone's welcome. Uh, yes, that's it. Uh, I don't want to take too much from your lunch, yeah? So, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. So in the first part, so you use the momentum to robustify the solution rather than to accelerate the solution. So um, it is like a moving average, taking a moving average, it's like an exponential decay. So is there any possibility to consider other weighted average, like just taking the average of the history? So does it work? So, uh, you mean history of your own agent or of the other agents? Uh? Well, so in, a, in, a, in a each age, so you can take the other age of the histories and then we can aggregate that. So instead of just taking the exponential weighted other age, so you can take the other age, hmm. just, just a um, uniform other age over the history. So, yeah, yeah my question is uh, just uh, is there any other options to obtain uh, the same convergence? Hmm. So, I, I think so, yes. So we just took momentum because it was the simplest. Uh, one and we based the analysis then on this uh, Kutowski and Orabona paper, which is called Storm, which is uh, analyzing SGD with momentum and using a similar analysis. Yeah, uh, yeah. The goal here is yeah, it's not to accelerate, it's just to stabilize, uh, as you said, so to remove the noise. Yeah, and yeah, there might be other methods, maybe some variance reduction techniques. Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. Thanks. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. But in this kind of distributed scenario, so are, are there any works that considers kind of distribution shift in variance? Variance may have different, slightly different distribution. Actually, we want to look like Yeah, I like this question uh, because it's related. It's more about this, the sequential learning aspect. So I mean, because here everything we have it's synchronized. Everyone is working at the same time, which is not realistic. But you're right. Like if if a worker would like just one of them works first and then another worker takes their model and keeps working on a different task then you're exactly in the setting of, of transfer learning or uh, also it's related yeah this may be continual learning or so or curriculum learning that yeah what happens if you first learn task one and then you transfer and learn task two do you forget task one uh, before so we also were interested in this maybe it's also what if if you run SGD, but with a strange order of data? So uh, that's I think quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's thank Martin again. <laughs> Thanks for the questions. So hi everybody, welcome back to the afternoon session of the joint CIS Weekend AIP um, workshop on machine learning and artificial intelligence. So this afternoon, we start with Masatoshi Sensei um, uh, on music structure analysis. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Masatoshi Hamanaka, and I work for Rick in Japan. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, Music Structure Analysis Based on uh, Transformer. Uh, first, I'll explain what the time span tree is. The time span tree is uh, derived by generative theory of tonal music, GTTM in short. The GTTM was proposed by Friedel and Jackendorf in 1983. Uh, here is a melody and its corresponding time span tree. Uh, we can obtain an abstracted melody by slicing the tree down 
the middle and omitted nodes uh, that are connected uh, to branches under a given line. If we slice the tree higher up, we can get more abstracted melody. And this shows the evolution of GTTM analyzers and applications. The analyzers are shown here above the timeline. And below the timeline are the GTTM applications. Uh, we propose uh, this uh, melody, uh, melodic morphing method here. Here is an overview of melodic morphing method. Uh, first, we acquire two time span trees, uh, sigma A and sigma B, uh, from two input melodies, A and B. And then we can acquire the common information of sigma A and sigma A meet sigma B by using the meet operator. Uh, we can acquire sigma uh, alpha, uh, which is the intermediate of sigma A and sigma A meet sigma B, uh, because the information of sigma A includes sigma A meet sigma B. In the same way, sigma beta is acquired from sigma B and sigma A meet sigma B. Uh, finally, we can acquire sigma alpha join sigma beta, which is an intermediate of sigma A and sigma B by combining sigma alpha and sigma beta. Uh, by using the melody morphing method, uh, we made uh, uh, this uh, melody morphing, uh, melody throat machine. Uh, we use a dial type interface that enables uh, replacing the part of the melody, melody segment uh, that the virtual performer will play. Variations in melody segment are composed on the basis of melodic morphing method. So switching the melody segment maintains the overall uh, structure of the melody and only changes the ornamentations. Uh, let me show you a video of our melody throat machine. Uh, there are four problems in automating the morphing and time span tree analysis. Uh, the first problem has to do with the, the order of the abstract nodes 
in partial melody reduction. Uh, for example, the reduced pass from sigma A to sigma A meet to sigma B can be written um, uh, by this formula, but the pass is not unique. The second problem is that the two notes overlapped uh, temporarily that may occur in the join of two time span trees. In such cases, uh, it is necessary to manually select one melody from among multiple generative melodies, and it, it is difficult to completely automate the morphing. The third problem is low number of ground truth data set. As ground truth data of the time span tree, uh, 300 melodies and their time span trees are published in the GTTM database. However, the number of data set is extremely small for uh, running uh, deep neural networks. Uh, for a small amount of running data, uh, overfitting is inev inevitable and an appropriate value cannot be output when unknown data are input. Uh, therefore, we propose uh, stepwise uh, reduction that the maximum process uh, of analysis is set as one data set. Then the number of data set is increased. For example, if the deep neural net, uh, neural net directly ran the relationship between a uh, four note melody and its time span tree, the number of the data set is only one. Uh, if we consider the process of reducing one node to one data set, uh, the number of data set will be three. A time span tree for a melody consisting of four nodes can be constructed by estimating four uh, to three nodes, uh, three to two nodes, and two to one node, uh, and uh, combining the result. That implement, uh, implement the stepwise reduction, the priority of branches must be obtained in a total order. However, there's no detailed explanation uh, on the re uh, reduction process in the GTTM. Uh, for example, this figure, uh, we can see the five level of uh, uh, five, uh, level of reduction results, but it is not clear how many levels are necessary. Uh, furthermore, the priority order with, uh, within one level is unknown. Uh, as a solution to these problems, uh, we propose a time span tree leveled by duration of time span. Uh, we call the longest uh, temporary interval when a given pitch event becomes more, most salient as a maximum time span for the event. In other words, the maximum time span of a pitch event uh, considers with the temporal duration of the subtree of which, uh, which the event becomes the head. As a result of time span three analysis, the priority of each uh, branch of time span tree is determined within a time span tree drawn with the maximum time uh, span used in the time span segmentation carried out as the first step of the analysis of time span reduction. The branch priority is determined in accordance with the following rules. Uh, priorities are assigned to each level from the top of the time span tree drawn with the duration of the time span. At the top level, the main branches uh, take uh, pr procedures. At the second and subsequent levels, the higher the priority of branch X is, the higher the priority of the branch of uh, X becomes. Uh, this figure shows a time span tree drawn with the duration of the time span. 
the branch priority is determined in, uh, in order from the top in accordance with the first rule. Then in accordance with the second rule, branch one has the highest priority in, uh, in this time span three, and branch two has the second highest priority. The second level in this tree is the uh, double node level. In accordance with the second rule, the branch uh, of, of from one becomes three, and that from two becomes four. In the same manner, the priority is determined up to the sixth, uh, sixth uh, node level. Uh, now, uh, here's the experimental result uh, for automating uh, melodic morphing. Uh, after acquiring the time span tree, uh, there was no utter attributeness in the prioritization of the branches, uh, partial reduction, and uh, combination of melodies. And therefore, when the reduction ratio was determined, the most melody could be deterministically obtained. In the figure, the notes include in melody A are displayed with the stem up, and uh, uh, those include in melody B are displayed with stem down. Uh, here's an experimental result for stepwise time span reduction. Uh, running and evaluation data were uh, created from musical XML and time span XML. Data before and after the reduction were generated by using the time span tree uh, revealed by duration of time span. Uh, the note in the melodies were made uh, into a one character string with the pitch and the duration uh, con concatenated. The pitch was represented as uh, three types. Uh, the duration was represented by multiplying the duration element of musical XML by four, and then rounded up to an integer. And here's an example of before and after the reduction. Uh, the duration after reduction is uh, getting longer. Uh, here's the experiment result two. The sequence, two sequence and transformer melodies, uh, which are uh, kinds of deep neural network were both trained with uh, 7,362 stepwise time span reduction and training data set uh, generated from 270 songs from a GTTM database consisting of 300 pieces and 849 evaluating data sets were generated from, from remaining 30 pieces. And uh, this figure shows the uh, accuracies of uh, evaluating the data. And we can set the transformer out performed uh, sequence to sequence in stepwise time span reduction. And uh, uh, here's a conclusion. Uh, we propose the uh, uh, introduced of, uh, of time span three level by the duration of time span uh, two problems uh, that are difficult to automate due to the lack of prioritization of time span three branches. And Experimental result uh, confirmed that uh, melodic morphing and time span analysis based on deep learning can be automated. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, there was um, there was a talk on arrangement of frames. Yeah. And I was wondering how a 
how do you make sure that the synchronization and the second wave as the mass as the first instrument? Because I understand that the melody that you generate, of course, for the first instrument is going to be the, the problem. Right? And how, how do you make sure that they, they are both synchronized um, in such a way that the tone and, and you know, the, the Oh, uh, yeah, we record a uh, background melody first, and then the prayer, uh, marimba prayer play with the background melody. Uh, that, that can be. Then the melody can change, do you? Or can it change the background? Right, that's right. Yeah, background is the same. And the background is always the same. And uh, the structure is almost, uh, musical structure is almost similar. So the important timing is, uh, uh, yeah. Yes. And, and in the second phase, you also learn in transformers. I couldn't get the point of where machine learning fits in this uh, uh, Actually, uh, first area is uh, I use the rule base uh, analyzer, and then we use the uh, probabilistic model, uh, like here. Uh, after that, uh, we use the uh, deep running, and uh, yeah, this is uh, just a deep neural network. Um, the re recently, we use the transformer and the sequence to sequence. Do you make uh, rules to probabilistic uh, Yes, it's kind of machine learning, I think, but. Uh, yeah, accuracy is not so good. So we uh, completely change the uh, method, uh, like the data driven. Yeah. Because with the transformer, you seem to have quite good accuracy. Yes. So you literally take 90% of the piece of music and predict the last 10 uh, uh, 10%. Yes. And you hit ninety more than ninety percent accuracy with the transformers. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. so the accuracy is basically you actually check if you Ooh. hit the correct note. Right? Mm -hmm. okay. I just have to check. So the accuracy you evaluate as you have a full piece. Say of, uh, uh, no, not, not, uh, pieces. not, uh, I have uh, 300 data set and 260 for running and 30 is for uh, unit testing. Yeah, completely different. But uh, yeah, uh, data set is about the uh, crash memory. So the uh, so Mozart or has uh, many songs, so the uh, maybe the similar characteristic. So maybe a follow up. So the accuracy is measured on the transformer generating the same thirty pieces, or I thought it was generating things that. No, no, no. Uh, the, so now it's transformer can use. Uh, 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 generated uh, after reduction, the right side. Uh, we input left side and output right side. Uh, left side is before the reduction and right side are the one note uh, reduction after reduction. <laughs> I don't know, I'm passionate. Um, so if you wanted to generate these 
the multiple instances of mm -hmm. the water okay. So let me just follow up with my previous question. Would you have to put up rules to make sure that those instruments are, are sort of making sense music for me so that the sounds make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh one is to explain hard rock and one is to explain rest is to explain soft rock. Uh, you mean the uh, uh, this uh, melodic morphing, melodic morphing yeah, method? Yeah, so if you morph it for several instruments, you're doing a piece and then a half and then a <laughs> It's very different. Um, so how do you how do you make sure? Uh, that sound is uh, different. I yeah. I, I think. Okay. And would that be possible to extend this for different instruments? Um, uh, my method is about uh, using the score. So. Not related to the sound, yeah. Uh, that is di different problem, yeah. But uh, yeah, the point is interesting. So we try to, yeah, sort uh, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, uh, yeah, that is, and, and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is a good point. But uh, my, this method is only like uh, uh, mathematics, <laughs> calculating. So it's difficult to, uh, yeah, sort of the uh, hand motion, yeah. But uh, uh, I have another uh, research ab about the uh, motion of the hand uh, playing the uh, violin. So, so uh, yeah, no, that, that is... No, <laughs> no. no. No, but uh, uh, the method can generate the uh, fig figure shape, uh, finger shape, yeah. Uh, mainly the left hand. Right hand is also uh, difficult, but uh, uh, most difficult is combination. Yeah. And for that, you use only machine learning or, or you use some rules? Uh, originally, we used the uh, Rule base, but it moved to the uh, machine learning. Yeah, that is better uh, on, on our research. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's a it's a great pleasure to have Lenai Shita uh, here uh, giving us. Um, uh, a talk, Lenai, he's a professor at the, the math department here at UCSL, leading the DOLA group. Looking forward to the talk. Thank you. So we'll press, yeah, play, okay. So thank you for the introduction. So we are going to enter into a different world, that's called the world of music. Uh, here we're going to talk about Paris centers. Uh, so this will be a, a slightly uh, like a mathematical talk, but uh, if you have any question or any, if any notation is unclear, please do not hesitate to interrupt me. We can make this interactive. So I want to talk to you about an object which somehow I bumped into while I was doing researches uh, on slightly different topic. I will come to it in the third part of my talk. I was working on some optimization algorithms and I realized that there is some notion of Barry Center with uh, very nice properties uh, into one object. And so I want to tell you a bit about this object. So tractable Barry Center for probability measures in machine learning. So by tractable, I mean that it's both theoretically tractable and also in practice. I want this to be an object that you can also use in applications. So what do I uh, have in mind when I talk about Barry Centers in the space of measures? Well, this is, as you imagine, you have several probability measures. Here I have plotted three probability measures called new one, new two, new three. 
on uh, the, uh, the two-dimensional plane. And I want to have a notion of Paris center or a notion of probability measure which averages the three of them. So I want to understand a notion of Paris center in the space of probability measures. And this can have many uh, nice applications. One of those uh, is for instance to, uh, if you have several, uh, if you have uh, a large task where you want to compute some posteriors of uh, Bayesian uh, uh, computations, but it's a too big task, then you can separate it into smaller tasks. Uh, this is a nice uh, paper by uh, Chever and co-authors. You can separate it in smaller tasks and then combine all your posteriors into a single object using the uh, Paris center of this probability measure. So whenever you have several probability measures that you want to summarize in one object, you want to uh, define a good notion of Paris center be between probability measures. And you see that in this kind of applications, you are dealing with large scale objects. So we have a large number of points which define our probability measures. Usually they are only defined via samples. We do not really have access to densities, but only to samples. We are in high dimension. So we want some object which behaves well in all these, uh, in this context, which is a large scale. We might also have a large number of probability measures. Yeah, I just plotted three, but we might have a large number of them. Okay, so that's uh, the object. And the approach that we will take, which is somehow uh, very natural, is related to optimal transport. So before I define what is an optimal transport by center, which is uh, in some sense the most natural notion of by center between priority measures, I need to introduce some technical uh, definitions. So I will always consider uh, in this talk X to be a compact convex subset of RD. So D is the dimension of my space and X uh, the subset, DX the Lebesgue measure, and let's take mu and nu two probability measures on this set. So the notations I will use here, this is for the relative entropy. This is also known as the Kullback Leibler divergence between mu and nu. This is noted uh, H nu nu, okay? This uh, standard definition. And the Kullback Leibler divergence between mu and the Lebesgue measure, this is a negative differential entropy. It will be denoted H of nu. So all these functions are convex. And now that I've defined this, I can define uh, entropic optimal transport. So this is a certain regularization of optimal transport. Let me go through the definition step by step. So first we choose a notion of cost C, which tells us when I take two points in my space, what is the effort that is required to move from one point to the other. So usually you can think of this as the distance between two points or the square distance between two points. And then you consider the set of transport plans, mu nu, which I will define in the next slide. And over all these sets, you want to minimize some uh, convex optimization problem. So what is a set of transport plan? This is the set of ways to move the mass from a probability distribution nu to another probability distribution nu. So here is the definition. This is formalized as a probability measure on the product space x times x, such that the first marginal is nu and the second marginal is nu, presentation with one dimensional distribution. Gamma here is a transport plan. Here it tells us that if I take a point in mu, it will be uh, scattered through all the distribution in mu. So here this is the product coupling, which is one example of transport plan, which is the most simple uh, transport plan. But you have also more uh, special uh, transport plans. For instance, gamma here, this is a transport plan, which is concentrated on the map, which tells us that the uh, points of mass of mu here will be transported to this point of mass of mu here. So transport plans are probability measures on the product space and they're used to, def, uh, to describe a way to move the mass from mu to mu or symmetrically from mu to mu. This is a way to describe the transport. And over this constraint set, so here this is a, a convex uh, subset of the space of probability measures on the product space mu time, uh, x times x, we define the following optimization problem. So over all transport plans, we want to minimize the integral of the cost against the transport plan. If I forget about this term, this is just the standard optimal transport problem. It tells us what is the most efficient way to move the mass from mu to uh, mu. Okay, this is a very natural notion of uh, discrepancy or distance between the space of probability measures. But as we will see, it's a bit difficult to deal with in practice because it's, it does not scale computationally nor statistically. So uh, one common approach is to add some entropic regularization term in this problem. So here I add lambda uh, times, 
Okay, I add two lambda times the relative entropy between the transport plan and the product measure mu times mu. So this regularization will tend to favor transport plan which are more diffuse. And we will see that it helps uh, on several aspects, computationally and statistically, to have a better defined object. So here, this is the quantity that we call T lambda of mu mu. And you can think of this as a notion of a discrepancy between quality measures, which is based on a notion of cost on the space. So it's uh, some, somehow a geometrically faithful uh, notion of dis distance between two quality measures, mu times mu. Is that two really important or? The two is important. And in fact, uh, that's why I, I have a little bug because I updated my slide this morning to change it to lambda. And I thought I changed everything. So here there's a tool, so I will make sure, I will comment. I, I hope it's consistent with the remaining, but yes, it's, it's important that there is. Uh, whether it's true or not. Okay, some small comments is that this function is convex in mu, convex in mu uh, as well. This, is, this would be very useful. And uh, that if I had chosen not the product measure as a reference in this uh, regularization term, but just the Lebesgue measure, then I have a simple transformation that the resulting cost is the same plus lambda uh, times the uh, relative the uh, entropy of mu and mu. Okay, so now that I have these technical objects which are defined, we can come to the definition of Paris standards. We have a notion of distance between two probability measures. So now we can use the usual uh, definition of a Paris center. So, for instance, when we have points in RD, one way to define their Paris center is to minimize the sum of the square distance to all these points. This gives us the Paris center. We can do the same in the space of priority measures. So here I take k priority measures, which are the ones of which I want to compute the Paris center, some weights that are normalized, so they sum to one. And I define this functional, which is the sum, uh, so mu is the variable, mu, mu i is or fixed. And I want to find the new, which minimizes this, this uh, function. So this is natural generalization of the notion of Paris center to the space of priority measures. And here you have an example of how it looks like when lambda is very small. So this is essentially the optimal transport by center, where you have new one, new two, new three, new four, which are in the corner of these squares. These are uh, quality distributions, which are indica indicators of density of uh, shapes uh, on the uh, two-dimensional plane. And you can see that when you vary the weights, you can interpolate between the various shapes. So this is one also uh, other example of application of uh, Barry centers in space of quality measures is to do some interpolation of shapes. But here we are more, we will be more interested in the uh, machine learning setting where we're in higher dimension with probability la larger. So that's uh, Wasserstein Barry centers. Uh, let me uh, look at the definition and what we can do. So the object I just showed you is essentially when we minimize G0, so unregularized optimal transport, this is the so called Wasserstein Barry center, in particular if I choose the uh, square distance as a cost. So I will say it looks perfect because that's the ideal object, which does not really scale very well in large scale applications, but that we would like to uh, somehow uh, copy. We'd like to, to have an object which behaves more or less like the Wasserstein Barry Center. And it looks perfect because it has very uh, nice geometric uh, properties, which I will not discuss. However, from a statistical point of view in high dimension, it's uh, hopeless to try to estimate it. You have a curse of dimensionality in the rate of estimation. And also for optimization, if you want to solve this problem, uh, it is known that this is an NP hard problem uh, in, uh, uh, in the dimension, the complexity scales exponentially. So we have to try to uh, tend down a little bit our expectation and find an approximate object which is more or less the same, but which will still remain tractable uh, in high dimension. So one idea, of course, is to uh, use non-zero regularization. We have introduced this entropic regularization, so it has to be useful somewhere. So uh, what is the effect? Maybe counterintuitively, it will tend to collapse the Barry center. Instead, so maybe when we hear entropy, we think oh, it might uh, dilute the, the density. But since this is the optimal transport plan, which is uh, regularized, it will tend to match like all the points from a major mu will be matched to many points in mu. And the best way to, uh, have, to minimize this cost when lambda is large, when I am sending my mass to many points, will be somehow to collapse and to reduce the variance of my solution. So this uh, induces some uh, annoying bias, but also it's not clear that uh, you actually improve on the statistical nor on the computational aspects. So here, 
all these problems or convex optimization problem in infinite dimension. So when you're uh, in small dimension, these are uh, convex optimization problem that you can solve on the machine. But here I'm really talking about the large dimensional case. And here it's not clear that this uh, uh, becomes more tractable in high dimension when uh, lambda uh, is non-zero. So we can try to have other regularization instead of minimizing G lambda, we can uh, instead not regularize G, but uh, regularize with an entropy uh, or Barry center to make it more diffuse. So this will of course tend to blur the, uh, the uh, aspect of the Barry center. And again, uh, I, know no, I know of no work that uh, show that it's improved statistically or uh, optimal uh, on uh, optimization aspects. And in fact, I think that this is not the case. Like there are still a uh, steep curve, but this is not shown anywhere. So these are uh, two attempts, which maybe are not satisfying. There is a, a third proposition, which I will uh, not talk about in detail, which is to uh, induce this uh, debiasing term. This is the so-called Sinkan divergence barrier center. So you, instead of minimizing G lambda, you subtract another term of self-transport in the objective, which tends to uh, debias the, uh, so the this object, but it does not uh, really makes it more tractable uh, in high dimension. So what can we do? We have a, a suggestion. I don't know if it's natural. So here we have one regularization, we have another, and they have a somehow opposite effect. One collapses the virus center, the other one blurs it. So why not having two at the same time with this uh, precise factor lambda over two? So here lambda over two means uh, my slides are not consistent that in the definition of uh, T lambda, here uh, you should forget about the two, this is lambda, sorry. So if I put lambda in the definition here, I should put lambda over two. So what I want to tell you in today is that this object, it will be debiased. So good approximation and, uh, of the uh, true bassertian barry center, uh, much better than these two ones, for instance. And also that is tractable uh, in high dimension on uh, the statistical and on the optimization side. So somehow by having both regularization, instead of cheating and having an object which is even further away from what we cared about, which is the unregularized object, they will compensate each other and still offer all the benefits of having regularization. All right, so that's uh, the object we want to study. It is defined here. So here I recall the definition. This is the same as in the previous slide. Uh, we have G lambda, which is this uh, Barry center functional, plus lambda over two times the entropy. This is the regularization. And that's what we want to minimize over mu. Mu is our variable. So I will call F this objective function. Uh, there are some easy properties that we can already derive that it has a unique minimizer. Uh, it has a smooth density. So these are uh, nice properties which are uh, not uh, obvious and typically do not hold when I have only one uh, regularization. Uh, so mu star has a smooth density, whatever the new case. So if, even if the new case the not, uh, of which I want to compute the barycenter or direct or discrete measures, I will have a smooth positive density. Yes? So with the way you just formulated this problem, the lambdas match here, right? One has to have a two and here one has to have one. No, yeah. So that's a good question. Uh, there was a typo in my first slide. So it is to be half. It, yeah, it is to be half. You, you have an entropy uh, in, the, in the entropic optimal transport problem, which is lambda, so not two lambda, just lambda, and then you take half. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, the easy question would be, in the first one, when you put the lambda and the entropy, what you're making is this T now becomes Lipschitz in the, the one norm or something like this, no? Uh, so the T distance as a function of mu is one Lipschitz. Or it's, it's some Lipschitz. Yeah, it has some regularity in various metrics, so depending on the metric. And then with the entropy term here, you're also making this problem strongly convex in the one norm. Yeah. Okay, so this is now a problem that is Lipschitz gradient in one norm and strongly convex in one norm. So you have a unique yeah. solution. Yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly. Yeah. So here, yeah, indeed. Uh, the problem G lambda of mu is not uh, strongly convex, uh, it's, it's sorry, it's just convex. And with that, we have uh, lambda over two. Smooth. This one is smooth. So there are various ways to define how it's smooth. For the one norm, it is smooth. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have recent results where we show it's also smooth for the Weisserstein distance. So you have, if you move mu 
for, again, in uh, optimal transport sense, like for the Wasserstein Wasser two metric, you have a Lipschitz continuity of this uh, object as well. Uh, in fact, smoothness, like you have uh, second order of regularity. So this, is, this T lambda is very regular. T lambda here is very regular. And we had a non-regular term because here this is not continuous, at least for the Wasserstein metric, but it makes the problem strongly convex. And yes, that's why we have uniqueness. Maybe one comment for specialists is that when you regularize with respect to the Lebesgue measure in the, the transport plan, what you get is lambda h of mu. I mean, it's equivalent to having the same problem, but instead of lambda over two, this would be lambda. You somehow you over regularize when you you take the uh, Lebesgue measure as a ref, uh, reference in the definition of entropy copy entropy. And you, you propose this to solve this combination once. Yeah. I don't have a comment later. <laughs> once? What do you mean by once? So you just solve this formulation. Uh, that's that's the variational problem that defines my object of interest, which I will call. Yeah. Then uh, for in practice, uh, maybe we can discuss. Uh, uh, but yes, we, we solve it once, it defines my object. Yeah. And by the way, how do we solve it? So there are various algorithms we can think of. Uh, one which I want to talk about uh, today, sorry. This is this following a noisy particle gradient descent, which is very simple to define. You just take uh, M particles in your space. Uh, you define mu x, the uh, point cloud, so the empirical distribution corresponding to these M particles that you initialize randomly according to some distribution. And you will just run gradient descent on G lambda of mu x. So here, that's where it's very important to have a smooth uh, G lambda, but you also will add noise, which will account for this entropy. And that's something I will talk about in the uh, third part of this talk. Oh, sorry, the, it's, yeah. it's a minimizer problem. Uh, is the uh, regardless of lambda? Or sorry? Uh, is, sorry, is the minimizer unique regardless, regardless, ah. regardless of lambda? Yeah, when lambda is uh, strictly larger than zero, the minimizer is unique. Otherwise, if lambda equals zero, uh, it's not always the case. It's not the same for different lambda. It changes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the, the minimizer depends on lambda. Yeah. So we'll talk uh, about three aspects depending on time. But I have a very good timer here. Ah, six minutes left. So I will talk maybe about two aspects approximation, estimation, and optimization. So the two first parts are only one slide long. So maybe hopefully I can go through them. But first, I want to convince you about why this lambda over two is the good uh, factor in front of the uh, second regularization, the outer regularization. And to understand that, we can look at this uh, theorem, which gives a small lambda uh, asymptotic expansion of the cost T lambda. So I take the square distance cost, which is uh, the, the most natural one, I would say, when we do optimal transport. And I assume that you and you have smooth density. Then this entropic optimal transport cost admits the following uh, Taylor uh, the, uh, expansion, which is uh, the unregularized optimal transport minus lambda over two times the entropy, okay, plus lambda square times the second order term, which uh, is related to the regularity of my marginal, the Fisher information. Uh, it does not matter uh, for this talk what is the specific uh, expression here, but you should know that if mu and mu are smooth, this is finite, and so I have uh, this as a second order term. So here you see that it's very natural that if I add lambda over two uh, times the differential entropy H, I do not care about that of mu because I'm only optimizing over mu in my uh, bicenter formulation. I really cancel, cancel the first order approximation error, and immediately uh, the approximation error will drop uh, to lambda square. So that's this expansion that can uh, justify the important role of this lambda over two. So in particular, if I make the uh, smoothness assumptions, which uh, uh, allow essentially to have this uh, finite out mu mu, we will have that my um, regularized very center with this double re regularizations, will have a suboptimality gap in the Wasserstein very center objective of order lambda square instead of lambda uh, for all the other kinds of so I win one order of approximation, and you can, uh, in some setting, translate the suboptimality into actual uh, approximation uh, bounds 
from the true barrier centers. So here we're not enter into these details. There are many settings where from this kind of suboptimality, we can derive a good, uh, like precise approximation bounds uh, of the true barrier center. So that's for the approximation part. And what are the hidden constants there? So the hidden constant it depends on lambda. <laughs> I can tell you it's uh, d lambda divided by two times logarithm of two pi uh, lambda. So it's, it depends on lambda, but not on the marginal. And it's really a constant that is not changed. Uh, what about in the corollary? So it, it's also an order of something. Yeah, here, this uh, constant hidden is depends on this uh, Fisher information part. Uh, yeah, I can, we could define what it is. It depends on the regularity of the, the barrier center and of the marginals. Now let us discuss a little bit about uh, estimation. Let's assume we have random independent samples from our marginals nu, one, et cetera, until nu k. And you can think of them as smooth densities of which we only have uh, uh, statistical uh, samples. Uh, I mean, we only have access to samples from these densities. And we would like to estimate our barrier center still from this un, uh, incomplete information. So for that, we can just simply define new hat lambda, the barrier center of the empirical distribution, okay? So I take my point cloud, I compute the barrier center. It will still be a smooth density because uh, as I mentioned previously, the barrier center is always a smooth density. And here we have the following estimation uh, upper bound. So the, relative entropy or the cubic headboard divergence between my estimated measure using this empirical distribution and the true one, it has some dependency in lambda, which degrades as lambda goes small, that's uh, expected. But also in terms of the number of samples that I've seen, it decreases at one over square root n rate. And this is independent of the dimension. The rate is always one over square root n, uh, which is interesting when we want to scale to higher dimension of this object. Okay, so here I will skip the proof so that I can at least give a few words to the optimization part. Uh, let me talk about the optimization aspect. So first, uh, what is uh, done usually to compute Wasserstein barrier center? So if I have a small scale problem, for instance, if I have only a few samples and a few marginals, so K and N are small, then I can use a so-called multi-marginal formulation, but it will scale as N to the K. So it's exponential in the number of uh, samples, so it is we usually do not scale uh, at all in machine learning applications. When you're, you're in small dimension, you can always grid the space and look for the barrier center on your gridded space. But this again will scale exponentially bad in the dimension. But for large scale problem, when all these quantities are large, there is so far uh, uh, no solution. In fact, we know it's NP hard uh, to actually compute barrier centers. And so far, what we know is some heuristics or uh, uh, fixed point techniques with no uh, convergence guarantees in general. So here I will uh, talk uh, briefly about what we can say about the algorithm I've mentioned. Uh, but since I'm a bit running out of time, what I will do is show you how it behaves uh, in practice. So let me show you this example where I have three marginals in blue, green, and orange, new one, new two, new three. And in black, this will be uh, my point cloud that evolves through this optimization algorithm. So here I just run gradient descent on G lambda, and we see this collapsing effect because I'm actually optimizing G lambda. Here, in addition of no, having no uh, theoretical guarantee, uh, I also have this uh, stronger bias. I converge to an object which is very different from here. What we would like to obtain is something like that, which is how the true Wasserstein barrier center will look like with two uh, uh, dark uh, clouds. Well, when I run this noisy uh, gradient descent, uh, thanks to this noise, I converge to uh, a much better barrier center. And I'm also able to escape, escape stationary points. So since I run out of time, I will skip this example. We'll just show you briefly uh, the theoretical guarantee that we uh, can have. So this is, in fact, a result that applies more generally to larger class of problems, which has been proved also independently by Nikanda, uh, Wu, and Suzuki. Uh, uh, a certain uh, general uh, uh, group guarantee for um, uh, mean field Langevin algorithms, which tells us that at least when I have an infinite number of particles, 
these dynamics will converge exponentially to uh, the global minimizer. So since I'm, I run out of time, I will uh, stop here and take a few questions. If I did not misunderstand, I think you can convert your fancy from lambda to lambda to Cartesian and give us a sign distance. Um, I think what you're doing for the approximation part. Yeah, I think if you if you allow yourself to iterate, because what you're doing is actually proximal point method. So if you go to your problem, yeah. So this problem is the proximal point applied to your smoothed objective with a center point of equal mm -hmm. distribution. So you start with an equal uh, samples mm -hmm. and you refine it with your methodology, right? So you iterate on. You until, can see, okay, which was saying so that I start from uh, like the Begrue measure as a reference. Yeah, uniform, let's say. Yeah, right? uniform, and then I uh, I replace my reference measure by the by, by the the measure that you fix. Yeah. By iterating this, you should be able to go from lambda towards lambda squared. I think for your guarantee on the the Wasserstein. Stein. Yeah. So the issue is that uh, when you do this. Uh, you obtain uh, another problem with a smaller regularization parameter to solve each time. Okay. And the guarantees degrade very rapidly when lambda gets too big. Okay. I mean, so it's, it's important to have good guarantees for non asymptotically small lambda. And this proximal uh, step, uh, I mean, this, this interpretation, it, it still leads to issues that you have. But you're not going to change lambda. your lambda. Your lambda f is fixed. Uh, I, I see, uh, but. Anyway, so I, I think I already we can, went through this uh, line of reasoning. I think we can, we, can discuss, yeah, we can discuss. But I think it doesn't solve the, the issues of sort of small lambda. Yeah. But we can uh, discuss. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I, I didn't get the basics. Would uh, you go back to the experiment slide? Uh, yeah. If lambda is zero, do you obtain a single point? No. So when lambda equals zero, I should obtain something like that. Of course, here yeah, I cheated a bit because I solved it with non zero lambda, but I, I, I used a very small lambda. And uh, this is the uh, true Wasserstein barycenter, I would say, uh, in this setting. It looks like that. It's not a point. It's the proper notion of average, I would say, for this uh, definition mm. of the, this three uh, priority measures. Notice that here, bl the blue measure is bimodal. So that's why the barycenter is bimodal. I see. But can you somehow extend this kind of idea to like a higher order moment? Not the, uh, the barycenter is more like a mean, right? <laughs> Ah, uh, Barry Center is like a mean. Okay. Can you uh, like extend it to like, estimating the variance? Or? That's a, a good point. So uh, you can do statistics in rest of time space. Mm -hmm. I, uh, so here I will talk about the unregularized case mm -hmm. because uh, we did, I did not study yeah. at all the regularized part. But there is all this notion of doing statistics in rest of time space. Usually you choose one template measure as a reference. You compute all the optimal transport plans between your template and your uh, data set. Mm -hmm. And this gives you like kind of L2 coordinates. Mm -hmm. And then you can do all the statistics you want. So uh, averages, variances. Uh, so that's possible, yes. But uh, uh, Maybe computationally, computationally it might be, yeah. that's not something I uh, mm -hmm. thought about. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm not sure. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if you said it, but uh, when you do noisy gradient descent, does the noise depend on lambda? Yes, so uh, when I do noisy gradient descent, the noise has to be exactly, so I skip this part, but here, this is the equation. This is Langevin, I mean, a mean, uh, a nonlinear generalization of Langevin, and the noise is uh, square root lambda. That's what, it, yeah, it, it needs to match the regularization I have uh, in the entropy coefficient transport for that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So um, I'm interested in the, the rate of convergence with the sample site. So you have a one was squared and convergence rate. It, it is uh, about the convergence to the two with the regularized objective. Uh, okay, use the lambda. So if you consider about the, the bias induced by lambda, so then I guess there appears some, something like a lambda square additionally. Oh, no, yeah. So mm -hmm. that's a good question. The question is can we actually close the the story and actually estimate the social barrier centers using these tools. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue, no, it's here, is that here the dependency in lambda is exponential in the dimension. So when you want to make lambda small, 
-hmm. you'll quickly run into issues. And if you try to find the sweet spot, what is the best lambda as a function of n, mm -hmm. in fact, you recover the curse of dimensionality. You typically get rates which are the order n to the minus two over d, which is exactly what we have. Uh, we have naive estimator of the dimension by center. So it's, it does not fully uh, solve the problem. It's just we have a different object. Um, mm -hmm. Which looks a bit like the Vassar Chinese uh, Barry Center, but we should not really think of it as a way to estimate Vassar Chinese Barry Center because it does not improve mm -hmm. over the naive estimator. It's as good as it. So, okay, so the naive estimator becomes something like an optimal rate in a non parametric uh, statistics, like N2 minus some. Ah, we can rate. do better, yes. Yeah, so we can do better, but with. Uh, or so I, can, I'm not sure about the uh, Barry Center, but at least for estimating transport maps or. Uh, transport cost, we can do better, but with uh, estimators which are not computationally efficient. Uh -huh. So that's a good point here. Uh, yeah. For computationally efficient estimators, we do not know how to make better than n to the minus two over d. Okay. In yes. general, for all Wasserstein related uh, objects. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Nitanda, so thank you for bringing, bringing up our result. <laughs> so. <laughs> Seems to me that I, I <laughs> Said the names correctly, but I don't know. There was uh, yeah, correct. Yes, yeah, thank okay. you so much. <laughs> and so I simply want to know the details. So, how do you calculate the gradient of the objective? So, which involves the computation of entropic uh, optimal transport? So, yeah, yeah. So, here uh, at each step of the algorithm, I have to compute the gradient. Um, and the gradient of this objective this requires to solve entropy regularized optimal transport at each step. So you need you you take uh, in practice what I did is just a few simple iterations of this uh, uh -huh. algorithm. Since I can use the warm start because I'm only moving my particles a little bit at each step. Uh, in practice, this is like a, a few matrix vector multiplication that can compute it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, that, that there is a subgroup. Uh, I, yeah, thank you very much. All right, let's thank the speaker. Okay, so our next speaker is Kwan Ming. Um, so we're going to continue our transport plan uh, yes. talks. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this uh, wonderful event, especially for the e EBF on team. So merci beaucoup. Uh, so the title of my talk is Geometry of Gaussian Measures and Gaussian Processes via Information Geometry and Optimal Transport. So I would like to talk, I would talk about both kind of the uh, information geometric aspects and then the optimal transport um, aspects. So the talk will be uh, will be very concrete because I will focus on the on the uh, on the Gaussian setting, so it's a lot more concrete than, than the abstract setting, the highly abstract setting that uh, uh, Lina Ek was talking about just now. So thank you for actually for <laughs> introducing all the optimal transport um, notations and formulations. So it, uh, I wouldn't have not have to talk too much about it. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't uh, basically. So the the research team that we have uh, been focusing on is on the machine learning and statistical methodologies using functional analysis. Uh, and geometrical methods, so we use you know, Hilbert space and Banach space theories, and in particular the uh, theory of the methodology of reproducing Cronian Hilbert spaces, so RKHS. And we use like matrix and operator theory and Riemannian geometry, information geometry, and optimal transport, etc. So the uh, so as I said, I will be focusing on a very uh, concrete setting. So we I would like to generalize the following geometrical structures for Gaussian measures in RN to the infinite dimensional setting of Gaussian measures on Hilbert space and Gaussian processes, because we have, uh, for Gaussian processes, we have underlying infinite dimensional Gaussian measures. So we have, the, so there are a lot of uh, geometric structures uh, for these objects. Uh, we have Riemannian metrics and distances. We have optimal transport distances. We have the divergences and people are also studying kind of the connections and unifying formulations. So that's a, that's a very rich literature on these uh, on this, uh, the, the, on this, um, objects. So uh, the kind of the mathematical theories and techniques we're using are operator theory, especially positive definite operators, and Riemannian geometry uh, and, and Gaussian measures in the infinite dimensional setting. Now, so of course we are just focusing. I'm talking some big words here, but we are focusing on the on the very specific case of the Gaussian measures. So the motivations for studying these uh, from uh, this, uh, for the geometric structures of Gaussian measures and and SPD or symmetric positive definite matrices, they have not just like they play a, a central role, of course, in probability in statistics, in machine learning, but they also have a lot of uh, practical applications. So there are numerous ap applications in, in brain imaging, in, in computer vision, in radio signal processing, in brain computer interfaces where they uh, where they use uh, these uh, objects as a, a form of data representation. So we have uh, one of our um, 
uh, speakers are uh, Tomek. We were talking about a kind of this uh, red commit interface. I think. So okay, so so one of the uh, this object is to, uh, is from information geometry, it's the Fisher metric. So and the corresponding uh, something called the phi invariant Riemannian metric uh, for the uh, the set of SPD matrices of uh, size n by n. So this is a uh, uh, it has been studied extensively. So let's consider the setup uh, like, uh, uh, for this uh, in this talk. I will just focus on the zero mean zero mean Gaussian um, measures. So for the setup uh, zero mean Gaussian densities on Rn, uh, it's, uh, they are char completely characterized by their covariance uh, by their covariance uh, matrix. And so um, I think this one can be used for pointing, right? Yeah. So it's a completely char characterized by their covariance matrix sigma here. And uh, so because of the symmetry, if we have we have like n and n times the uh, if we have n by n matrix and we have, uh, we can represent it by n times n plus one over two uh, kind of parameters. And so we have, uh, so this, we can consider this set as kind of a smooth, a smooth manifold. And we, on, on it, we can define something called the Fisher information matrix. So it's given by this formula here. This is a classical uh, a central object in, in, in statistics. And it was introduced by Fisher a long time ago, like a hundred years ago. And this by, uh, has, a lot of important roles in statistics. And it was Rao in the 1940s, actually, kind of first one to consider as a Riemannian metric on the setup of Gaussian density with zero mean. So uh, just to say that, so Fisher introduced this like 100 years ago, and Rao introduced this in like in the 1940s. And just a, a small note, but kind of for any curiosity, is, uh, Rao is, is still alive, believe it or not, 102 years old. Oh. And I think he's still doing research. He's still active, actually. I've been two years old. He's now he's now in the U.S. So, uh, so this uh, Fisher metric is a central element in information geometry and started by Amari. And so for the for the in the, in the Gaussian setting, uh, we can compute it explicitly. This is a very nice thing about the Gaussian setting because we can compute many things explicitly. And so in this in that setting, we can compute this uh, the Fisher uh, information matrix explicitly. And this is just a differentiating with respect to the uh, parameter theta i. And since we have the correspondence uh, of the, uh, the Gaussian densities and the, uh, the covariance matrix, so we have the corresponding kind of, yeah, something called the affine invariant Riemannian metric on the set of SPD matrix with such n by n. And so the Riemannian metric is given by this formula here. And it's called a fine invariant because when we transform A, for example, by like C times A times C transpose, and the same for B and sigma, then everything will remain the same. And so this object has been studied a lot. Uh, uh, I can trace this as, by, as, as uh, far as uh, also like um, as far as in, back in the 1940s. Actually. So under this uh, under this metric, under this metric, we have a, a, a many manifold, and we have a unique geodesic joining any two matrices in B, given by this formula here. So it's the explicit formula, and the Riemannian system also has a closed form formula. So it has a lot of uh, structures that can be computed explicitly and correspond to the Fischer distance between the zero mean Gaussian density. So Gaussian densities on, on Rn. And a simple form is something called the, uh, the local Euclidean matrix. So here we have, um, uh, it's so the, the local Euclidean matrix will become motivated by the, the setting of uh, a brain uh, ten division tensor in matching, in, in brain matching. It's simple to compute on the previous metric. So this one, the, the, the geodesic has a simple form and it has the, the uh, Riemannian distance also has a simple form. And it's faster to compute on the previous distance and under this metric, this uh, manifold is actually flat. So uh, we can use it to define positive definite kernel, such as the Gaussian kernel. So this is a valid positive definite kernel. It's not the case with the previous distance because it can be shown that if the manifold is not flat, the, uh, the previous uh, manifold is a Gatan Hadama manifold, so it has negative curvature. And it can be shown that uh, if we define the Gaussian kernel with the, uh, with the, with the distance, that, that uh, remaining distance, then it's not always positive definite for every uh, band width of the, of the kernel. So this one uh, is always, we can always define the, the Gaussian kernel. So this, these two have been applied quite a lot. And um, so those are kind of like the two Riemannian structures. And this one is, uh, we also have something more um, you know, like the, the divergences. So this one is called the log determinant divergences. So the alpha log determinant divergences is parameterized by a parameter alpha here. So these in general, they do not correspond to uh, a metric distance because they're not symmetric. It's a symmetric if, if only if anti is equal to zero, then anti equal to one, and lim, uh, negative one, we have the limiting cases. And this corresponds to the Rodin and Kubek lambda divergences between zero mean Gaussian densities on Rn. And so this have also been used a, a lot. So, for example, in the case of the, of the KM divergence, or uh, uh, also like the, the, the um, 
relative entropy, I don't know the word for it, relative entropy. We have, uh, it corresponds with the case when alpha is equal to one. And in general, we have uh, the Rene divergence system, we have correspond to uh, the log when alpha is equal to like one minus one here. So, so these are the, some of the things that have been studied a lot in the finite dimensional setting. And now we have the optimal transport. Uh, let's consider the optimal transport distances. So, uh, so very briefly, because uh, uh, Lenaric was talking about just now, so I'm going to consider the optimization of the Congress, uh, the optimal transport uh, between two popular dimensions using only one on a set X, let's say X equal to Rn with a cost function C. I would just consider C equal to the square cost. And so we optimize this uh, expected value with the cost function C X, Y, where that max is joint probability distribution using only one. And uh, so in the case of the uh, finite moment, uh, probability measures uh, finite moment out of, out of B, then we, can, we have something called the field plus assigned distance, which is equal to one over the root of this uh, quantity here and defines the metric on, the, on this set. And so it's a, it's a very, it has been studied, of course, extensively. And so, as I said, I would just focus on the Gaussian setting. So in the, in the um, Gaussian setting, two, two Gaussian uh, distribution with uh, the square cost function, then it has the Gaussian formula. And uh, it has been worked out by various authors before in, in various, uh, like in the 1980s. And it has, a, so it has a nice Gaussian formula. In the case when the mean is equal to zero, we also have this formula from the Boris versus Stein distance. And this distance uh, is used in, in, quantum information, uh, in quantum information theory for characterizing the kind of the similarity between quantum states. And so the nice thing about this distance is that it's always well defined when it's C0 and C1 uh, are singular. Because for the previous like distance and divergence, we have to compute the inverse and the log and so on. So everything has to be strictly positive, definite. Uh, it's not the case with this one. So the, the Wasserstein distance is always, uh, it's always well defined when it's about C0 and C1 is equal to zero, for example, it's still well defined. So well, that is what one very nice property of the Wasserstein distance, always well defined. And another very nice property is that now if we move to the, infinite, the setting of infinite dimensional Gaussian measures of the inverse space, with the formula remains the same, which is not the case with the previous distance and divergence. They only well defined in very specific settings. Whereas uh, this is still, they always well defined. And so there have been some recent work on applying these regression processes uh, recently. And uh, so it's valid in the case when, when C0 and C1 are similar as well. One thing that is, uh, one, 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 one thing that is not too good is actually it's not special differentiable because we have the square root here. So we, when we when we differentiate, for example, like informally, we take a square, we take uh, we divide by the square root, so then it's not differentiable. It's kind of unbounded. Um, so then I would come back to this a little bit later on. So let's move to the entropic regularization. So uh, uh, and you was also talking about this. So uh, as you know, as we, we have just heard, you know, the exact optimal transport distance is actually not just like analytically computationally uh, demanding, but uh, like analytically difficult, but also computationally generally demanding and can have very bad sample complexity as well. So it can be, the worst case can be exponentially bad. And so for the entropic regular, uh, regularization, we, you know, we add this also, uh, Lindek was using kind of the, the, the relative entropy uh, kind of uh, notation of this, uh, this scale divergence of the same thing between uh, gamma and the product measure mu and nu. And so this, um, allows a much faster, uh, like there are algorithms to, to solve it faster. And of course, it's still, by, do, by adding this regularization, regularization term, we have a bias. Uh, so this one is not equal to zero between mu and mu is not equal to zero. So there's a, a, no, a notion of debiasing, so it comes to think on divergence. So we, we subtract at these two terms here. So it becomes like a valid, a valid uh, divergence. So a lot has, there's, there has been a lot of work on, 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 on studying this. Um, um, entropic regularization is being called divergence. So let's uh, consider the case of the Gaussian setting, let's say, uh, let's say on Rn. So here, so the, the, the formula has been, formulation has been worked out a couple of years ago. So we can, we can represent this quantity as mutual information by the uh, differential entropy. And this is the differential entropy here. And so we have this property called the maximum entropy of Gaussian density. So we make this mean zero and covariance uh, matrix C. Then the differential entropy is maximum if we make this Gaussian. So if you use zero and we run about Gaussian, and we want to minimize this whole thing, and the minimizer has to be Gaussian, the gamma has to be Gaussian. So if we use that, the maximum, so the key here is the maximum entropy of Gaussian densities. Uh, so the minimizer here has to be Gaussian, the gamma here has to be Gaussian, and it has to have this form here, where C here is a cross covariance matrix, and we have to, basically we have to optimize uh, over C. 
and so we can prepare, we can have this fairly round diversion field. The mutual information is given in this explicit form, so we can just plug this in and, and optimize, and we can obtain, a, and we obtain a like explicit, uh, this is the uh, formula. So this is for the old, the OT epsilon, and this is for the synchron diversion, but we subject like a kind of the bias. Um, so this is the final dimensional setting. Now, uh, so we can generalize this to the infinite dimension of setting, but we have to be careful because the entropy here, and this is the formula for the entropy. Now, this is not well defined in the infinite dimension of setting because we have the, the in this case, we have the, uh, if we have a covariance supported C, it has infinity many eigenvalue um, that goes to zero, it always goes to zero. And so this is, this is not well defined. However, and then, you know, if we look at the, the, the joint measures of gamma, for example, uh, uh, two measures, uh, uh, U0 and U1, then this is the formula in the final dimension of setting. This for on the, the right hand side here is not well defined, but the left hand side is well defined. This mutual information is, is well defined. It can be infinite, but it's well defined. Uh, so the correct generalization of the of the maximum entropy property of Gaussian density from R to the infinite dimension of setting is not the maximum entropy, it's the, the minimum mutual information. So the Draman gamma is the two measures, two measures of two Gaussian uh, measures, U0, Ux and Uy, with the same covariance support the gamma, then uh, this quantity here is minimum if and only if the gamma is equal to gamma zero. It's only a Gaussian, and it's given by this uh, uh, form here. It's just an explicit formula. Well, this one here is called the uh, Fred Home determinant, so it's kind of the identity minus the just class operator. So this V here is kind of linked, it links the, the um, covariance operator of the product measure of X and Y with, with uh, the covariance operator gamma. So we can plug this formula in. So it, it means that the minimum of this expression in the infinite dimension, in infinite dimension of setting has also be a Gaussian. And so we can plug the formula in for the KL divergence and we can, uh, we can solve for this as well. Now this is an infinite dimension optimization problem that can also be solved. And it's, um, it has the closed form formula so we can obtain the closed form formula. Another way for, Another way the, uh, to solve it is that we can solve it via uh, the Schrodinger system. Uh, so we call the Schrodinger system, but we can solve for the uh, predominant Hebrew density of, of gamma with respect to U0 and, and U1, so we can obtain a closed form formula. So this is a closed form formula. It's actually, mm, it's actually the same as the final dimension of setting. We have to be very careful here because this is uh, something called the Fred Hope determinant. So it has to have this form, like identity plus a trace class operator to, to, to do this form, but, but it's well defined. And when our epsilon goes to zero, we obtain the exact cos sine distance, and then when epsilon goes to infinity, we just have the kind of the square of the mean. And so now, so what are the properties of the uh, of the uh, synchron versus the exact the entropy regularized versus the, the exact cos sine distance? So many properties actually become very clear and very distinct in the infinite dimensional setting, and not not so clear in the finite dimensional setting, but very clear in the infinite dimensional setting. So first, first of all, they are both very well, both the exact versus time distance of the synchron divergence are always well defined and finite, including the setting for singular covariance operators. Whereas the compact library divergence and the radial divergence are only finite if, if the Gaussian measures are equivalent. So in the infinite dimensional setting, uh, in the finite dimensional setting, the two Gaussian densities are always equivalent. They have the same support because the full support of all the whole Euclidean space. For Hilbert space, this is not the case. Uh, they are either mutually uh, equivalent, so they have the same spot, or they are, or they are disjoint under very specific conditions. So these quantities are defined. The divergence, the KL divergence, for example, is the finite if you only the Gaussian measures are equivalent. So now the synchron divergence has many nice properties. So it's differentiable because we have this kind of regularization, so it's special differentiable. The versus sign distance is not differentiable in infinite dimension. So methods such as the gradient descent can be employed for the synchron divergence, but not theoretically not. Uh, we did not valid for the process time distance. Now, I, I'm not going to talk about, the, I don't have the kind of the details for the very center problem here. So when Lynette was talking a lot about the very center, I don't have the, I don't have the slides, but, I, but uh, I can say that the very center is much better behaved. The problem is much better behaved. It always has a unique search value both in a singular setting. Now for the finite, for the, for the exact process time distance for the Gaussian, and in the uh, kind of the, 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 the equation for the finite dimension of the setting, the analysis for it doesn't really extend to the infinite dimensional setting because we often we, we require that uh, we assume that it's only valid for the case when all the covariance spaces are strictly positive and in the kind of the standard proof we assume that every all of them are greater than 
the identity it multiplies by a, by a constant. Now that analysis doesn't extend to the infinite dimensional setting because we, we cannot assume that a cochlear interpreter is greater than the identity operator multiplied by a constant. That's not, um, that's not valid. Whereas, oh, what did I do? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Whereas for the synchron divergence, I think, what happened? <laughs> Did I click on something? <laughs> Is something unplugged? No, no, did I click on something else? I think you should be. Sorry. <laughs> okay, what happened? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Whereas for the uh, okay, I was just saying that for the for the for the synchron divergence, the very center always uh, has a. Um, there's always a unique solution valid in both the singular and non-singular settings. So it's um, and for the so I'm kind of talking about the convergence of the sample complexity. So it's it's very well known that the the Wasserstein distance is um it corresponds the convergence of the Wasserstein distance corresponds to the weak convergence. So in uh, if we have a sequence of Gaussian measures with covariance of phase a n and a, then they converge in the Wasserstein distance if and only if the uh, the Korean support that converges in the chest gas now. So this result has been known for, uh, for a while now, many years. Whereas uh, for the synchron divergence, uh, we have the convergence if the, um, the Korean support that converges to the Hilbert schmidt norm. Now, uh, this is, uh, at the moment, it's, a, it's a if statement, it's not if and only, but maybe it's, a, it's if and only if. So the consequence of this, so this is a chest class, this is a sum of all the eigenvalues, the absolute value of all the eigenvalues uh, to the L1 norm, and this one is an L2 norm, the sum of all the eigenvalues square. And so it's a Hilbert space norm, and then we can apply laws of large number of the Hilbert space uh, value random variables to obtain sample complexity. Now it's um, okay. So to just summarize, this is the Hilbert space norm convergence, whereas whereas for the Wasserstein distance is a trace class norm, and so we can use like the um, law of large numbers for one space value random variables to obtain almost sure convergence. I will go into this into the next few slides, a few slides, but it's harder to obtain rate of convergence in infinite dimension. Okay, so I'm probably will just talk about this setting. So now let's, uh, because I saw the formulas before, they are all kind of abstract Hilbert space formulas. So we, the operators are all abstract Hilbert space operators. So let's talk about a setting where we can actually estimate these distances and divergences you know, in a concrete setting of the Gaussian processes. So let's assume that we have D, here's a nice uh, uh, metric space. It has uh, interval from zero to one and new is a, a nice uh, measures on, on D, such as the Lebesgue measure. On, let's just say the interval from zero to one. And because of the Gaussian process would mean function MD and covariance function uh, KSD. So I will assume that the sample paths are all square integrable. So there's a one to one correspondence between uh, this Gaussian process of square integrable paths and the Gaussian measure with, on the space uh, of the Hilbert space H equal to L2D nu with, with the covariance operator given by the integral operator with the kernel uh, KSD. So this is an example, for example, this is an example here. So we have this Gaussian process here with the uh, Covariance um, function, this is the covariance function that was given by the Laplace and kernel, so it's kind of very wiggly here. And then here we have the Gaussian kernel, so the, the, the paths are a lot smoother. So this is the interval from zero to one. So they have the underlying, they have underlying Ga the Gaussian infinite dimensional Gaussian measures on the space L2, uh, D nu. So we can we can compute like the distance between uh, we can compute the distance between the, the corresponding the Gaussian measures on on L2 D nu. So that's a, a lot of work actually studying this this uh um, distance of uh, the various distances between the Gaussian measures. For uh, there's a lot of work in functional data analysis. So we have the, the body study the Kimber Schmidt distance and the work using the Wasserstein distance. And recently there's work in, in machine learning for the uh, kind of function relation neural networks where they, uh, so last year, for example, at the, the NURIS last year, they uh, were using kind of Wasserstein distance for the, uh, in, in, this con in this context. Now they were actually using gradient descent. As I said before, the Wasserstein distance is actually not differentiable in the infinite dimensional setting. So theoretically, this is not rigorous. We use the Wasserstein distance. Of course, in practice, we use finite dimensional approximation so we can still get some results. But, but theoretically, it's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not consistent. So now, Let's, uh, so, uh, so now we, want, we would like to be able to compute this uh, distance in, the, in the L2 using finite dimensional formula in, in RM. So if we have really sample like M points, sorry, I take one small M in, in D, and we have like, um, we have a vector of size M, which is different, which is, uh, um, 
shifted the coding to the finite dimensional Gaussian with the kernel with the coherence matrix given by the kernel matrix k x, and so we would uh, we can show that under a certain assumption we can estimate the infinite dimensional formula using the finite dimensional formula, and we can see the difference between the uh, synchron divergence and the Bezos line distance. So okay, I wouldn't skip this few slides because it's rather complicated, but I just want to say that this analysis actually uses RKHS uh, because we have two Gaussian processes. Each one has a kernel function, so they we have the corresponding kind of RKHS operators uh, corresponding to them. Uh, I just want to, start to say that, so this is the result here. If we sample like this SA here, is sample uh, independently from PNU, then we can estimate uh, the synchron divergence by the, uh, in L2, by the synchron divergence in RAM here, and we have um, a, a dimension independent, independent uh, sample complexity to depend on the number of sample points, and this is the bound of the kernel. And so the analysis, as I said, the analysis depends, uses a lot of RKHS covariance and cross covariance operators. Because this uh, operator CK here, they are not RKHS operators because they map from L2 to L2. Now there's no, uh, so this is, the, this is actually very nice. And this is because we use this, uh, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm convergence of the synchron divergence. It's not the case with the versus time distance. Now, as I said before, the versus time distance convergence is a first class norm because it's a finite space norm. So at least for the moment, my, I have to assume that at least one of the RKHS is finite dimensional. So assume that if, for example, HK2 is finite dimensional, then we have also, we have like this kind of sample complexity here, but it depends on the dimension of, uh, of HK2 because, uh, because of this uh, finite space uh, convert, uh, the just class conversions. I'm not quite sure whether this can be improved. Uh, at the moment, it's not clear to me whether it can be done. So uh, maybe someone can help me. Maybe Lynette can help me. <laughs> But anyway, so this is the this is the difference between the um, the second difference between the uh, the the entropic uh, regularized synchron divergence and uh, the exact versus time distance. So now the first difference is such as I said, the versus time distance is not differentiable in the infinite dimensional setting. The synchron divergence is differentiable. The second one is this uh, convergence. One is uh, the versus time distance convergence in the chess class norm. The synchron divergence convergence in the Hilbert norm. And so we have. Uh, for the synchron divergence, we have dimension independent sample complexity, whereas for the versus time distance, we have this, uh, at, at least for the moment, it's, it's still not yet dimension independent. So, okay, we can also, so we can, so before we assume that KX is, um, is known, so we, we can actually, we can, we can assume that we can also estimate it from finite samples as well, but basically I will skip this because it's not so important, just technical. And we can have like a kind of a, a similar estimate based on the number of sample voice T on the interval from zero to one and also the number of sample paths as well. But this is, this is not just a technical part. So I'm gonna illustrate it with, uh, okay, so here we have a Gaussian process here with very similar kind of uh, kernel functions, which is a is equal to one and a is equal to one point two, so very similar. So this is the, I just consider the uh, t from zero to one to power d with d is equal to one and d equal to five and d equal to 50. So the estimation is using, um, and like sample paths for each process, so n from one to a thousand. So here we have the Hilbert Schmidt distance. Here we have the uh, synchron divergence uh, with epsilon equal to zero one, and here we have the versus time distance. So the behavior of the, of the synchron divergence and Hilbert Schmidt distance is quite similar across the different uh, dimension d here, where where it's the versus time distance is it's different because it's kind of slower when d becomes large. So uh, anyway. So I'm not, okay, so I don't think I have time because I'm running out of time. Maybe I just mentioned it very briefly. So that was the optimal transport with the, uh, is the exact uh, buzzer sign distance and the synchron divergence. I said that many things can be computed explicitly and analyzed explicitly. So for the, for the information geometric uh, uh, quantities, we have like the virtual distance and the, the log net divergences as well. So these are not directly generalizable to the infinite dimensional setting because these are kind of the inverse, for example, these only work if I in very special settings. Nevertheless, we can, by doing regularization, we can actually generalize this to the uh, highly, um, to the infinite dimensional setting of the space, where we can do a form of regularization. So here we, instead of uh, just computing the di diversion of the determinant of A, we compute the, the, the divergence between A plus gamma I, uh, for A, B, B in chess class, for example. And then here, this form of the ex uh, extended uh, formula of the fret determinant, where we just we have gamma instead of gamma equal to one, we have kind of, we can have a gamma be greater than zero for any gamma. Just to say that we're doing regularization, it's a form of regularization. And then 
we can use this and we can recover the Kayan divergence as well between two uh, Gaussian equivalent Gaussian methods on the Hamburg space. So when gamma goes to zero, we obtain the Kayan divergence between uh, two Gaussian measures, equivalent Gaussian measures on the Hamburg space. And it has a, a, um, a Gaussian formula. So there are, uh, so we can actually generalize all of these to the distances and divergence we'll talk about just now to the infinite dimension as thing by a regularization. And, um, and we can recover the exact quantities in the setting when the Gaussian measures are equivalent. Okay, and we can also obtain, we can also define like the regularized Kayan divergence and we can obtain sub complexity as well. Anyway, so, and, and the setting we can, we can also have like a very high general setting of the alpha beta log net divergences of the Himmel Schmidt, was with definite Himmel Schmidt operator. So we have A plus gamma I where A is Himmel Schmidt operator and gamma is greater than zero. So then we can, so this encompasses both the, the alpha log net divergence and then we apply in that one. So this setting is actually more general than the Gaussian setting because uh, because for the uh, for the Gaussian setting the covariance operator is a chess class operator, whereas here we can uh, we can have like the Hilbert Schmidt like positive Hilbert Schmidt operator. So it's, it's it's more general than the than the Gaussian setting. Okay, so uh, just okay, I think I'm <laughs> running out of time a little bit. Just to, just to to to, uh, to give you an example here, this like this is the kind of the uh, regularized Kayan divergence, and then you can get the ring the ring divergence with, with different uh, order. This is between these two Gaussian processes, and this is the, where the Gaussian processes are a lot closer to each other, then the quantities are a lot smaller. So we have kind of the convergence here. So to summarize, so we can we can generalize the, the many distances and divergences and geometric structures between Gaussian densities from our end to the Hilbert space setting. So one key technique here is regularization. So for the in the entropic setting, we have entropic in the uh, I'm sorry in the optimal transport setting, we have entropic regularization and the list of many nice properties. Uh, uh, of the of the uh, compared to the exact distance, and in the others, for for example, we have a Kimber Schmidt uh, norm convergence and lesser dimension independent sample complexities, and for the for other uh, quantities from um, information geometry quantities, we have we also use the regular regularization, and we also obtain many nice properties as well. So there are a lot of a lot more theoretical results can be obtained, and we. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to look at how the numerical particular move regression processes, and of course we have to move beyond the Gaussian process setting. So thank you very much for listening, and I have uh, uh, some references here. So um, thank you very much for listening. So thank you for a great talk. Um, so is uh. So unregularized, uh, sorry, unregularized optimal optimal transport. Yes. Uh, still NP hard for Gaussian cases. No, for Gaussian setting, we can obtain uh, Gaussian formula. Uh, um, okay. So there's no, there's no numerical work here actually because we in the Gaussian setting we we are everything is everything is analytical here. Even in finite dimension. Yeah, because we we don't we don't we are not we don't have to do any any um. Optimize like numerical optimization here. We don't have to do any computation of optimization here actually because everything here is um, everything here is uh, analytical. Mm. Well, except for the very central problems because the very central problem you will, it wouldn't have to be computed numerically, but otherwise uh, all the, the distances and all the structures are actually we can compute many things explicitly. So that's a good thing about it actually. Thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. So, uh, when uh, the sinc divergence regularization parameter yeah. goes to zero, we go to Wasserstein distance. But when it goes to plus infinity, uh, so we know in general we converge to some uh, maximum mean discrepancy. What happens for um, Gaussians? Do we recover some standard uh, so notion just, uh, of distances? Just, a mean, just a, the, the difference between the, 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 the means actually the square. Ah, because you have the square distance yeah, cost, yeah. so just it degenerates. A, Thank you very much. We're continuing full force. Uh, so currently, Jing Fang is going to tell us a little bit more about some of the research that is uh, going on on robustness side. Um, please get in the floor. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here to present my work on uh, application of adversarial <laughs> robustness. Um, I'm in uh, in perfect information learning team. Uh, with Professor Sugiyama. Um, let's talk about 
uh, I'm going to cover two aspects. Uh, one is background knowledge of adversarial attacks and training. And also uh, I want to cover two case studies on how to apply the adversarial robustness. Let's go to the point one. Uh, we know that adversarial attack can evaluate the vulnerability of machine learning models because machine learning models are sensitive to the input perturbations. For example, with the only small noise, the image of pig will be wrongly recognized as the airliner. How to construct the adversarial data? We basically solve a constraint optimization problem. Given a machine learning model and its loss function, we output the adversarial data, maximizing the loss within the non ball constraint. The non ball constraints the same semantic meaning between the natural data and the adversarial data. The epsilon controls the size of the norm ball. Project grading descent PGD approximately solved the constraint optimization problem. Given a starting point, PGD calculates the gradient of this loss function with respect to the input. Gradient is a direction pointing to a place with a slightly larger loss. Now we get a new point whose loss is slightly larger than the natural data. Then we calculate the gradient again. The loss of yellow point is again larger. So on and so forth. Finally, we get a red point with the highest loss, which can make machine learning model inaccurate. Why machine learning models are so vulnerable to the adversarial attack? It is because the standard training output a model whose decision boundary is near the data. Therefore, when we slightly perturb the near decision boundary data, the model will make mistake. Even worse, due to the curse of dimensionality, almost all data are near the decision boundary. To meet the above challenge, we have a new learning style that is adversarial training. The adversarial training has two purposes. First is to correctly classify the data that is increase the natural accuracy on the natural test data, which is same as the standard training. Second, unlike the standard training, the adversarial training output a thick decision boundary. Therefore, the data are encouraged to be further away from the decision boundaries. The learning objective of the vanilla adversarial training is a minimax formulation. Inside, there is a maximization where we use the PGD method to generate the adversarial data. Of course, we can use a new method, DD. This is more, it's more fantastic. Outside, we, we have a minimization where we can use a classifier to fit those generated adversarial data. To realize this learning objective, we can use the alternating optimization technique. At each epoch, adversarial training conducts step one and step two alternatively. Step one is to uh, generate the maximizing loss adversarial data, commonly using the PGD method. Step two is to minimize the loss on those generated adversarial data. In comparison, at each epoch, the standard training only minimizes the loss on those natural data with respect to the model parameters. Now I'm going to talk about how to apply the adversarial robustness. We know that adversarial attack is a way of uncovering the vulnerability of those machine learning models. And adversarial training is a way of making those machine learning models robust against those vulnerabilities. Next, I'm going to show two case studies are using attack to evaluate the vulnerabilities and using adversarial training to enhance the adversarial robustness. Image denoising is to reconstruct the clean, clear image from their noisy observations. Therefore, it is commonly used in medical image, satellites, or cameras. In image denoising, 
the noise is generally considered to be a random variable with zero mean. For example, if we take a, a large number of pixels and compute its average, then the noise should be canceled out. Otherwise, the noise will affect the brightness of the image, will not be considered as a noise at all. Because of this zero mean property, the traditional method in the OpenCV package using the non-local mean denoising. The idea is simple. Given an image, we find a similar patches and then compute its average. Then we can average out the noise. Now we go to the machine learning time and we need to learn a good image denoiser. Specifically, the image denoiser is denoted as a deep neural network. Taking input, the noisy images, and giving output, the clear images. However, in practice, we only have clear images as the training data. To solve this, we construct the noisy images by adding Gaussian noise with zero mean of various levels. Then we can learn a deep image denoiser that performs much better than the conventional non-local mean denoising method. However, although the deep neural network has good performance, it is vulnerable to the adversarial attacks. Similarly, this also applies to the deep image denoiser. To explore this, we ask a research question. What kind of zero mean noise that can make the deep image denoiser fail? To answer the above question, we design the zero mean adversarial attack to evaluate the vulnerability of those deep image denoiser. To realize this attack, we use the PGD method. But this PGD method has two constraints, which is different from the conventional one. First, the noise should meet the zero mean, but uh, the bounded by the adversarial budget. Second, the noise should meet the zero mean property budget. To realize this, we customize the projection function pi in the PGD method to meet the above two constraint. To meet the zero mean property, the projection function pi should project the adversarial noise onto the zero mean plane. The zero mean plane consists of all vectors whose mean of the element equaling zero. How could we project the vector delta onto a plane? First, we find an all one vector that is orthogonal to this plane. Then we project the vector delta along this direction of this all one vector. Then the adversarial noise delta minus this new projection leads to a new vector that is black one that is on the zero mean plane. Some mathematical tricks. Now we have our two steps projection pi. The first step is to meet the zero mean constraint. The second step is to meet the adversarial budget constraint, epsilon. For example, the deep image denoiser can effectively handle the normally noisy image and remove the noise to reconstruct the clear images. By comparison, if the noise is crafted by our zero mean attacks, the performance of deep image denoiser is severely damaged. We can see some blurs remaining on the roof and some strange contours appearing in the sky. Therefore, our zero mean attack can indeed uncover the vulnerability of the deep image denoiser. Then, can we make the deep image denoiser robust? The solution is adversarial training. 
we add an additional loss term to encourage the output of the noisy, non-adversarially noisy images to be similar to the output of normally noisy images. Therefore, we train the deep image denoiser using both adversarially noisy images and naturally noisy images to ensure that the reconstruction quality is high and the reconstruction is robust. To realize this learning objective, we alternatively generate uh, use the PGD method to generate the adversarially noise, and then to minimize the adversarial uh, noise by using the above two loss functions. Then, compared to, uh, with the standard training, our adversarial training can ensure the reconstruction qualities under attacks. Last but not least, we surprisingly find the robustness of deep MED noiser can also benefit the generalization capacity on some unseen real world noise. In other words, the robust deep MED noiser can denoise some real world noise even without training on those real world noisy images. We guess it is because adversarial attack can exploit some worst case noise. Learning from those worst case noise can make deep image denoiser deal with various types of unseen noise. Let's look at another example, two sample test. Two sample test is a statistical hypothesis testing, judging whether the two set of samples coming from the same distribution. It is widely used to analyze the critical data in physics, chemistry, biology, so on and so forth, to check whether their scientific experiments had made significant changes or not. How to test? We first define a test statistic, L. The test statistic measures how different the two batches of data are. Then we compute the p-value. P-value is a probability of, of observing this value of test statistic given the known hypothesis that the two distributions are the same. If this p-value is very low, we reject the known hypothesis. Let's look at a simple example. A t-test. For example, we have two batches of apples of various size from two companies. We want to know whether these two batches of apples have the same quality. Then we calculate the t-test test statistic of p and q. Uh, bar xp is the average of these five apples. Xq bar is the average of these five apples. Sigma p is standard deviation of these five apples. And sigma q is standard deviation of these five apples. Np equal to five, nq equal to five. Suppose we get the value of minus 2.44. We want to know this value is large enough to tell those two batch of apples are different or not. Then we, we're going to calculate the p-value uh, p of this test statistic L. Uh, then we look at the probability density function of the t-test. We find uh, two side, p, two side of p-value here, the probability mass here, we, we look at the table, uh, the probability of, of the test statistic larger than 2.44, under the null hypothesis seem to be very, very low. Then it's an unlikely case. Then we're going to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the two batch of apples have different qualities. In re reality, our t-test is very limited. 
which cannot handle the complex distributions or complex data. Therefore, we commonly use the general purpose test statistic. However, computing quantile under the complicated test statistic is tricky under the known hypothesis. T-test, we have a table to look at it. For the general test statistic, we do not have a table to look at it. How to do this? We're going to use the permutation test. They have three steps, and they re repeat these three steps. First, under the known hypothesis, we randomly shuffle the joint set of SP and SQ into S1 set and S2 set. Then we can treat S1 and S2 coming from the same distribution. Then we compute the test statistic of S1 and S2. Then we repeat. For example, we repeat, suppose we repeat this process 1,000 times, even 10,000 times. Then we can plot the empirical CDF of the test statistic under the known hypothesis. Finally, we can locate our test statistic of SQ and SP here. Then one minus this value is our calculated p-value of the test statistic SP and SQ. Now I'm going to introduce a general purpose test statistic maximum mean discrepancy, MMD. MMD measures the differences between the distribution of P and Q, which is the largest differences in expectation over all mappings, all functions. However, in reality, we only have a limited data. We must, must restrict the function class curly F to provide the useful finite sample estimate. But we also want this one function class to be rich enough to become flexible. Therefore, we choose the function class curly F to be the unit ball in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, RKHS. Then we define the kernel mean embedding to embed the distribution into infinite dimensional feature space. This can allow us to compute and manipulate the distribution using the kernel functions and using the dot products. Then due to the reproducing property of RKHS, we can make the soup disappears and using kernel to manipulate the two distributions. Then if the MMD equals zeros, the two distributions are the same. Uh, we actually can use many different estimations to estimate the MMD. Let's, let me to make the notation simple here. We use the MMD square head to, to de denote one estimation, uh, which can be parameterized by theta and using the kernel K. Then, how to test using the MMD? First, we fix a kernel. For example, we use a Gaussian kernel and fix its, a, its parameters. For example, inside the Gaussian kernel, we have some length, length scale. We can fix it. We can just manually choose the a figure, a number. Yeah, then given the SP and SQ, we calculate the MMD estimation then we're using the permutation test to calculate the p-value of this uh, estimation. Of... Lastly, if this p-value is too small, we reject the norm hypothesis. Otherwise, we accept the norm hypothesis. Now, we go to the machine learning time. We should learn the kernel parameters from the data, then we can use the deep kernels. The theta are parameterized by a deep neural network. Then the question is how to learn the parameter theta from the data? 
we first split the data into the training set and the test set. Second, we define a learning objective and optimize the deep kernel and learn the kernel parameter theta. Then we conduct the normal two sample test using the optimized deep kernel on the test set. Then the next question is, how to define the learning objective? The learning objective is the test power. The test power is a probability of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. Then due to the asymptotic of MD and the alternative hypothesis, we can use some central limit theorem. Then the R is the rejection threshold decided by the permutation test, big theta is a standard normal distribution, CDF. Then for the reasonably large N, the test power is dominated by the first term. Then this will vanish and disappear. Then we can compute this first term using the kernel operation, which can be parameterized by the theta. Finally, we can optimize the deep kernels by, for example, using the SGD, Adam, by maximizing the test powers on the training data. Then we have uh, the kernel with the optimized uh, parameters. The two sample tests with the smart kernels will become, will have a very good testing abilities, which can handle the complex distributions. Okay, now we can see the potential risk that can cause a malfunction of the non-parametric two sample test. To this end, we use the PGD method to minimize the test power on the test data to search for the adversarial pairs. For example, we have a lovely images of cats and dog here. The non-parametric two sample test can correctly differentiate these two batch of cats and dogs coming from the different distributions, which are correct. But if we add some small noise, almost all the two sample tests will wrongly judge the adversarial pair. They think they can come from the same distributions. So this technique can help you to manipulate the data and change the significance of your experiments in biology, chemistry, even in physics. Looks scary because now parametric to some test seem to be a standard in judging the significance. Then to robustify the no parametric to some test, we propose to adversarially learn the deep kernel. The we want to learn a robust kernel. In particular, this defense is formulated as a max mean formulation that is shares a similar taste of adversarial training's minimax formulation. For its realization, we use the training data to interactively generate the adversarial pairs by minimizing the test power and then update the deep kernels by maximizing the test power on those adversarial pairs. Then we can learn the robust deep kernels. The robust deep kernels will have a good testing abilities, but also resist against adversarial attacks. Let me conclude here. Traditional methods have limited performance. Now we go to the machine learning times, which the models could have a very good performance but are vulnerable. In the future, we should we really need those robust machine learning methods. We can have good performance and are also robust against various types of attacks. Thank you.
Uh, I really liked this, uh, uh, you know, this this evaluation of let's say the two sample tests and their adversarial robustness. Um, so you you mentioned that you could robustify, and there you said that you train a robust kernel. Uh, yes, the standard kernel used by by the, by the previous research and the methods are not robust against the the adversarial text we designed. Then we show this phenomenon, and then we provide the, the very first solution to train a robust kernels. Then they can okay, resist attacks. So maybe I'll catch up with you on the poster session a little bit more. Sure. Uh, any questions? Oh, yeah. Thank you for interesting talk. Uh, in the first uh, part, Mm -hmm. You introduce uh, how to say uh, denoiser. Denoiser, yeah, yeah, ah. yeah. So is the robust denoiser? Uh, how to say? Can the robust denoiser be robust to how to say uh, new types of noise? So here uh, you use your proposed attack, right? Yes. But how about other attacks? Other mm. possible attacks? Right now, we propose some zero mean adversarial attacks, and we show that this method can uh, resist against the zero mean adversarial attacks. There could be always some attackers design some, for example, the patch attack, or other some uh, pep pepper and salt attacks. Uh, then our method may not handle that attacks effectively. Uh, the philosophy behind the, this is. Uh, Security is always arm race. The, the party who have more knowledge will always win. Thanks for your talk. Okay. Uh, I have a question there. So just now you mentioned you want to train a robust kernel because mm -hmm. the previous kernel are not uh, robust. So could you please emphasize how do you uh, from introduce some robustness uh, regularization or some something to introduce to train the deep kernel. Uh, yeah, for example, uh, in the standard way of training the deep kernel is uh, maximizing this loss term. This is uh, only one step, uh, kind of like a without loop looped, it looped optimization. We can change this optimization to the mean max optimization or max mean optimization, similar to the adversarial training styles. So then by using this optimization, we can obtain the parameter that is robust. Oh, I see, thank you. Oh, okay. All right, let's thank the speaker again. So it's a great pleasure to have Aude Biard um, give today's final talk before the poster session. Uh, Aude um, is leading the NASA laboratory at EPFL, focusing on robotics. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I, I understand my talk is going to be very different from, from what we've heard today. So I'll try to make it as any roboticist something a little fun to look at. So it are going to be videos. So be reassured, but not just videos. Um, so uh, we do use machine learning and robotics. Uh, there are different ways of doing it. Um, I like first to motivate why we're doing it in my group in particular, because we tend to be more control oriented, so more theoretical. But then uh, lately we've, we've faced that there are a number of things that you cannot explicitly write. And, and as an example, uh, this is a typical thing that's, uh, that is very difficult to... Okay, I think you checked that the video we are playing. I had asked for this to be checked before. Otherwise, I'm just going to take my laptop. Uh, yes, if you, if you, if you show. But just, so you haven't tested it. Uh, yes, but in the presentation mode, I think you need to always save the phone. So why don't, why don't I go right there? It's not embedded. Or do, or do, otherwise, you just stand like this. And uh,
Non, non, attendez, 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 parce que j'ai plein de choses. Non, en même temps. Ah ouais, il yeah, est go. All right. I would have been very surprised if the videos were working. Usually they don't work if you give the slides to another, uh, another presentation. So, so why, why is this problem difficult? Um, this problem is particularly difficult because the bottle is um, filled with water and you don't exactly know what amount of water there is. And it is friendly. I mean, there, there is no way that you can actually really write explicitly how the water is going to be displaced as the, as, as the bottle flies. So this is, there, there is room for data learning uh, here, typically. But you still need to have control. You still need to have some guarantee that you're going to actually reach the bottle with the right position and the right orientation. So you have to think of this as ordinary differential equation, which we, we would code as dynamical system with a fixed point, which is in position and orientation. But then we're going to use machine learning as a way to shape uh, the particular functional that we want to, to preserve pro property. For today, I, I decided to focus on one particular uh, problematic that we looked at, which was to be able to have those functional that switch across different actuator, uh, different attractors, so different fixed points in space. So imagine that you want to pick up this object and it's falling, and you have two different places where you can catch it. You can catch it at the top or you can catch it at the neck. Those are two different fixed points in joint space because in one case you have to close very tightly your finger just to grab it at the neck or you have to have a more open grasp. And you have milliseconds to take this decision. So it's clear that there is no way that you can plan and you can run a nice optimization even if it's finite in time. I'm sorry to say, but there is no time on Earth, especially in a robot. So the best for us is when it's what we call closed form, an analytical solution, in which case all you have to do is to compute the analytical solution. And usually it's just a product of, um, of, of matrices and um, multiplied by vectors, so it's quite fast. So the, the first problem we looked at was if we wanted to be able to switch across two systems, what we need is to learn two different dynamics, which I illustrate very simply like this. Imagine that you have one dynamics on the left-hand side, uh, which here is two-dimensional, but of course for us it's much higher dimensional, with a single fixed point, which is this particular orientation and position on the, on the, on the glass on top. And then if anything changes, then you want to have to switch immediately to this other functional here, which has another set of fixed points. And you have a boundary in between. So from a machine learning viewpoint, you immediately think classification. But you also think classification and regression. Why regression? Because typically you want also to model the dynamics here and to make sure that the dynamics on either side vanishes and has fixed point at the right hand side. So, um, one natural way of approaching this problem, we thought at the time, was to use the support vector machine framework. And I apologize for the mathematician in the room because I did not formally explain all the details. I assume that the machine learning folks will, will follow me. So I'll be a little more specific here. Um, support vector machine, as you know, is usually a binary classification and it outputs plus one for one class, minus one for the other class. But it actually to do that, it takes a decision it takes the sign as a decision to decide if it belongs to the plus one or minus classes, take a decision on the sign of a continuous function, which here on purpose, I, I write V of X. It's a continuous function, it's actually positive everywhere, and it becomes zero at some point, which is not necessarily predefined. So usually it's zero exactly at the classifier, a boundary, uh, which is this boundary here. And then it's negative on the left-hand side and then positive on the other side. And we can even show that this is an infinite number of hyperplanes that all move away from the, from the boundary. So at the time we thought, well, this is, if I just look at the left-hand side, I have a natural Lyapunov function. It's something that, um, that will decrease uh, and, and eventually vanish at a point where I'm interested in. So if I do that, the problem is that if I train with traditional support vector machine framework, it, um, the system will vanish not necessarily where I want, and not necessarily at the point where I want it to vanish. But support vector machine is also used for regression, and you can also rephrase the same problem, the same optimization with different constraints as a, as a regression problem. 
So what we thought of doing is simply to combine the two and to do an augmented SVM where you solve basically for both classification and regression at once. So it's not very, I mean, it's quite intuitive, in fact. Um, you will start if, for those of you who are familiar with this problem, this is the way it works. So I'll just go with it. So the first, the first line on top is the traditional minimization that you have in support vector machine. The norm of W represents the hyperplane in high dimension in the feature space. You're minimizing for the norm of the hyperplane plus some cost for this lag variable. And the traditional uh, constraint from support vector machine are highlighted in yellow. The first one simply requires that all the data points on the left-hand side, right-hand side of the hyperplane lives on, on both sides with potentially some slack and the slack variable needs to be strictly positive. But if you want to have both worlds, that means you want to classify correctly the two dynamics and you want also that all the data points follow the dynamics and have a single attractor point and vanish, we augmented that by adding more constraints. So this constraint, for instance, here, take the Jacobian over xi times xi dots, which represent the velocity. In other words, what it's requesting is that now we actually follow the dynamics. We follow the velocity. So not only do we want to classify the data points in the right, uh, on the correct side of the hyperplane, but we also want these uh, data points to follow the flow, uh, to, to go that the gradient follows the flow. And then finally, we have to force the flow uh, to vanish at a, at a specific point, and that's the attractor. So we need to force, in fact, the kernel, the sum of the kernel to vanish at that particular point. But you can set this as a set of constraints, they're explicit constraints. And the nice thing also is that all of this remains a convex optimization. Nice. So you, you have a bit of both worlds. Uh, um, so if I, if I look then at the um, final equation that we get, the decision function, because with support vector machine, you get a decision that allows you at runtime in close form to decide if you're gonna move on the left-hand side or right-hand side of the hyperplane. In other words, if you're gonna reach with the big grasp or the small grasp for the example that I showed you before. This decision function is, has this equation that I'm gonna go through each of the terms separately. The first one is the standard SVM. So for those of you who are familiar with this, this linear combination, alpha i are scalars, y i are just the plus one minus one, so this is the decision, and then k is the kernel, which usually is an RBF kernel applied on the data point. So this is a standard uh, support vector. So if I take an example in 2D of a dynamics that I'm trying to represent with this decision function, and here I'm only looking at the effect of the decision function on um, on one side of the hyperplane, the one that I can control for, which has this Lyapunov function. If I only apply the alpha support vector, which are illustrated as, as round points there, I get some dynamics, but as you can see here, it's, it does converge to a zero point, but not where I would like it to be. Huh? So the zero point in this example, where is my mouse? Oh, it's this pink, um, uh, pink arrow, those are the data points. And this is the vector field, which is rendered by the traditional support vector machine. Now, when you solve, of course, because we've added more constraints, we have more Lagrange parameters. So we end up with other terms that we call the beta support vector. And if I illustrate the effect of this beta support vector, what they do is that they force to follow the dynamics. And this is the regression support vector. Um, so they force to follow the dynamics, as we see here. So they are, um, they are these triangles. And as I add more and more of them, then I will follow more and more the dynamics. The third term on the right-hand side is a nonlinear bias. Gamma is the, again, the Lagrange parameters for that last constraint that forced the system to vanish at a particular point. And so, and here, of course, it takes the partial derivative of the, uh, of the kernel, which we can compute because the kernel is a continuous and at least C1 function in our case, those are RBF functions, so they're in C infinity. And then finally, we have, a, we have a, a constant bias, which we can use uh, to, to change simply the level set of the function. So we can extend this easily for multi-class classification simply by taking the argmax. And at runtime, then we can run this uh, on a real robot. So just for the fun, this is, uh, this is typically the experiment we can do. So at runtime, in millisecond, we can choose if we close uh, on the grip, uh, on, the, sorry, on the neck or, or at the bottom of the... Uh, of the of the bottle, in this case we have 0 0.2 milli, uh, 0 0.2 seconds, so 200 milliseconds is extremely quick. For robotics, it's super quick. Why? Because even though we always think of robots as being fast, they are not that quick. So it's like the tennis player 
by the time you compute, you already should be running if you want to catch the ball. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's the necessity to uh, to run to compute this. What I wanted to talk about today is an extension of this work that we did recently. So, when we use this support vector machine approach, uh, we were doing hard partitioning. Uh, that means you really have to choose, and you can belong to only one of the two partition, and you could split the space, but that was the space that you had at your disposal. Now, this exact partitioning of the space was also a supervised learning problem. We needed to know how many classes we had. In other words, we needed to know how many dynamics there were. And uh, we decided to move away from this because in robotics, there are many reasons sometimes to not know the label by, by definition. So first, I'll, uh, I'm going to start by taking a dynamical system perspective to this problem and just illustrate with some very known dynamics that um, often dynamics may have different attractors, uh, but they're completely uh, intertwined um, in space. So it's not as easy uh, classification problem uh, as, as we will imagine. So this is an example for the Duffing oscillator. Um, you have no clear partitioning of the space. As you can see, you can start from, from points that are very close to one another here in the state space. And with just a small epsilon on the left, on the right, hop, you diverge, and then you reach two different attractors. So if you feed that to, uh, to a partitioning of the space, uh, it's uh, to, to a machine learning algorithm, it may be difficult to separate. Um, Another thing is that we wanted to really be completely unsupervised to say we don't know how many inherent subdynamics we have in our system. Uh, this is often very useful for us as roboticists because we don't quite know in advance uh, whether when you get demonstration in, in the field, if, if you need to segment these different actions in, in, in five or 10 or, or 15 different subactions. So we wanted to discover both D dynamics, the number of those dynamics, um, their shape, um, as well as their attractors. This is a completely unsupervised learning problem. We know neither how many dynamics we have, nor the shape. What I mean by the shape is the actual functional for each of those and where the attractors are. Um, so imagine that you have a bunch of data points, and I've right here capital X as the matrices in which column-wise I'm going to put all my data points, and my data points consist of all the position and the associated velocities. Imagine that this is given to you. It can be given to you by a human making a demonstration. We often use optimal control where we solve for feasibility, so optimization, but first to train the system and then to have it in close form. So we, we can generate this to make sure that we have, um, we have kinematically and dynamically feasible um, dynamics for, for the robot. So we have these data points, but they are unlabeled. Okay? We don't know. Um, we just have a bunch of these position and velocity that are observed. So it's an unordered and unlabeled list from a machine learning viewpoint. And, uh, and, and besides, um, again, notice that within the list, some of those data points may belong to one class or the other, and you just don't know. Um, so you, you cannot use you know, a closeness in, in space in the data point itself. So that, for this, we, we, we move to something a little different, but you're probably familiar with this. We, we looked at, at graph theory, in particular, uh, manifold learning and, and uh, spectral clustering, and thought, well, why don't we take this? Because the only information we have at our disposal is the fact that we know the velocity associated to each of the data points. And this velocity vector is, in fact, inherent to the dynamics that, uh, that is inherent to each of these, uh, these supported fields. So let's build a graph to connect the points, but a graph that is informed as much as it can be. That means it's informed only uh, from, from the point of view of just one point. Huh? What, what the point sees, it's itself and its own uh, velocity vector. And I can create a similarity measure, uh, which will, and I'll explain how we can build that. It's a new type of kernel that will decide if I connect or not the point. So I will read all the list of the data point that I have, and then I decide if my graph is, uh, if, if, if the points are adjacent or not. And it's a very binary graph, very simple, zero, one. So you know, if, if the similarity matrix is be bigger than a threshold, then yes, they are connected. If not, they are not connected. Um, so once we have this, um, we need to look at the actual kernel that we're going to use, this similarity metric. It's a very simple one. Take two points. The first thing that we want to look at is whether the points are close in Euclidean distance. So we take the classical uh, approach. Huh? So we look if they're far, then uh, they are, uh, the, the, the locality will be close to zero. If they're if they are close, then it becomes one. Then the other thing is that we're going to look at whether the velocity part of the data points align 
if there is continuity. In other words, if the two dynamics are continuous, then obviously it's probably the same dynamics. And we want both the dire directionality as well as continuity across a pair of points, um, because at some point the two dynamics will diverge. So we do that, so if they are connected, if they are pointing in the same direction, if they are not, if they are not pointing in the same direction, then, uh, then this will be much bigger than zero. If they point in the collinear, if you want in space, then uh, the directionality will be very clear. So with this, the advantage is that if you use a simple RBF kernel and you were to connect the graph by using a traditional just uh, positioning uh, in space, what you will have is what you observe here is that you will have a lot of spurious connection. Huh? So here in the diagonal, we have all that is nicely connected, all the points are nicely connected to one another, but then they're closely connected to points adjacent in space, which is not adjacent in the dynamics, and then we're going to have spurious attraction like uh, from these two dynamics that are very close to one another. So to get rid of this, with this velocity augmented kernel, we managed to remove, in fact, all of those uh, spurious attractor and make sure that all the points of these dynamics are connected to one another and all of those are connected to one another. And uh, we can even do that for um, um, dynamics that are um, intersecting uh, so that you preserve, in fact, the directionality of the previous dynamics and be able to clean that up and have just a single connectivity. Now for ease of reading of this graph, what we did is that we ordered the points. So that means we ordered all the points of this class and all the, the points of this class one after the other so that we can better read out uh, this matrix because otherwise you cannot interpret the diagonal. Um, now we have, uh, imagine that we have, uh, we have all those dynamics, we have this velocity kernel, we create the adjacent matrix, from this, we, we create the graph Laplacian, uh, as is usual in graph theory, and then we do uh, an eigen decomposition of the graph Laplacian. And uh, we look at the eigenvalues, and it's been done for decades, and people know that they can use, this is the basis of spectral clustering, is that you can just look at the multiplicity of the eigenvalue zero, if it's completely disconnected, or if it's almost disconnected, it's close to zero, and then you can cut off and discover the number of clusters. With the velocity kernel that allows you us simply to discover the number of dynamics. So we've solved one problem. We know now how many dynamics we have. But the, re the, the secondary problem now is to be able to make sure that those dynamics uh, can be, uh, can be uh, represented huh? because we have the problem of knowing what these dynamics are. So we started studying the eigenvectors for each subdynamics. And we observed one thing is that if we take some specific uh, eigenvalues, eigenvalues for which there is in an upper bound, which is uh, fairly small eigenvalues, it turns out that there are k latent space that we can create. And in those k latent space, um, all the entries are monotonic. So in fact, what, when I looked at them, what, 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 so the PhD student who worked on this observed that there was a monotonicity that was growing and decreasing, and then looking more at the mathematics, found that these are simply Chebyshev polynomials. So in fact, those are series of sinus and cosine. And if you, the eigenvalue and is proportional to the eigenvalue. So the eigenvalue, if it's small enough, then in fact, you embed one dynamics in one cycle of the Chebyshev. And that's why it's monotonic in that particular uh, space. So the fact that it's monotonic is wonderful. Uh, why? Because when we project into the latent space that is represented by these eigenvectors, our nonlinear dynamics originally becomes linear. And uh, in the world of control theory, when you can make something nonlinear or linear, you jump of joy <laughs> with joy because then you can control it. Um, so, so that was the, the marvelous thing is that uh, not only can we discover the number of dynamics, uh, but we can also linearize uh, in each of the latent space. And we know that we have as many latent space as we have dynamics. So we've discovered the dynamics. We can project in each of the latent space separately. Um, besides also, each of the dynamics are projected into different latent space. That means that we separate the dynamics. And the other dynamics projects to the point zero, to the origin of the system. So we really decompose uh, the problem. So I, I'll give you uh, just a small example. Um, so this is a typical uh, graph base that we, we've constructed. Uh, so you have uh, here four branches. Uh, there is a, a cycle here which we represent because in robotics we know that we never have perfect measurements. So often we, we simulate noise in terms of our measurement of where the attractor is. And the attractor is in the, uh, around this, uh, this small cycle. And this is the, the spectrum of the eigenvalue. And our bound uh, says that 
uh, any value of lambda which is below this uh, leaves us uh, leave uh, lends us to uh, to uh, to to the number of first of all well here we use uh, simply the, the fact that uh, we have the multiplicity of the eigenvalue which you don't see which is three so it allows us to decompose that but on top of that we also discover that we have three eigenvalues that are quasi equal and those represent in fact the number of uh, eigenvectors that we can uh, get, we can use for her her construction. So if I use just a 2D uh, latent space projection here, uh, you see that these dynamics that I had before, when projected onto the latent space that correspond to the first two eigenvalue non zero one here, uh, is, is flat and it's linear here. And I can also project it into 3D. In 3D, it's quasi flat. Um, it's quasi flat, it's not exactly flat, but it decreases with an order of um, n to the square, where n is the number of data points. So if you have many data points, then uh, it's, sorry, one over n to the square. So it's, you, you can almost um, neg neglect this. Other example, so if you take this 2D system, uh, which has uh, clearly two different attractor, you generate data, you subsample trajectory, then uh, you discover these two dynamics uh, and they live in two different spaces. So you have to understand that this is the blue space. So this is the blue space that corresponds to the first set of eigenvectors. This is the red space that corresponds to the second dynamics. Eigenvector. All of this is in closed form. Uh, so so the, the only difficulty, in fact, is the kernel itself, is that, of course, as usual, it depends a little bit on the threshold. So you have to choose well the thresholds to decide when you're cutting and when you're not cutting the edge of the graph. Um, but, uh, but that's the only, uh, the only difficulty. Um, yeah, this is another example for the pendulum with friction and uh, the duffing oscillator. Now, how do we use this for control? Uh, clearly, you send into a space uh, which is the same dimension, so that's the good news, but then you need to go back. So the only way is to do a diffeomorphism, so we can learn this diffeomorphism. We did not invent anything. We use existing diffeomorphism for this. Uh, and so this is an example. You get different dynamics, which are represented here in 2D. Uh, then you project, the projection are always the same and they're always this, uh, this linear projection. And then you can uh, learn the, the inverse of the, of the dynamics. We contrasted uh, the fact that we use this particular latent space versus other latent space and whether it buys us something. And yes, the advantage over doing, uh, so there exists the formorphism using, so RANA for instance is, is using purely neural networks for back and forth. It's fairly heavy uh, computationally. So of course, this method is, is lighter in, in the dimension in which we work uh, because we can compute the Laplacian. Clearly, you go to very high dimension. This is disputable. But for us in robotics, we usually do not exceed 60 dimensions. So it's still very variable. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so what else? Um, yeah, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, our latent space uh, being linear, it's very easy for us. Uh, to, to make sure that it's, it's stable at a single attractor point. And we just use a, a Lyapunov function that is constructed by observing the monotonicity of the value on, in this, uh, this space. And then um, because of the diffeomorphism, we, uh, uh, we guarantee to have uh, stability in the, um, in, the, in the original space, which is the nonlinear dynamics. Um, yeah, so uh, these are just images of what we do uh, in robotics. So then we can apply it to uh, represent very complex dynamics. So we're working a lot with things like that, which are a very complex spiral, as we see on the left hand side. I've lost my mouse again. There it is. Uh, they are complex spiral, and we can embed this into a linear space, and then we can control in this linear space for the nonlinearities. We've also looked at many different other examples of uh, very complex. Uh, dynamics and we can embed that uh, in linear uh, representation. So with this, I, oops, and I want to close by uh, thanking the three people, the three key people who worked on, on this, uh, Bernardo and Aradana worked on the theoretical part uh, with me and then Stitt uh, worked uh, a lot on the actual implementation of robot. Thank you for your attention. That was a bit long. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, I am impressed that there, you this, uh, somehow identify Chebyshev polynomials and somehow flatten the problem to put it into a setting where you can actually do quick com uh, computations. Now, computing, like, is, I mean, j j the, the amount of things you need to do, um, which is impressive to get it to a point where you can quickly compute is one thing, right? In the end, putting it into action is another thing. And you, you, we do this with the standard robots. We can do actually these actions in a precise manner because like 
you compute, sometimes in my head, something is dropping and I can imagine just grabbing it, right? But when it comes down to it, you may not have the exact position and so on and so forth. So you, you not only do the theory, but you can also do the actuators in a way that can oh, yeah, do but, the grasp. Okay, but, that, but that's a different, okay. So I don't have any slides to illustrate it. So what, what you're referring to is a very difficult problem. Uh, in robotics, indeed, when we control for robots, it's not just planning the trajectory and the velocity. Uh, so there exist a lot of controllers where you can be super precise in velocity and position. And so one can just rely on this. And it's a question of the closed loop control system. So this is, this is to a large extent a solved problem. Uh, here we control directly in joint space. Uh, so we don't have what we call the inverse kinematics problem. Usually when you control in Cartesian space, you control for the position and the orientation. So you control for six degrees of freedom, but a robot is seven. So then you have to find a pass for the for the elbow to go, and if what one issue in robotics is often that you know, if I want to go from this point to um, to the opposite, which I actually can not do um, in space, they are very close to one another, but then I have to rotate. Right? So well, because we control in joint space, we, we solve a little bit this problem. But no, there are lots of other uh, yeah, not trick, but there there are other part. issues to to be solved in in getting the robots to actually. Um, reproduce and generate uh, the trajectory on its own. Yet, um, trajectory planning in robotics remain a, a big hurdle. Um, it's usually based on, on computing, you know, with optimal control, many different constraints with optimization, and and it works well when you have all your time. Um, but uh, we as humans, I always tend to say, I'm sure it was the case for most of you. You didn't know EPFL, so when you came here, you opened the map. And then you looked for the pass, and then you followed the map, right? But if you do that two, three times, next time you do you do it without thinking, and so that's the difference. If you can embed this into a dynamical system control, your closed form, and then you have a solution which you can retrieve for pass planning. So this is only giving you the pass, the construction of the pass when when you're tracking it. That's a, that's a different problem. But constructing this pass, um, you don't want to solve an optimization problem each time. This is too long. This is actually it's a bit absurd because why would you search each time for a solution that you already know? Yeah. Uh, once you have it, you should be able to store it and retrieve it. This is this is fascinating. I think there is an application you may want to consider, which is not exactly robotics control, but maybe for surgeons. You know about cataract uh, uh, surgeries. So you know, like a a, a, a a surgeon, for example, does this five thousand times to be able to say that you know they are good at cataract surgery. It's, it 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 has this particular motion. I wonder if there is some underlying theory like what you just described that is beautiful that that tells you that there is this control that you basically get it just right. Um, yeah, yeah, no, but you're totally right. In fact, we know that humans uh, do automate the skill uh, after a while. So we, we do quite a lot of work on, on modeling human motor control in, the, in this way. And, yeah. Yeah. Very fascinating. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, thanks. Other questions? Yeah. 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 Thank you for an interesting talk. I was especially impressed by uh, demonstration of robot. So in that case, uh, what are how do you say, the inputs to the robot, oh, so like images or right. <laughs> so we are not computer vision expert. Um, although nowadays we, we start using more and more um, RGBD camera. So in this case, if you if you pay attention, you see those camera on top, um, and I'll just uh, play it and stop. Okay, uh, it doesn't want to stop. All right, so <laughs> um, pay attention that there are markers on mm -hmm. the object. And okay. so those markers are um, tracked by those camera mm -hmm. um, and those camera run at 250 Hertz. So for such a motion, uh, here it's a relatively simple motion. It's not sufficient to just track, you need to have a prediction, mm -hmm. okay? So for instance, for, um, oops, sorry, it's not going in the right direction. So if I go back to the other problem, oops, which is this one, mm -hmm. um, this is the same thing. Uh, we also have markers. Right? Oh, but gotcha. in order to be able to uh, predict where the object is going to land, uh, we actually threw, I don't have videos here, but because humans are not good at, at catching this, huh? uh, but they are good at throwing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we had humans throwing that and tracking the different um, motion of the, of the object, and then using this as data for training and nonlinear regression. 
So we are, we are essentially predicting Newton, if mm -hmm. you wish. And we are predicting the translational and rotational acceleration of the object uh, for a given object. It's very object dependent. We had some transfer across objects, but it remains fairly object dependent. And we use this as a way to do feed forward uh, planning. So we, we predict where the object is gonna land. Mm -hmm. And this, and then we decide where we're gonna catch it. So there is there is much more behind this. Here I focused on only the problem of the classification. But imagine that you have this forward dynamics, and then you have to decide where to catch it. At some point, the object is gonna fly into what we call the workspace. But my workspace, I need to have a representation of it. For robot, the workspace, when it's catching it like this, the workspace is not just a point in XYZ, it's not in 3D, it's actually also in orientation space. Because like I said, you need to align yourself. So you're usually, in this case, it's seven dimension, seven plus three. Uh, so you actually, or, or you control only in the joint space, you're looking for a region where in traveling in Cartesian space that correspond to region where you can catch it. Mm -hmm. And we represent this with density probabilities. So it's also the machine learning. We have a close form representation of the density probability of all the feasible posture. So it's a feasibility space. And then uh, we do simply a line search maximum um, in this. So we have the object traveling in Cartesian space. We have the map to the joint space and we look to uh, for the densest region in joint space, which means the, 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 the <laughs> in joint space, that means that's the posture where I have most possible ways in which I can catch it. Mm -hmm. And I decide that it's gonna be D points, plural, because usually there are more where I'm gonna go. And then I start and I go. And as I, as I go, of course, the camera tells me, oh, but by the way, the object is not exactly flying as you thought because I have this forward dynamics with dynamical system learned from machine learning. You can use neural networks, but they drift. Um, they drift. So, so your prediction is good for only a few sample ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And then they start predicting something that is a little off. And, and so, so you have to constantly correct. But that means you also have to correct because you're, always, you're already on your way. So I have a few videos, not here, but a few videos that are incredible. I'm, I'm even impressed by the robot because it goes there and then it goes up and then it, it recatches, which I wouldn't be able to do, uh, me as a human. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the advantage. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, so this concludes our session. Let's thank you both again.